for a few advanced squads, who were to be issued a few rounds of ammunition each, all the rest of the ammunition was to be left on Chinkinchan. Chapter 22 General C.H.U. drew a rough sketch of the Wild Mountain Range along which he and Mount Seitung led their 4,000 through the enemy blockade. No one but the bandit peasants of Chinkinchan knew of this way of leaving the mountain stronghold, and few indeed had been the men who had dared risk it. There was no path, not even the trace of a trail, only a chaos of huge boulders and jagged volcanic peaks towering above yawning chasms. At dawn on January 4, 1929, the column of gaunt and ragged men and women began creeping single file along the jagged crest of this mountain spur that connected Chinkinchan with the mountain range that runs southward along the Kiangsi Hunan border. The stones and peaks were worn to slippery smoothness by no one knows how many eons of fierce winds, rains, and snow. Snow lay in pockets and an icy wind lashed the bodies of the column that inched forward, crawling over huge boulders and hanging onto one another to avoid slipping into the black chasms below. By nightfall they reached a small, sloping plateau of solid volcanic rock where they ate half of the cold-cooked rice which each had brought along. Huddling together and linking arms, they sat down on the slope and spent the night, shivering and coughing. At daybreak they were again creeping southward, and by late afternoon reached an overgrown trail that led down a wooded mountain slope toward the village of Tafin, where a battalion of enemy troops was stationed. Here they halted to eat the last half of their cold rice. When darkness fell they began moving stealthily down the trail, under strict orders not to make a sound, forbidden even to cough. Reaching the foot of the trail, they surrounded Tafin village while the squads with ammunition moved in and overpowered the enemy garrison. We ate that night. General Chu remarked with grim satisfaction. After talking with them, we released the captives. We had no plans to train such men and, anyway, we wanted them to spread the alarm. We hoped the blockading troops would come after us. We learned later that they didn't. Troops from other places were alerted, instead. Marching swiftly southward, the red troops, as ragged as scarecrows, struck like lightning at landlords and their men Tuan, feeding and supplying themselves from their enemies and wrapping themselves in such clothing as fell to them from landlord homes, and everywhere calling to the peasants to destroy their ancient enemies. Shattering the local garrison, they occupied the tungsten city of Taiyu in southwest Kiangsi where the people, knowing them from the past, poured out to mass meetings. Here they remained for three days to revive the suppressed mass movement, thus giving an enemy regiment time to come up and, in a confusing and desperate battle, kill hundreds of them. Chu and Mao gave the order to retreat, and for the next ten days the small army fought a desperate running battle through the icy mountains along the Kiangsi Kwangtung border with. Enemy troops swarming against them from every direction, following them by the bloody tracks they left on the snow-covered paths behind them. Often without any food, and never with enough, burdened with their sick and wounded, they moved up and down the wintry mountains, covering fifty or sixty miles before resting in the open or in some town or village that opened its doors to them. After a few hours' rest, they began marching shortly after midnight to outstrip the enemy troops who operated only by day. Approaching a village, they would send a man or two in advance, and the peasants would come out, collect rice for them and take and hide their wounded, their sick and exhausted. Each man left behind under the care of peasants was given his rifle and a few rounds of ammunition so that he might, upon recovery, begin organizing and training the peasants. We aimed so to train our men that even if only one escaped alive, he would be able to rise up and lead the people, General Chu said. We fought many battles during that terrible time and in one we lost 200 men. In another, 20 of our men and one Wampoa cadet were captured. They joined an enemy regiment that garrisoned a South Kiangsi Shin, county or district. A few months later they led that entire regiment in insurrection and turned the Shin into a guerrilla base. It later became one of our strongest Soviet districts. In still another battle, Chu Tei's wife, Wu Yulan, was among the missing. The girl was tortured and beheaded, after which the severed head was sent to her native city, Changsha, where the city fathers mounted it on a pole in one of the main streets as a warning to all who thought as she had. The Chinese Lunar New Year season came, Red New Year greetings gleamed on every door, and the sound of music came from restaurants and the homes of the wealthy. 
Down in the small district city of Jukin in South Kiangsi, a regiment of provincial troops returned to tell how they had destroyed most of the Chu Mao bandits and chased the remnants over the border into Fukien province. And thanks for such good work, the leading citizens of the town presented the regiment with a fine New Year dinner. Laughter mingled with the gurgle of wine and the odors of cooking food. Red candles gleamed on the long tables set up in the barracks. So secure did the regiment feel that not even a sentry was left on duty. The fine food was on the tables, and the soldiers had just seated themselves and reached for their chopsticks, when something like the scream of a bullet in flight brought a silence as deep as infinity. In open-mouthed amazement, they looked up at the Chu Mao bandits, as gaunt as timber wolves, who seemed to have arisen from the earth and who stood in long lines about the hall, their guns at the ready. At a horse command, the regiment arose as one man, hands over their heads, out into the night where other ragged specters locked them inside a great stone ancestral temple and stationed guards to hold them there. We finished the New Year feast for them, General Chu laughed. Next morning we moved northeast into the Tapoti Mountains, with a division of enemy troops moving against us from two directions. But we had run enough, and in a conference we decided to get rid of our pursuers once and for all. We selected our own battlefield. Our troops discussed the plan of battle until everything was clear, then met in a mass meeting and with raised fists swore to destroy the enemy or die in the attempt. As was his custom, General Chu described in detail the battle which was fiercely fought but which, he said, was really very simple. Lin Piao led one regiment ten miles through the night to get in the rear of one enemy column before dawn, when the battle began. The enemy had everything while the red troops had no more than twenty rounds of ammunition each. This was soon exhausted as they struck from every direction and with everything they had. They used their rifles or even branches torn from the trees as clubs. By the time the sun was overhead, they had completely destroyed the enemy division. There were only about a thousand captives, and of these General Chu selected one hundred poor peasants. He asked them to join the Red Army, eat bitterness with it, and fight until it was victorious. The rest of the captives were released because they were old mercenaries and opium smokers. We didn't want such men. The Tapoti battle was a turning point in the agrarian revolution and in enemy morale. Thereafter enemy troops followed the Red Army only from a respectful distance while the Fukian troops withdrew to their own province, saying the whole thing was none of their business. With their small bands of intrepid agitators going in advance to prepare the peasants, the Red Army took the walled city of Ningtu in central Kiangsi a few days later. The local garrison and the landlords fled as it approached while the Chamber of Commerce, acting as had such organizations from time immemorial, pulled down the Kuomintang banner, ran up the red flag, and offered the army $5,000 and the keys to the city. Chu and Mao accepted the $5,000 but refused an invitation from the Chamber of Commerce to a banquet. The army took over all the food and other possessions of the landlords, distributed the surplus to the city poor, and called a mass meeting of the entire civilian population. As in every town and city which it occupied, it also opened the prison doors, releasing all prisoners regardless of the charges against them because, General Chu declared, crime is a class question. Many were political prisoners who had been kept in shackles and tortured until they were crippled for life. Others were poor men who had been imprisoned for petty offenses against private property, such as the theft of food or clothing. After three days in Ningtu, the Red Army gathered up its wounded, its sick and exhausted, and the confiscated rice supplies from the landlords, and marched to the west toward the Tunku Mountain base, which had already prepared to welcome it. The march toward Tunku became a triumphal procession, with peasants pouring out from all the villages to help carry the wounded and the supplies. The town of Lunkong at the base of Tunku, a strong center of the peasant movement, turned out to welcome the red troops and offer them the hospitality of its homes. Here Chu and Mao met Li Wenling, a former Wampuam military cadet who, with a company of guerrillas, had come to guide them up the mountain. With his deep feeling for the beauty of nature, General Chu described Tunku much as he had previously spoken of Chinkinshan. This mountain was part of a forested range that stretches north and south through Kiangsi. It was in a high mountainous area, but not as impregnable as Chinkinshan, he said. 
narrow trails led up over its four levels, and on every hand were forests of spruce and fir, flowering bamboo, shrubs, and, in the spring and summer, wild flowers in great profusion. Near the summit was a broad and fertile plateau dotted with small villages and with the market town of Tunku near its center. In the fertile valleys that poured onto the plateau were other small villages. Some twenty-five miles south of Tunku stood the large walled town of Sinkwo which, a few weeks later, fell to the Red Army and was united with Tunku in the tunku Sinkwo Regional Soviet District. The small hospital which had already been established in Tunku was too small to accommodate all the Red Army sick, wounded and exhausted, and many were invited into the peasant homes. Here on this high plateau the Red troops rested and bathed. They repaired and boiled their ragged clothing to rid them of the lice that had tormented them. They doctored their torn feet and made themselves sandals with strong rope saws and uppers of many colors. Their education did not cease even for a day. Each morning companies of troops could be seen at drill or maneuvers, and after the first of their two daily meals they gathered to hear lectures by their military or political leaders or to take part in discussions. Common educational subjects, such as reading and writing, were not taught methodically as they were later, but even in this dawn of the agrarian revolution commanders tried to find time to teach the illiterate. Paper and pencils were the sheerest of luxuries, but men would sit in a circle on the ground and trace Chinese characters and figures in the dirt with small sticks. But the most powerful educational method evolved by the Red Army, and one which it practiced throughout its existence, consisted of the conferences in which past battles or campaigns were analyzed. In these conferences, every commander and fighter participated, including General Chu and Mao tse -tung. All rank disappeared and men had full rights of free speech. Not only was the plan of battle or campaign discussed, and, if men felt the necessity, criticized, but the individual conduct of any commander or fighter could be criticized. Of course men could defend themselves against criticism which they felt to be unjust, but if the charges were proved against them they would thereafter be disciplined by army headquarters. General Chu placed the greatest importance on such conferences. They developed the men in every possible way, he said, and also kept the army democratic. By such methods, he said, men who failed to do their duty in battle, or who violated the democratic regulations of the army, would be demoted and re-educated, while men who distinguished themselves by intelligence or special courage were promoted from the ranks. At the same time, the inarticulate peasant fighter learned to think and express himself on military, political, and human problems. He learned the nature of a democratic army, as opposed to the old feudal militarist armies, he learned vigilance and responsibility, and he learned to value his own worth as a man and as a responsible member of a revolutionary army. In similar conferences, plans for new battles or campaigns were placed before the army for discussion, and Chu Tei never failed to be impressed by the questions asked or ideas advanced by the rank and file in such gatherings. While our men had to obey orders in the midst of battle, we did not want them merely to accept and obey without understanding, as was the case with soldiers in the Kuomintang armies. We were a people's revolutionary army, building for the future. He remembered one general mass meeting in Tunku where Mao Tse Tung and he were among the main speakers. We are weak and small, Mao Tse Tung told them, but a spark can kindle a flame and we have a boundless future. As so often, Mao explained the general strategy and tactics of the revolution which, he said, must begin with the seizure of small areas in the countryside and the construction of secure mountain strongholds such as Tunku and Chinkinshan which would eventually be united. With time, and under certain conditions, he continued, the people's power will be extended to areas that include large towns. From the liberation of a small part of the country, we will thus advance to larger and still larger areas, and eventually we will liberate all China. It was a strategy so simple and practical that any man could understand it, yet when viewed against a continent and through the haze of an unknown future, it was complicated and beset by a thousand uncertainties. General Chu had his own special repertoire. He never failed to emphasize two main lines of thought in all his speeches. First, he gave the troops and the people an historical background of the Chinese Revolution, from the Taiping Rebellion onward, thus inspiring them with the conviction that they were the heirs of a great revolutionary tradition. 
Secondly, he repeated over and over again that in a semi-feudal and semi-colonial country such as China, there can be no place for peasants and workers, no place for the Communist Party, for agrarian or other reforms, and no victory for the revolution without armed struggle. This struggle of the peasants in the countryside, he declared, could succeed only if it had the support of the industrial workers and the petty bourgeoisie, including the intellectuals, in the towns and cities. In that early spring of 1929, he frankly analyzed the national and international situation, in so far as he knew it, for the troops and the people. Chiang Kai-shek, he said, had ordered 11 regiments of Kuomintang troops to blockade the Tunku Mountain stronghold. Chiang was also beginning a war with the Quanxi generals for mastery of the country. He could not spare his best troops as he had been able to do for the blockade of Chinkinchan. In fact, Chu added, the Fukian provincial troops who, as everyone knew, were primarily professional bandits incorporated into the Kuomintang armies, had been ordered to take part in the Tunku blockade, but had failed to show up. Such troops, he said, wanted only to be left in peace to collect taxes and sell opium in their own domain. While thieves and robbers quarreled or fought among themselves, he said, the people should use the occasion to organize and arm themselves and build up their power. In the Northeast, or Manchuria, he further explained, there were conflicts and contradictions involving both the Chinese ruling classes and the imperialists. The young marshal, Chang Suliang, who ruled Manchuria, had defied Japanese imperialism by raising the Kuomintang flag and, to protect himself, had transferred all foreign affairs in his region to Chiang Kai-shek's regime at Nanking. As Chiang had done in his territory, the young marshal claimed the exclusive right to appoint all members of the Kuomintang in the Northeast, so that the Kuomintang was nothing but an organization of officials and militarists. But the Japanese had not finished with the young marshal, nor with Manchuria. Nor, for that matter, had the other imperialist powers, all of whom had designs on that great region. Thinking back on those far-off days, General Chu Te admitted that while there were conflicts and contradictions among the counter-revolutionary and imperialist forces, the revolutionaries also had problems not easily solved. For example, he said, upon arriving on Tunku, he and his comrades found a most curious situation among the communist leaders who controlled this stronghold. These men were the sons of landlords, or even landlords themselves, yet they were by and large young, educated men who had played a serious role in the Great Revolution during which period they had become communists. Some of them were graduates of the Wampua Military Academy, and one had been an instructor in that famous institution. All of them had taken part in the Nanchang Uprising, after which they had returned to their native homes in the Tunku region to begin. The Agrarian Revolution These intellectuals, as General Chu called them, had done everything for the revolution, except divide their own land among their tenants. As benevolent landlords and as natives of the region, they had the support of the peasants and of their own tenants. Here, in the midst of the Communist Party and the agrarian revolution which it had begun, were clear remnants of feudalism both in thought and in action. The problem was further complicated for Mao Zedong, Chu Te, and their staffs because, at a moment when strong enemy forces were concentrating against the Red Army, they dared not insist that the native Tunku Party leaders live up to the program and policies of the cause to which they had pledged their lives. To have insisted on this at such a moment might have precipitated a serious internal struggle. The Red Army, therefore, could only wait for the revolutionary ferment to work among the Tunku masses. This ferment worked about a year later, when the agrarian revolution swept Kiangsi like a flame. The 20th Red Army Corps of Tunku natives, whose commanders and political leaders were members or followers of the Tunku leaders, arose in insurrection against the Red Army. Fearful of their own peasant troops, the commanders of this army dared not denounce the Communist Party and the Red Army as such. Instead, they denounced Mao Zedong and Chu Te as false communists and set up their own small Communist Party. Of all such local leaders, only one remained loyal to the Red Army. This man, later chief of staff of the 15th Red Army Corps, was still with the Red Army in 1937 when General Chu talked with me and was an instructor in Kanta, the resistance university at Yan'an. 
The others, however, failed to stem the tide of the agrarian revolution which by then had ceased to be the work of individuals. Book 7 Now listen closely to my song, Chapter 23, The Small Poor Man's Army, as the peasants called the Red Army, which gathered on the Tunku Plateau in the early South China spring of 1929, hardly looked like an army at all. Yet it was the embryo of the Great People's Liberation Army which swept over China twenty years later and shipped the world. After the Tunku guerrillas had been reorganized into its ranks, the army numbered around 4,000 men. Of these, 3,000 left on a campaign just eight days after reaching the mountain refuge for rest. The others remained behind to till the fields and guard the Tunku stronghold, and of these nearly 300 were Chumao veterans still in hospital or not yet strong enough to fight. Of the 3,000 leaving on the campaign, no more than half carried some kind of modern weapon while the others were armed with spears. A few were clad in remnants of what were once uniforms, the rest in the patched loose trousers and short jackets, rope sandals, and odd assortment of headgear that the poor of China wear. They were lean and hungry men, many of them in their middle or late teens, with big hard hands and thickly calloused feet, to whom life had been nothing but a round of toil and privation, insecurity and depression. Most were illiterate. Each man wore a long, sausage-like rice pouch long enough to encircle one shoulder and tie at the opposite hip, a pouch now filled with enough rice to last for two or three days after which it would have to be replenished from the bins of landlords, or with rice captured from the supply columns of the enemy. Their second article of equipment consisted of a cloth cartridge belt long enough to wrap around each shoulder, cross in front and back, and go around the waist. The belts of men with rifles now held a few rounds of ammunition each, but those worn by men with spears were empty. When Chu Te made his final inspection, he had said to the spear bearers, Each of you will soon carry a gun, and your cartridge belts will be filled. There was nothing to distinguish Chu or Mao, or any other commander, from the rank and file. There is a faded old photograph taken of Chu Te in the summer of 1929. It shows a company of troops sitting in a circle on the ground, their rifles between their knees and their faces uplifted as they listen to him speak. Chu Te is standing in the center of the ring, his head uncovered and clothes shaven and his clothing nothing but a pair of shorts and an open peasant jacket exposing the bare skin beneath. His legs are bare and his feet encased in a pair of rope sandals. He stands in his customary pose, his legs apart, his hands on his hips, a humorous expression on his face. So he must have appeared as he spoke to the big farewell mass meeting of troops and peasants on the Tunku Plateau in that early spring of 1929. He talked of the eleven enemy regiments that were concentrating to the north, west, and south of the mountain. Stronghold he may have said, as he did a thousand times in later years, that we must take advantage of the contradictions among the enemy, win over the majority, oppose the minority, and smash them one by one. And the signs of conflict and contradictions among the enemy were many indeed, as every man knew, because the eastern approaches to Tunku were still free of enemy concentrations. Chiang Kai-shek, Busy fighting his rivals, the Quanxi generals, had ordered troops from Fukien province to move up and complete the blockade around the mountain from the east, but his orders were not obeyed because, as General Chu expressed it, these Fukien troops wanted to be left in peace to collect taxes and sell opium. Nor, General Chu said, could Chang spare his best troops to fight the Red Army, but had ordered up second-rate local forces. And now the Red Army was going forth to draw them off from the mountain and to destroy them one by one. Eight days is no time at all for weary men to rest, yet on the eighth night after reaching Tunku, when the moon was high, Chu and Mao led their three thousand down the eastern slopes and began the campaign. In fighting a numerically superior force, the Reds not only used tactics of their own invention to fit the situation on the spot, but they most certainly drew upon the tactics of Chinese and Mongol armies of ancient times, of the Taipings in the 19th century, and on experiences won in the great revolutionary period of 1925 to 1927, tactics which bewildered Kuomintang commanders taught in Japanese military academies. Reaching the foot of the mountain, small groups of the swiftest marchers made off in the direction opposite to the main forces and made feints at large towns to draw the enemy after them, then faded away in the villages and appeared suddenly before other towns. 
All the while Chu and Mao were after the landlord Min Tuan in villages far away, arousing and arming the people and leaving cadres behind to continue what had been begun. After a time, the enemy was baying across all South Kiangxi, hunting for the elusive reds who, guided by the peasants, made surprise attacks on them at night, pinched off their supply columns in swift, fierce raids, and disappeared only to appear again miles away shortly afterwards. Then came the windfall of Tingchao, a turning point in revolutionary development. The reds had not planned to take it. Following a 20-hour march to evade numerically superior forces gathered against them, the army bivouacked on the mountain range that runs north-south along the Kianxi Fukien border but a short distance north of the walled city of Tingchao in South Fukien province. Tingchao was held by the ex-bandit chieftain, Kuo Fang Ming, who by successful banditry had become a great landlord and Kuomintang general. Kuo's troops, most of them professional bandits and opium smokers who had been incorporated into the Kuomintang armies, could be defeated if enticed out from behind the walls of Tingchao, but this would be impossible unless they believed their enemy was small and poorly armed. They could come by one route only, and this was along a footpath that led from Tingchao northward through a narrow valley through which a swift and deep river ran. The Red Army was bivouacked on the mountain range overlooking this valley. The Red troops sent their peasant guides into Tingchao to spread the news that the Red bandits were encamped just a stone's throw from the city, that their weapons were few and their ammunition none, then they pillowed their heads on their guns and waited for the morning to come. Before noon next day, two regiments of enemy troops came marching single file along the footpath through the valley. When runners reported that the enemy commander was riding in a sedan chair borne by four carriers, General Chu smiled, saying, it may be General Kuo himself seeking merit. When the enemy was where Chu and Mao wanted them, red outposts fired a few random shots and then ran noisily up the mountainside as if in fear. Our outposts have fired and will draw them into the mountains, guessed General Chu. The enemy troops immediately took up the chase, climbing higher and higher, panting and sweating, and growing bolder as they met no resistance. The red troops finally erupted from their concealed positions and the enemy turned and tumbled in terror down the mountainside with the reds on top of them. There was some fighting on the footpath, but the enemy remnants were soon pinned against the river and totally disarmed. In the midst of this final action, a guard ran into General Chu's command post and shouted, A big fat fellow in a fine uniform and hung with luxuries has been killed while trying to escape in a boat on the river. The big fat fellow proved none other than General Kuo Fang Ming, and the luxuries consisted of a huge gold watch and chain and a number of rings which he had worn on his fat fingers. By nightfall the Red Army had taken Tingchao, disarmed the enemy troops within its walls, and by daybreak next morning had established its power over the walled towns and surrounding territory within a radius of fifty miles. And, as was the practice, Mao Zedong set to work without rest to revive the people's organizations and organize councils of people's delegates, or Soviets, exactly as had been done since the agrarian revolution began. Tingchao was the center for the entire region. Some landlords were captured, others fled to the great walled city of Shanghong to the south. Soon the land was being divided by village and town committees. Chu Te, who could work ceaselessly on no more than three or four hours of sleep, had his own work. Examining and then rejecting the captive enemy troops, most of whom were opium smokers as well as old professional bandits, he called for and got a thousand young peasant volunteers. 2,000 other peasants were soon organized by him and his staff into peasant partisans. The younger men into red guards. Everywhere in the liberated regions, squads of these young peasants could be seen drilling and learning the difficult art of marching in rhythm. The red guards, a people's militia, were attached to agricultural production and armed chiefly with spears. These spears were often more effective than rifles in hand-to-hand -hand contests in forested mountains. The regular peasant partisans were able-bodied young men, all of them better armed than the Red Guards. They formed a reservoir for the regular Red Army, but they fought only as auxiliaries, not as frontline fighters. Operating in the enemy rear, they waylaid enemy messengers and patrols, destroyed enemy camps and communications, sniped in the forests and carried on their own propaganda war by shouting to white soldiers, brothers. 
Don't be desked for the landlords and generals. Shoot your officers who beat and curse you. Poor men should not fight poor men. Come over to us. Many small pictures from Ting Chow were engraved on General Chu's memory, and of these he mentioned three in particular. First, there was the body of General Kuo, which peasants came to see to convince themselves that their enemy was really dead. And, as they stared, Chu Te heard them say, there lies the greatest scoundrel in the world. He also recalled the two small Japanese-made arsenals which had provided General Kuo with most of his ammunition. Of the weapons captured in this operation, 2,000 rifles and tens of machine guns were new and also of Japanese make. But, above all, there was the factory, equipped with modern sewing machines, Japanese-made, which General Kuo had owned, as he had owned the arsenals, and which had made uniforms for his troops. The workers in such institutions had worked 12 hours a day, but now they organized their trade unions and established two work shifts of eight hours each to provide the Red Army with uniforms. General Chu's voice even became tender when he spoke of those sewing machines. They were a great thing for us, he said, because until then all clothing which the men wore had had to be made by hand. But now we got our first standard Red Army uniforms, he said, smiling a little sadly at the memory. They were grayish blue in color, each with a pair of leggings and a cap with a red star. They were not as fine as foreign uniforms, but to us they seemed very fine indeed. Some of our troops would go in small groups and stand in silence to watch the tailors operate the sewing machines. We had to evaluate Ting Chow much later, but the arsenal and uniform factory workers went with us. They carried their machinery with them and set to work wherever we happened to be. The sewing machines went with us on the long march in 1934 to 1935, and the tailors often set up shop in the open during that time. They are still with us, with their machines. At General Chu's suggestion, I visited this uniform factory which had been established in Yan'an in January 1937. The sewing machines with their Japanese marks were still there, and the tailors, now middle-aged, were thin, dark and solemn men who merely glanced up at visitors and fell to work again. Ting Chow proved to be a turning point in the history of the Chinese Revolution. It was there, a few days after its occupation, that a messenger arrived from the Central Committee of the Communist Party in Shanghai, with reports on the national and international situation and with important documents of another nature. Among these were reports and decisions of the 6th Congress of the Communist Party which, because of the terror in China, had been held in Moscow in the summer of 1928, and with these were decisions of the Communist International which followed shortly after it and reached the same conclusions. This was the first time in two years that the forces led by Chu Te and Mao Zedong had had contact with their party's central committee. They had gone their own way, acting in accordance with necessity and conviction. Only a few hours after this Shanghai messenger arrived, a peasant walked into Chu Tei's headquarters. He opened his jacket and drew from the lining a piece of cloth with a few lines of small writing on it, signed with the name of Peng Tei Huai. Peng was the young commander whom Chu and Mao had left in command on Chinkinshan when they broke through the enemy blockade around that mountain stronghold in January 1929. What had happened since then they did not know, but Peng's letter announced that he was now in Jiqin with his troops and wished to know if Chu and Mao could join him there or if he should come to Tingchao. Jiqin is a small district town in South Kiangxi some two to three days' march to the west of Tingchao. With a number of military and political representatives and a battalion of guards, Chu and Mao left at once for Jiqin, taking the Shanghai messenger and the documents with them. In Jiqin, Peng Tei Huai, a grim and austere man, told them the following story. After Chu and Mao left Chinkinshan in early January, the enemy merely tightened its blockade of the stronghold. Finally, the enemy made a surprise attack. One enemy soldier was sent up the face of a mountain cliff, with a rope tied around his waist. He reached the top, and drew others up after him. They killed the Red Army guards at a small, obscure mountain pass. Thousands of enemy troops then poured through the pass and fell upon the beleaguered revolutionaries, some 6,000 of whom by then were slowly dying in their hospital and barracks from starvation. Pang had tried to hold the enemy back long enough to allow as many as possible of his sick and wounded to escape into the forests. 
A few crawled away, but were hunted down and slain. Others were put to the sword in their beds. The barracks and hospital were burned to ashes. Every house, every building on Chinkinshan was burned to the ground and the defense works were blown up. Snow was falling during the grizzly. Slaughter and a wintry wind wailed a mournful dirge. Peng collected survivors until there were some seven hundred, whom he led up through the crags and over the boulders along the same route of escape used by Chu and Mao. His troops were in a much worse condition than those that had left at the turn of the year, but they began striking blows at the enemy the moment they escaped the blockade. Everywhere they searched for Chu and Mao, but could not find them. Here and there they heard of their passing from peasants, but then the trail was lost again. Peng had speculated with the idea that they had been killed, and had set to work to build up the Red Army and organize the mass revolution alone. Many peasants had joined him until now, at Jikin, they had 1,500. Peng had been in western Kiangxi when he heard rumors that Ting Chao had fallen to the Red Army. Turning about he had smashed his way eastward and, after destroying the enemy garrison, he had occupied Jikin and begun organizing and arming the peasants. Such was the tale told by Peng Tei Huai at the Jikin conference which lasted for three days and the most of three nights after Chu and Mao arrived with their comrades. The reports and decisions brought by the messenger from Shanghai were studied and discussed, but Chu dismissed this aspect of the conference with the terse and grim remark, we accepted the decisions and began carrying them out. With a thread of communication established with the outside world, Chu and his comrades felt that they were no longer operating in darkness. The reports from Shanghai, written in microscopic script on the thinnest of rice paper, told them of the conflicts and contradictions among the imperialist powers abroad, and in China of their control over Chiang Kai-shek's Nanking dictatorship in which foreigners now sat as advisors in all strategic positions. A British official from India was advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Americans sat in high position in finance and communications, and British, American. Belgian and French financiers were planning the purchase or part purchase of industries or of such mines as the famous tungsten mines at Taiyu in southwestern Kiangxi. The foreigners were also having a holiday in China selling arms and ammunition to Chiang Kai-shek and the old and new warlords allied with or against him. The reports also detailed the conflicts between the old and new Chinese militarists. While China was being looted, and Chiang Kai-shek and the Quanxi generals, with their different foreign backers, were fighting for the mastery of China, many regions of the country had begun to erupt in revolutionary struggle. Peasants had risen and been slaughtered in many places in the Yangtze River Valley and northward. Islands of resistance had established themselves as far north as Shantung. Fang Qiming, the educated peasant, was building up a peasant army in northeastern Kiangxi, the peasant leader, Peng Pei was still leading. Partisans in the East River region of Kwangtung province to the south, and Ho Long, the Pancho Villa of China, was building up a peasant army in the mountains of western Hunan. In the western and southern reaches of Quanxi province to the south, a still greater revolutionary uprising was taking place. Quanxi garrison troops had arisen in insurrection and established a great partisan area inside of which the people ruled themselves in village and town councils. One year later, however, the Quanxi generals returned to the province after suffering defeat at the hands of Chiang Kai-shek. Their troops, supplied by the French in Indochina, uprooted the partisan area with fire and sword. Six thousand of these Quanxi revolutionaries fought their way through the mountains to South Kiangxi where Chu Te organized them into the 6th Red Army Corps. Delving into his memories of those early days, General Chu recalled one of the Shanghai reports about the activities of Trotskyist and right opportunist cliques. These ex-communists, he said, were accusing the Communist Party, or Chu and Mao more specifically, of having retreated to isolated mountains in the interior to engage in military adventurism and banditry instead of returning to the industrial cities to lead the struggle of the proletariat and urban petty bourgeoisie for the completion of the democratic revolution. Behind these empty phrases about democracy and human rights hovered treason to the revolution. General Chu snorted. In a semi-feudal and semi-colonial country like China, the simplest democratic rights for the people had to be fought for with guns in hand. In Shanghai, Hankou, 
Canton, and other cities, workers and intellectuals were being beheaded in the streets for demanding free speech, press, assembly, and the right of organization, and for demanding the right to defend themselves in court when arrested. Anyone who used the word imperialism was automatically branded as a communist to be killed if captured. The eight-hour day, increased wages, and the abolition of child labor were all branded as communist banditry, as was the idea of free trade unions. From the very beginning, Mao Zedong and many others of us had understood that the Chinese people could win democratic rights only by the armed defeat of the counter-revolutionary henchmen of foreign imperialism. Many people neither understood nor wanted to understand this, but the simplest peasant existing under a landlord owner, or the simplest worker laboring under the whip of domestic and foreign reaction, knew it. As for Mao and myself and the troops which we commanded, we had no intention of laying down our guns and offering our necks to the Kuomintang butchers. Under the chairmanship of Mao, therefore, the Juking Conference mapped two separate military political campaigns. The first of these was to be led by Chu and Mao, who were to smash the power of the counter-revolution in South and Central Kiangxi and transform. These areas, together with Western Fukien, into a central revolutionary base. This base in turn was to be progressively enlarged until it united with other islands of the people's resistance in South China. The second campaign was to be led by Peng Te Huai, who was to return to the Chinkinshan area to revive the people's movement if possible. After that he was to proceed to his old base in the Pingxiang mining region of northwestern Kiangxi which in turn was to be consolidated and expanded until it embraced adjoining territory in Hunan and Hupa provinces and eventually linked up with the Central Soviet region established by Chu and Mao in the south. After two weeks of rest during which time they received new uniforms from Tingchao, Peng Taihui and his troops marched off to fulfill their mission, while Mao and Chu returned to Tingchao. One week later Mao took a thousand men and marched off to central Kiangxi to drive enemy troops from Sinquo, a walled city lying in the mountain range some 25 or 30 miles south of the guerrilla base at Tunku. Sinquo and Tunku were to be united in a powerful revolutionary base where Red Army schools, hospitals, arsenals, and other institutions would be secure. After Mao left on this mission, Chu Te selected and deployed troops further to organize and train partisans in the Tingchao and Jukin areas, and then, a week afterward, also left Tingchao on a campaign through South Kiangxi. The walled city of Ningtu, which lies a few miles to the east of Tunku and which the Red Army had already once occupied, was his final objective. As a rule, General Chu described such campaigns in military detail, giving full reports on the battles fought, the number and types of weapons captured, and the nature and amount of enemy supplies seized, building up a picture of the long and painful growth of the revolution. As the father of the Red Army, as he was often called, he was the living embodiment of its exhausting struggles and patient educational development. Yet for all his emphasis on military affairs, he was an unpredictable man, and his simple manner and commonplace appearance most deceptive. There were times when he described campaigns without more than the barest mention of battles, though these were never ending. Instead, he would recall and graphically describe the dreadful lot of the common people, much as a sociologist might do, or speak of the magnificent beauty of forested mountains with their somber cliffs shrouded in clouds, and compare them and their wild flowers with those of his native Sichuan. A steady stream of deep interest in and love of folk music also ran through his recollections at all times, until one was constrained to speculate about his development had he been born in other times and circumstances. Now, in describing his whirlwind campaign through South Kiangxi during which he fought the landlord Min Tuan and provincial armies, the sociologist in him came to the fore. In these regions, he said, the peasants lived in small villages surrounded by crumbling walls in which there was only one gate. Inside these walls were two rows of squalid thatch-roofed mud hovels bordering a street which became a quagmire in the rainy season. In dry weather the open gutters on either side of the street were filled with decaying refuse. The dark hovels had one door and no windows. Inside, the beds consisted either of pallets of rice straw on the earthen floor, or of boards stretched across trestles and heaped with rice straw which served both as mattress and covering. Too poor to afford the luxury of covers, the people slept in the only clothing they owned, loose trousers and jackets of many generations of patches. 
there might be a crude wooden table with benches for family meals. The stove, made of mud, was fed through a vent beneath the iron vat above, which was the only cooking vessel, and fuel was dried grass and twigs gathered from the hillsides by children. Rice bowls were of clay with broken pieces riveted in place. Chopsticks were whittled out of bamboo. No ray of culture ever penetrated these villages, which were breeding places of sickness and disease, and often of terrible crimes. Rents, as high as 70% or more of the crops, usury, crop failures, requisitions by provincial and local armies kept the death rate high and the peasant family small. General Chu held that at least 70% of the population consisted of poor peasants, tenants, and land laborers, and almost all were illiterate. Schools existed in market towns and cities, but only those able to pay tuition and provide decent school clothing for their children could afford such luxuries. The hundred-headed landlords, as the peasants called them, lived in the large towns and cities, safely enthroned behind strong walls. Here they acted as officials, judges, juries, and executioners. Commanders of the men Tuan, they used local garrison troops to supervise the reaping of the harvests lest the peasants bury some of the grain which the landlords claimed as their due. The dark peasant pessimism, or rather indifference, to the torment called life, began to break like ice under the spring breezes when rumors fled from east and west that a peasant named Chu Mao was leading a poor man's army against the nobles. This man, it was said, possessed magical powers by which he was able to command a whirlwind or summon the clouds to shield his army against its enemies. The lean brown men dressed like peasants who went in advance of the army to tell the peasants of its coming spoke in concrete rather than magical terms. At their words the peasants lifted their heads and, often without waiting for the army's approach, fought with their primitive weapons until they were crushed by the men twan from the cities. The heads of peasant leaders were mounted on poles before offending villages, and at night women crouched at the base of the poles in desolation. In the words of Tu Fu, the great Tang dynasty poet, whom General Chu called the greatest of China's classical poets, the darkness choked with tears. Many were the peasants who escaped death and, exhausted and with bloodshot eyes, made their way to Chu Te. Some wept in bitter desolation at the death of son or brother, some said with hate-filled voice, Let me fight. Chu Te, his eyes narrowed to small, hard points, listened to their stories and said to young commanders about him, Give them guns and train them on the march. Thus the muttering of the coming peasant storm, which twenty years later was to destroy an ancient oppression, eddied around Chu Te in South Kiangsi, around Mao Zedong marching with his thousand men on Sinquo, and around Peng Te Huai farther away to the northwest, and around other men in a dozen places in China. We never had to lay siege to any village, General Chu said. Whole villages poured out and often walked for miles to wait for us, but the strongholds of the landlords had to be taken by storm. Our miners, whom we had organized into an embryonic engineering corps, would excavate holes in the walls of such towns or cities and fill them with the black powder that the peasants manufacture and sell to make firecrackers. If the explosion failed to blow a hole through which our troops could enter, the peasants would bring bamboo ladders which we used to scale the walls. Often women and children marched along, carrying baskets and shoulder poles, to clean out the rice bins of the landlords. Our troops would fill their pouches with three days' rations of rice, and the peasants would take the rest. Everywhere we left trained men behind to organize and lead the peasants. Smashing east and west, north and south for weeks, Chu Te finally swept northward against the powerful walled city of Ningtu. He had once taken it without firing a shot, but now it was garrisoned by a whole regiment under a Kuomintang officer, Colonel Lei Xining. Colonel Lei was a member of the great landlord militarist family of the nearby Xiching district, and the head of this family was a general in Chiang Kai-shek's army. Colonel Lei, so the peasants said, had a harem of thirty women, and he had boasted that he would mount the head of the red bandit chieftain Chu Mao on the walls of Ningtu. Unable to blow up the strong walls of Ningtu, the red army laid siege to it. Then the troops took it by assault, going up the long bamboo ladders which the peasants brought and mounted against the walls. Hundreds of red soldiers and many peasants died in that struggle, but the city, with its entire garrison, was finally taken. 
In those days, there was no sharply drawn line between military and political work, so that everybody did everything, and Chu Tei's name appeared as a member of the Ningtu Soviet, while peasants in distant villages announced him as chairman of their peasant leagues. Chu Tei was not an individual, a person, but a symbol, a name confused with the Red Army, and Red Army men also often ceased to have individual names, but were addressed by peasants simply as Mr. Soei Ai, or Mr. Soviet. Wherever we went, General Chu said, we always opened the prison doors and released prisoners regardless of the charges against them. Crime is a class question, and real criminals were never among those prisoners. Instead, they were always poor men unable to pay their debts or taxes, or those who had been jailed for petty crimes against private property. We always found at least some prisoners who were suspected of belonging to peasant or workers' organizations, or to the Communist Party, though most such men had already died or been killed. Those left alive were shackled, and the chains had worn sores in their legs so that they often could not walk at all. All were covered with lice, their hair was long and matted, and many had tuberculosis, heart ailments, or were dying of dysentery or typhoid. The prison keepers furnished no food, which had to be supplied by the families of the victims. The prison authorities kept most of this food themselves, so that the prisoners were like skeletons. General Chu always found time to talk with the captive enemy soldiers. Those in Ningtu were very poor, illiterate, and simple-minded peasants who, General Chu said, had been taught nothing except how to shoot a gun. After a general explanatory meeting with the regiment, General Chu invited all who wished to do so to join, but said that those who did not wish to would be given traveling expenses to return to their homes. Some joined and were sent to the Tunku Mountain base for education and training, while the others were set at liberty as promised and, as General Chu said, to work like yeast among the peasants and Kuomintang soldiers. Colonel Lei Xining, commander of the enemy regiment, had changed into civilian clothing and hidden when Ningtu was occupied. He was found, dragged out of his hiding place, and led before Chu Tei, whose head he had promised to mount on the walls of the city. Considering the man's reputation for sexual prowess, Chu expected to see a big beefy Lothario, for a harem of thirty women surely called for physical endurance of a high order. Therefore, when Colonel Lei was escorted into his headquarters between two grinning guards, Chu was struck speechless. Before him stood a little shrimp of a fellow, the smallest man he had ever seen, and now in captivity one of the most craven. So you're the fellow with thirty concubines, who swore to mount my head on the walls of Ningtu. Chu exclaimed in amazement. A roar of laughter from his staff workers and guards destroyed the last shred of the little man's composure. Now listen. Chu said to the little man, we ought to shoot you, but we won't if you obey our orders. In your home in Xicheng are many rifles, machine guns, cases of ammunition, silver, and tons of rice looted from the peasants. You haven't paid your soldiers for five months. Either, you've salted that away also. Now all of these guns, ammunition, money, and rice shall be delivered to us here, and in addition we will give you a list of medicine which will have to be bought in Shanghai or some other big city. Until all of these things are in our hands, you will remain our prisoner. After that we will set you at liberty. The little turtle, as the red soldiers called him, wrote a letter which one of his soldiers took to his family in Xicheng. A few days later his chief wife came riding into Ningtu in a sedan chair, followed by columns of bearers with everything demanded except the medicine. She spent that night with her husband, but some of Chu's staff workers laid idle bets that instead of sleeping with him she gave him a good licking for costing the family so much by allowing himself to be captured. The thing that stumped them, they said, was why she wanted to ransom the fellow at all. Three months later, when the Red Army was campaigning in Fukien province, the Lei family finally delivered the demanded medical supplies. Chu had taken Colonel Lei along as a prisoner, but now, in fulfillment of his promise, he gave him a safe conduct pass and released him with the cool remark, if we catch you a second time things won't go so easy with you. A few days after the occupation of Ningtu, Mao Zedong came down the mountains from the west where he had fulfilled his mission and took charge of political work in the Ningtu district. General Chu recalled the slogans that called down from the walls of the city, confiscate and divide the land, the eight-hour day, raise wages, equality of men and women, equal pay for equal work, 
arm the people, eradicate illiteracy, destroy opium. Strike down the Kuomintang, running dog of foreign imperialism. The Ningtu victory was short-lived, and two weeks after occupying the city the Red Army was again on the march. Three enemy divisions were bearing down from the north with blood in their eyes. The army first helped the Ningtu Soviet and the people's organizations to evaluate to mountain villages, then set out, followed by two enemy divisions, for its base in Tingchao. This was also menaced by other enemy divisions moving up from the coast and from Kwangtung province in the south. Selecting the weakest link in the enemy chain, which in this instance was the Fukian troops coming up from the coast, Chu and Mao led the Red Army past Tingchao and in a lightning blow captured the walled city of Lunyan, the supply base of the Fukian army, where they seized military supplies of all kinds and 10,000 pounds of opium. Here Chu and Mao both spoke at a big memorial meeting for the Red Army dead. It was attended by throngs of civilians from the entire region who had never before heard of dead soldiers being honored. The captured opium was burned in a bonfire during the meeting, with Chu Te ceremoniously lighting the fire. In the future, Mao told the throngs, Free China would. Honor every soldier or civilian killed in the course of the revolution, would give his family pensions, and educate his children at state expense. It was in this memorial meeting that General Chu developed a theme which he repeated a thousand times in the years that followed. Reviewing the history of the Chinese revolutionary struggle from the time of the Taipings onward through the 1911, 1915, and 1925 to 1927 revolutions, he urged the people never to forget that they were the heirs of a great and sacred revolutionary tradition which in turn was a part of the liberation struggle of colonial peoples and of the world's oppressed. Years later this writer often heard General Chu address similar meetings, and his method was always the same. He was not a particularly good speaker, his voice was weak for outdoor audiences, and there was nothing dramatic or oratorical about him. He was more like a teacher, and like a teacher would often pause to ask, Tung Piyu Tung? Do you understand? And if voices replied that they did not, he would repeat and elaborate in other, or simpler, terms. In western and southern Fukian, and in South Kiangsi, where the people continued to struggle, there now came hard days. Powerful enemy forces occupied all the main towns and cities, and the people fled to the villages, buried their few precious documents, and fought as best they could from a thousand ambushes. Then the Red Army split in two. One section under Mao Zedong remained in western Fukian to harass the enemy while Chu Te led the other in a great diversionary maneuver down into Kuomintang territory as far as the coast in an effort to cut the enemy supply centers and draw at least the Fukian armies away from the Soviet base. Marching by night, turning back in his tracks to waylay enemy forces following him and slashing them in a thousand small battles, Chu Te made swiftly for the great coastal port of Chanchao. The red bandit chieftain Chu Te is rampaging through Fukian, murdering peasants, burning and raping, screamed the Kuomintang press in the great cities, while Chu Te's forces were being guided by peasants through the night and sheltered in their villages during the day. Heads rolled in the cities, and the Japanese, who regarded Fukian province as their sphere of influence, asked Chiang Kai-shek if he was able to crush the red bandits or if they would have to do it for him. Chang pleaded for time and more arms and ammunition from the foreign powers, and he got them. Chu remembered August 1, 1929, anniversary of the Nanchang Uprising. After a fierce battle with a force twice his own, his troops crossed a swift river on ropes slung from trees on either bank. On these ropes he and his troops crossed the river, hand over hand. They paused to rest in a sunny meadow where grazing cattle stared at them with melancholy eyes, and where regimental commander Luan Kung, killed before the year was out, spoke to the resting troops about the rise of fascism in Europe, from which he had but recently returned. Italian fascism had come to power under Mussolini, he said, and international bankers were propping up German capitalism in an effort to destroy the German Republic. A second world war was being planned, he declared, and nothing could stop it unless the working class of the world organized and united, and unless the Chinese people could overthrow Chiang Kai-shek's dictatorship and turn China into a base of peace and progress. By September 1st of that year, Chu Te was back in the Soviet regions of western Fukian from which the provincial enemy armies had fled while those from Kwangtung had withdrawn in disgust at Mao Zedong's ceaseless harassment. 
but Mao now lay dangerously sick with malaria and there was no quinine to cure him. This was the time of year when malaria took a greater toll than warfare, and the expensive quinine tablets sold by merchants in the interior consisted of bicarbonate of soda with just enough quinine to give them a slightly bitter taste. The Red Army Medical Corps, a primitive organization at best, sent one of its members through the enemy lines to buy quinine in Shanghai. When he returned in triumph from his mission, they sent him again. But this time he never returned, but was captured and beheaded en route, and no further life could be spared. But Mao Zedong's life was saved, though with difficulty, and Dr. Nelson Fu, the Christian convert from the British Baptist mission in Tingchao who had joined the Red Army and headed its medical corps, made periodical visits to the mountain village where Mao hovered between life and death. Chu Te still led the Red Army, pinning up enemy troops inside the walls of Tingchao while striking it and taking many other towns that had been lost in previous weeks. Not even malaria ever seemed to have a chance with him, though why this was he never knew. Forty-three summers had passed over his head, he had crossed in and out of the doors of death a thousand times, and still he did not know the meaning of sickness. Why was it that even the malarial mosquito failed to make an impression on General Chu? I once asked Dr. Nelson Fu, who shook his head in wonderment. Who knows, he answered. The man is just naturally tough. I remember that he had a single strip of cotton cloth with which he covered himself at night, but no mosquito net. I sometimes saw him, but when we had time for a little talk he was merely curious to know why I was a Christian and what Christianity was. He was curious about everything. He was a little rough for my taste and he had a sense of humor that the peasants and soldiers liked. And he was always optimistic. But, of course, none of this explains why he never caught malaria. Chapter 24 When General Chu came again to resume the story of his life, he spoke of song and battle, for he was a man to whom singing was a part of life and whose own life and thinking had been molded by battle. Until we came, he began, the people seldom sang. Of course there were a few old mountain songs, sung chiefly by individual men singers, but it was the revolution that released the energies of the people and gave birth to all kinds of songs, some very simple, even primitive, such as men sing when emerging from serfdom or slavery, but some more developed. They would be laughed at by rich people who like poems or songs above love, wine and moonlight, or about the beauty of a concubine's eyebrows. There were songs in which the peasants expressed their hopes, or even the new things they had learned to lead them to freedom. It was the Red Army that taught the people mass singing. The peasants in the mountains of Fukien and Kiangsi also made up new words to old melodies and sometimes created completely new ballads. Such a new ballad was the Ballad of Shanghong, which was almost a running narrative of what the peasants had learned from the Red Army. It was punctuated with expressions of pity for the poor and of hatred of the landlords who used the walled city of Shanghong in South Fukien as medieval lords of Europe once used their castles. Now listen closely to my song. Workers and peasants are very poor, eating bitterness while landlords eat meat, working while the landlords play. Ah, so hard. First we must unite and raise the red banner. Second, so a badge upon our sleeve. Third, destroy reactionaries in the village. Fourth, capture rifles from the landlords. Arm ourselves. We the masses must be clear. Destroy the militarist Luhan men, but not the captive soldiers, poor men like ourselves. Ah, so poor. Enter Shanghong, disturb no merchants, and always protect the poor. Capture the landlords and tiger gentry, no compromise with them. Bandits, all. Never forget the hundred-headed landlords, militarist, moneylender, magistrate, tax collector, police chief, men tuan leader, chamber of commerce and Kuomintang masters, dogmen, all. Red guards and peasants be clear. The date to attack Shanghong is decided. We march during the mid-autumn festival. The man-eating landlords must die. The people live. Exactly as the ballad related, in mid-September Chu Te led two regiments of regulars and detachments of Red Guards against the walled city of Shanghong in South Fukien. As they marched peasants picked up saws, axes, and spears and marched with them. On a late afternoon General Chu and his staff stood on a wooded mountainside with the setting sun in their eyes and looked down at the old walls of the landlord's stronghold lying in the valley at their feet. 
There was only one way to approach this city by land, and that was through the western gate. This gate was heavily fortified and open only a few hours each day. The other three gates were closed and sandbagged from within. General Chu and his staff looked over the scene with a practiced eye. Chu Tei had no intention of attacking from the west as the enemy expected. He turned to regimental commander Lin Piao at his side and pointed to a row of hills before the western gate and said, A couple of mortars on those hills can create enough of a row to draw all the enemy troops to that sector of the city while we scale the walk and take them in the rear. They knew the terrain already, for the Red Guards had described it in detail and had even drawn crude maps in the dust. Just to the north of the city, the Toku River swerved and made a complete horseshoe bend around the north, east, and southern walls of the city, but between that bend and the ancient walls was a broad strip of land which would come in handy this same night. And just before the northern gate was a wooded hill which General Chu marked out as his first command post. General Chu had a keen sense of drama, and the whole scene below them reeked with drama and comedy. Here they stood, thousands of them, in a forested mountain, looking down on their enemies who knew nothing whatever of their presence. Enemy soldiers were placidly bathing and washing their clothes in the river below, or lolling on its banks, and did not even hear the peasants and red troops sawing down giant bamboo to make ladders to scale the walls and attack them this very night. When darkness fell, Shanghong became a fairyland. It had an electric light plant and the city's rulers and defenders had strung electric lights all around the top of the city walls in the belief that they enabled the armed patrols pacing them at night to discover any possible attackers on the earth below. In fact, the lights merely spotlighted the patrols so that red guards had made a practice of crossing the river at night, coming down into the horseshoe bend and shooting out the lights above. This, General Chu said with a smile, had been in the interest of target practice and to disturb the enemy. The city's defenders no longer paid any attention to these nuisance raids, which could be also turned to advantage on this night. After the moan was up the plan was put into effect. Lin Piao marched off with one regiment of troops to the south of the city. Peasants had assembled boats to enable them to cross the river, after which they were to march back and get inside the horseshoe bend around the city from the south. At the same time Chu Tei left with the other troops and the Red Guards for a northern ferry where the peasants had lashed boats side by side in the river, held in place by long poles driven into the river bed, with boards placed across them to form a bridge for rapid crossing. Once they were across, a few men with mortars left for the low hills facing the western gate of the city to create a row and draw the enemy in that direction. By midnight Chu Tei had established his command post on the low hill before the northern gate. Inside the horseshoe bend, and his troops and red guards, with peasants carrying ladders, were all around the northern and eastern stretches of the city wall. Something went wrong so that Lin Piao didn't reach the southern wall until after the attack began. Sharpshooters gave the signal to the mortars to the west by shooting out the electric lights on the walls above. The enemy guards merely took shelter, thinking this was another nuisance raid of the Red Guards. Then the mortars began shelling the western gate and the enemy brigade would then rush to that sector of the city. The peasants rushed up and hoisted their ladders. The Red Troops and Red Guards, followed by Chu Tei and the peasants, went up in a steady stream and poured down into the city streets. It wasn't such a pushover as Chu Tei had expected, for the enemy brigade and the armed landlords, with no avenue of escape, fought until noon next day. By then all had been disarmed, and the landlords were herded into the filthy centuries-old prisons after the prisoners in them had been released. The medieval despots watched in shivering terror as the red troops carried out political prisoners who had been so savagely treated that they could not walk. Some even had lost the power of speech. Mao Zedong, still sick from malaria, was carried into the city on a stretcher. From his sickbed he directed all political work, including the revival of the people's organizations and the organization of the Shanghai Soviet. Peasants from far and near poured into the city to celebrate the victory, take part in the division of the land, and participate in the trials of the hated landlords. With twisted lips General Chu recalled those trials. Aged parents, widows, fathers, and brothers walked up to the landlords and cried out, Where is my son? Where is my brother? Where is my father? Receiving no reply, 
they attacked them with their bare hands. The Red Guards, set to maintain order, refused to obey orders of their commanders to protect the prisoners. After only a few days in Shanghai, Chu Tei was on the march again, cleaning all South Fukian of enemy forces. Finally, in late October, he and his troops erupted into the adjoining East River regions of Kwangtung province where the famous Ironsides had been destroyed two years before. This time he was again defeated by the 19th Root Army, which hurled against him its three full divisions, armed to the teeth. He lost hundreds of men, but one of the greatest losses to him was Regimental Commander Lu Kung, one of the most brilliant and highly educated Red Army commanders. General Chu's heart seemed to be a scroll on which were engraved all the battles of the revolution and the names of all the men who had died under his command. After leaving two companies of volunteers to reinforce the East River region's guerrillas, late November saw him again retreating northward through the mountains into Kiangxi province. He grieved as he marched. The Kuomintang could afford to lose thousands of men, he remarked sadly, but our men were not pawns in the ambitious games of militarists. We educated each Red Army fighter so that, in case of defeat in battle, he could raise up a new army and continue the revolution. Each of our men was a precious revolutionary asset. He knew that there would be many defeats or partial defeats and many thousands would die before his hopes for China could be realized. Yet he reacted passionately at each defeat and at every death under his command. He tried but failed to draw comfort from the fact that his troops were carrying hundreds of new captured weapons or ammunition and other supplies. It was only when he met a peasant partisan detachment in the mountains along the Kwangtunkiansi border that some of his gloom lifted. There were over 600 of these partisans, and of these near to 200 were Red Army veterans who had followed him and Mao Zedong through the enemy blockade around Chinkinshan nearly a year before. Sick or wounded, they had been left with the peasants to recover during that bitter winter when the Red Army fought a desperate running battle through these same mountains. Each such man had been given his rifle and a few rounds of ammunition and told, upon recovery, to organize and lead the peasants in partisan warfare. Those who survived had done so. Contacting one another, they had organized a small regiment which was modeled on the parent body, even to the political workers in each squad. Rejoining the Red Army, they now led Chu Te into a secure partisan area where his troops could rest while he sent messengers to Mount Zetong in Fukien. The messengers returned with reports, during Chu's absence, powerful enemy forces had captured all the walled cities, including Shanghong, but the countryside still remained in the hands of the people. Mao had withdrawn to a secure Soviet district, Kudian, in the Fukien Mountains, where the Ninth Conference of Red Army Delegates, long planned, was to convene on January 1, 1930, just two weeks away. Each company under Chu Te's command was to elect delegates to the Congress. Fighting his way toward Kudian, Chu tried to recapture Shanghong. He failed, but drove the enemy from Tingchao for a few days. Enemy reinforcements arrived, and he gave it up. Chu Te arrived in Kudian early in the morning of the new year. The villagers received him and his troops as if they were returning from a great victory. The crops were good that year, General Chu said, interrupting his narrative, and after the landlords were driven out and the land divided, the people had enough to eat and a surplus for the army. They poured into Kudian district by the thousands, each with his own bedding and a week's food, and each group with gifts for us. They brought great quantities of rice, with chickens and ducks, and even drove pigs and cattle before them that we might have meat for the new year. Our troops and the people cooked and ate. Together and at night the streets resounded with drum and gong, bursting firecrackers, and singing. Paper dragons danced to the light of thousands of colored lanterns, and I wrote down a new song which the partisans sang as they marched in. It began, You are poor, I am poor, of ten men, nine are poor. If the nine poor men unite, where, then, are the tiger landlords? Observing a Red Army practice followed since the days of its inception, General Chu delivered his annual military report to the Kudian Conference of Red Army Delegates. Mao Zedong reported on political problems, not only of the army in the Soviet regions, but on the state of the nation and of such international developments as were within his knowledge. 
These were portentous times, Mao reported, for the great economic depression of the capitalist world had begun and the Kuomintang regime, linked to foreign imperialism, was dragging China down deeper into colonial subjection. Within less than three years of the Kuomintang dictatorship, Mao reported, and Chu mentioned the same facts in his report, the major shares in Chinese mines, steel, iron, and textile industries had passed into foreign hands. British and Belgian capitalists were trying to buy the famous tungsten mines in Taiyu and Kiangxi, which accounted in part for the insistence of these foreign capitalists that Chiang Kai-shek destroy the Red Army and restore peace and order. China was in a perennial economic depression, yet this was growing deeper as the world depression deepened. Factories in the great Chinese cities were closing down, throwing new thousands of workers into the ranks of the unemployed. Cheap child and woman labor was replacing men in such factories as still operated, yet even children and women had staged strikes of desperation which had been broken up by club and gun. Falling prices and Chiang Kai-shek's new war with Marshal Feng Yuxiang in North China had driven new millions of peasants into bankruptcy. These peasants were turning to banditry, vagabondage, or to the warlord armies for the sake of their daily bowl of rice. As the armed force of the masses, the Red Army alone offered a revolutionary solution for the deepening poverty and subjection of the Chinese people, Mao declared. But to achieve this goal, certain reforms had to be introduced into the army. The resolution which he presented to the Conference on Future Policy had been formulated after long consultation with Chu Tei and other leaders. First, he said, the higher organs of the army and party must first reach decisions, after which they were to be discussed until understood and agreed to by the rank and file, thus reversing a practice in use up to that time, a practice that had led to many military defeats. Secondly, the absolute equalitarianism of the army would have to be brought to an end because it had also led to disunity and sometimes to defeat. Up to that time, the troops had objected to any discrimination whatever in the distribution of food, clothing, the carrying of burdens, the distribution of billets and orders, and the use of horses. They had even objected to special food for the sick and wounded, and insisted that every person carry the same load, regardless of age, sex, or physical capacity, and they had criticized any commander who rode a horse as undemocratic. Food and clothing, Mao declared, could and should be shared and shared alike by fighters and commanders, the sick and wounded required special consideration. Nor could every person carry the same burden as everyone else, such things had to be determined by capacity. Certain army organizations required larger billets and more orderlies to carry out their work, while officers who rode a horse worked far into the night and long after the fighters had gone to a just night's rest. Mao gave many intellectuals in the army a working over because of their idealist tendencies. Such men, he said, concocted abstract theories out of their heads instead of studying concrete social, military, and political problems and reaching decisions based on fact. Mao's resolution was accepted by the conference, after which the delegates returned to their units and called general meetings where it was discussed and debated until accepted. General Chu held that the reforms led to a great strengthening of the army and enabled it to liberate all central and south Kiangxi and even recapture the walled cities in western Fukien which it had formerly lost. This territory, known as the Central Soviet Districts, was then expanded until it embraced most of Kiangxi and Fukien provinces. From January to April 1930, Chu Tei was in personal command of the main forces of the Red Army waging a swift and hard-hitting campaign against the old Yunnan army in which he had once been a brigadier and which Chang had ordered back into Kiangxi to tear the red bandits out by the roots. By June, these Yunnan troops were so shattered and disaffected that Chang had to replace them with fresh troops. The manner in which the Yunnan army disintegrated amused General Chu. Not only did those troops sabotage the orders of their officers, he said, but they made a regular practice of sending reports to him by peasant messengers. Large numbers also would pay a peasant a dollar or two to guide them to the nearest Red Army unit. As early as January, when the campaign began, a Yunnan Army bandit suppression officer, Colonel Lo Pinghui, led his regiment over to the Red Army and fought in its ranks until death claimed him 13 years later. 
Mao Zedong, who also commanded troops during this particular campaign, immediately took over the reorganization and reconstruction of the newly liberated territory. General Chu allowed no grass to grow under his feet before calling up and organizing as many young peasants as possible. Following the usual establishment of the councils of people's delegates, the Soviets, and the various cities, towns, and villages, all. Old taxes were abolished, General Chu recalled. A single progressive tax on the grain crop was introduced instead. Since the army supplied itself by capture from the enemy, the tax revenue was devoted entirely to reconstruction. Usury and opium were forbidden, mortgages and papers of debt returned, primary schools and cooperatives of various kinds formed, and the first small peasant bank established. Before redistributing the land, Mao Zedong sent teams of political workers to survey land conditions. It was the first survey ever made in the region. It revealed that 70% of the land, including big estates, temple and ancestral lands, was owned or controlled by landlords who constituted 1-2% to of the population. Of the remaining 30% of the land, about half was owned by rich peasants and the remainder by middle and poor peasants. The survey classified 70% of the peasants as poor, 20% as middle peasants, and 10% as rich. A rich peasant was one who owned his land and worked it, but also hired laborers and, like the landlords, but on a smaller scale, engaged in usury. A middle peasant was one who owned his land and cultivated it, employed no hired labor, and did not engage in usury. A poor peasant was a tenant who might own, at best, a small piece of land. With this survey as a guide, the land was redistributed among the landless peasants and the agricultural laborers. Middle peasants whose holdings were too small to support their families also shared in the distribution. The cultural department of the Soviets turned temples into free primary schools for poor children. At night, when the children moved out, adult illiterates came in. Temples were also used for the training of mass organizers or as headquarters for mass organizations of the army. There were few teachers, no textbooks, little paper, and not even blackboards. The Red Army captured Changsha in Hunan in July of that year, and the city of Qian in Qiangxi in October. Kuomintang printing presses were confiscated and moved to the countryside. Only then could primers, small newspapers, and booklets for mass education be published. The first mass booklets consisted of a simple series entitled Talks with Peasants, Talks with Workers, Talks with Soldiers, and Talks with Women. Thus began what General Chu called the greatest study movement in Chinese history, a movement reflected in slogans painted on walls, cliffs, and even the trunks of trees, learn, learn, and learn again, study until the light fails, study as you plow. Study by the reflected light of snow. Memories of that first hungry search of the depressed and injured for knowledge filled General Chu with both pride and melancholy. In those days, he recalled, the army had to do almost everything. Every man in its ranks able to impart knowledge spent any leisure moment he might have in teaching the peasants what he knew of common and political knowledge. Teachers were few and far between, and the occasional primary school teachers who announced the opening of a school for children in some temple would appear at the stipulated time to find almost the entire village, from old grandfathers to mothers with babies at their breast sitting side by side with their children on the school benches and spilling out into the temple courtyards. They did the best they could, and after a time selected the most advanced children to become little teachers to the others. Women's work, poor until then, made rapid progress under the guidance of the Special Department for Women and Youth Affairs, which each local Soviet established. Women became the most militant advocates of the equality of the sexes and adopted their own methods of dealing with such of their menfolk as proved recalcitrant. The greatest problem was economic. Kiangxi was a poor province and trade with the Soviet and Kuomintang areas was weak and sporadic. Salt in particular, as well as many other products, was scarce and expensive. During this period of reconstruction General Chu was primarily occupied with military matters. He had to deal with islands of enemy troops or with an occasional regiment that saw renown and a bonus from Chiang Kai-shek for raid extermination activities. Just what reports such troops sent to Nanking General Chu never knew, but he felt certain they hardly conformed to the facts. 
one such regiment advanced bravely up from a Quangtung city in the south. Chu waylaid them in the mountains and his troops fell upon them like a landslide. They chased the remnants straight through their city base and on the way back picked up all the supplies at their stations. By then his reputation for uncanny maneuvers was such that a whole enemy brigade in Jiqin, the future Soviet capital, mutinied and fled as he approached and the speed of their departure was such that even his runners failed to catch up with them. Those were months so filled with work, he said, that he never even saw his wife, who was off somewhere organizing women in the new women's associations. This casual reference introduced his fourth wife, Khan K.E.H. Chin, the peasant girl whom he married in late 1929, some nine or ten months after the woman writer, Wu Yulan, his third wife, had been captured and beheaded by the Kuomintang. Khan K.E.H. Chin was a peasant girl in her late teens at the time, a strongly built young woman who had been an agricultural laborer on a landlord's estate until she fought with the peasants as Chu's army swept over the country. She was illiterate when he first met her, but by 1937 she was a cadet in Kanta, the anti-Japanese resistance university in Yunnan that trained military and political leaders for the army. Like other women cadets, she had been in military uniform for years and now lived in the women's dormitories of Kanta except for the one day of rest a week when she was at liberty to visit her husband and friends. General Chu was both fond and proud of. Kam K.E.H. Chin, to whom he referred as a girl who grew up and was educated in the army, a typical Red Army product. From the time she joined the army she had studied and done such work as had been given her by the Communist Party of which she had become a member. She had made the long march over the Great Plains, rivers, and snow mountains of China and by 1937, when this writer met her, she was a grave, disciplined, and hard-working veteran. About Chu Tei she spoke as she might have spoken of someone distant from her. This was her analysis, perhaps his greatest qualities were his tenacious loyalty and personal integrity and his lack of personal political ambitions, qualities that enabled him to subordinate himself to the civilian authority of the party which guided the army. In addition he was a kind and, on the whole, an even-tempered man who loved the troops and was loved by them in turn. Yes, she replied to a question, he was a disciplined student of military and political books, when he could get them, and he read and underscored newspapers and reports, allowing nothing to escape his attention. The lectures which he delivered in Kanta were always carefully prepared, and he was an exacting teacher, as she, who was one of his students, well knew. In mass meetings attended by troops and civilians, he used simple language and often repeated it if they did not understand. His sense of humor was not as bitingly satirical as that of Mao Tse Tung. Neither General Chu nor Khan K.E.H. Chin seemed to place any emphasis on the great discrepancy in their ages. At that, it was not at all apparent, for even at the age of 51 he remained strong and vital and at the height of his powers. They appeared remarkably well matched. Both were peasants, as strong and elemental as the soil that had given them birth, and though simple and commonplace in appearance their shrewd intelligence belied their apparent unsophistication. She had clearly learned a great amount from him and had depended upon his guidance, yet there was about her the tremendous independence of the new revolutionary women of China. At the age of 43 he had found a life companion, a woman able to accompany him and share every aspect of his life for better or for worse. What they meant to each other, neither said, they took each other for granted, as well-adjusted married people do. And marriage, in China, is taken for granted. Chapter 25 When June 1930 dawned, Chu Tei was in the walled mountain city of Tingchao in western Fukien province, waiting for Mao Tse Tung and other party leaders to come over from Kiangxi for an important conference. In the previous five months there had been a few days of rest for his troops, but not for him. For those five months he had marched on his own legs with his troops. At the age of forty-four his lean body was as tough as steel and he could do with as little as four hours of sleep or less. From now on it would be less. A messenger had just arrived in Tingchao from the Central Committee of the Communist Party in Shanghai where, as in other Kuomintang cities, there was a perpetual open season on all communists and other revolutionaries. This messenger had brought two resolution orders to the Red Army, both of them signed by Lili San, chairman of the Organization Bureau of the Communist Party and then the most powerful member of its Politburo. 
one of these orders was a complete plan for army reorganization, not only of the forces of Chu and Mao, but of all red armies in other parts of the country which were to be brought under a single, centralized command. With Chu Tei as the commander-in-chief and Mao Zedong the political commissar, or supreme party representative. The other document was an order for the Chu Mao forces, and others elsewhere, to leave the rural areas and capture the great industrial cities. As during the Great Revolutionary Period, the industrial workers in the great cities were to arise in general strikes. This new strategic plan, which embraced the whole country, called for the shifting of the center of revolutionary gravity from the rural to the industrial areas on the theory that the dispossessed proletariat alone could lead the agrarian and national revolution to a swift and victorious conclusion. Looking back at those plans and orders, General Chu declared that Li Li San and his supporters had little faith in, or understanding of, the Chinese agrarian revolution or of the councils, or Soviets, through which the masses exercised power. Nor did they trust the policy directed by Mao Zedong which was founded on the facts of the military and political situation of China. Li Li San was quoted as having said that by such tactics our hair will be white before the revolution is victorious. In accordance with the new orders, the four main Red Armies were reorganized in Army Corps, the first Red Army Corps of which Chu Tei was to remain Commander-in-Chief and Mao Zedong the political commissar, or party representative. Ho Long's forces in western Hunan and Hupa provinces were to become the second Red Army Corps. Peng Tei Hui's forces in northwestern Kiangxi were to be the third Red Army Corps. The guerrilla forces in the mountainous regions north of the Yangtze in central China were to be the 4th Red Army Corps. Su Xianqian was the military commander and Chang Kuotao the political commissar of this latter. Core. While Chu and Mao were skeptical about the theory upon which the whole new strategy of the revolution was based, they were irrevocably opposed to one particular aspect of the plan of reorganization of their forces. All weapons, so ran the order, were to be concentrated in the hands of the Red Army. This meant that the peasant partisans were to become a regular part of the army and were to leave the Soviet areas with the army in the campaign against the industrial cities. Both Chu and Mao rejected this plan because, General Chu explained, it would have denuded the Soviet regions of armed defenders, left them wide open to enemy occupation, and deprived the Red Army of a revolutionary base. However, he said, we accepted it in theory, which meant that they organized the peasant partisans into three small armies under the 1st Red Army Corps, but ordered them to remain where they were as defenders of their native soil. General Chu's attitude toward the new strategy was expressed in these words, Mao and I were very skeptical about the whole plan, but we had been isolated in the interior for years and such information as we had about the national and international situation was incomplete. We therefore had to accept the analysis of such conditions sent us by our central committee. We knew of the great capitalist depression and we knew generally that the situation in China was far worse than when the Manchu dynasty was blown over in 1911. We had to accept the central committee's analysis which stated that the country was on the eve of a nationwide upheaval. Despite this, our army and, insofar as we knew of them, the other red armies were still weak and poorly armed. Even if we succeeded in capturing a few industrial cities, we doubted our ability to hold them even with the help of the industrial workers. The counter-revolutionary forces were numerically superior and infinitely better armed than we, and we were more convinced than in the past that the imperialist powers which supported the Kuomintang dictatorship would actively intervene against us to protect that dictatorship. Though Chiang Kai-shek was at war with Marshal Feng Yuxiang, we were also convinced that he was planning a big campaign against us and that it would begin very soon. Apart from Mao and myself, there was very little opposition to the Lili San line. We had no choice but to accept it. By June 19th, therefore, the reorganization of our army was complete, we had 20,000 men, and we took the first oath of allegiance to the revolution. After that, Every branch of the Red Army took the Oath of Allegiance on August 1st, the anniversary of the Nanchang Uprising in 1927. The nucleus of the Revolutionary Military Council, the sovereign military political body and the forerunner of the Chinese Soviet government, was also organized at this time, General Chu said. The council comprised all commanders and political commissars of the various Red Army Corps in every part of the country. 
General Chu added that this body was little more than a theory at the time because our communications, which were by messenger only, were so poor that we could not reach the other Red Armies. Swallowing their doubts, on June 22, Chu Tei and Mao Tse Tung jointly signed an order of the day which, after summarizing the national situation as described to them by the Central Committee, described the tasks, routes of march, and assembly points of each army taking part in the campaign against the great cities. These troops under their command were to concentrate in a city in central Kiangxi and then fight their way through enemy territory to the provincial capital of Nanchang in the extreme north of the province. After occupying this city, they were to take Kukiang, which lies on the Yangtze just to the north of Nanchang, then sweep westward along the Yangtze toward the great Wuhan cities of Hankou, Hanyang, and Wuchang, the birthplace of the 1911 revolution. Simultaneously, Peng Taihui's 3rd Red Army Corps was to leave its base in northwestern Kiangxi, march westward and occupy Changsha, the capital of Hunan province, after which it was to will northward against the Wuhan cities. The 2nd Red Army Corps under Ho Long from the west and the 4th Red Army Corps under Su Xianqian and Chang Kuotao from the north would meanwhile be converging on Wuhan where the industrial workers were to arise in a general strike as they had done during the northern expedition in 1925 to 1927. This triple city, the Chicago of China, which commanded the Yangtze to the east and the west and the Peking Canton Railway to the north and the south, would fall to the combined forces of the Chinese people, and after Wuhan, all China. From the literary viewpoint, I remarked, carried away by Chu's narrative, the strategy was stupendous, dramatic, a vast army marching to liberate the oppressed city population, the masses arising to smash the chains of a century of subjection, a nation reaching for the stars. General Chu Tei's eyes narrowed and the expression on his face grew increasingly quizzical. Oh, there was plenty of drama in it, he replied with a short little laugh, but this was not an exercise in literature. Our army was not vast, it was small and armed only with light weapons. The militarist armies were large, with artillery, and the country's resources to draw on, and the naval vessels of the imperialist powers patrolled our inland and coastal waters and lay at anchor before the great cities. The strategy was pure adventurism, an effort to leap over great difficulties and problems that had to be faced and solved before China could be emancipated. Mao and I sensed this but lacked sufficient information to reject the plan, and we were practically alone in our misgivings. Swarms of their political workers went in advance of the troops, calling on the peasants to arise. Enemy troops hid or scattered or fell back on Nanchang as the Red Army slashed its way across the length of Kiangxi province. We gathered tens of thousands of peasants to us as we marched, were the exact words of General Chu. We armed them on the spot and distributed them among our combat units to be trained on the march. Martial law lay over all the great cities, new enemy divisions poured into them, and the heads of workers and intellectuals rolled in the streets. General strikes had been prepared, but the workers' leaders were dead. Unless we liberated them, the workers could do nothing. On July 29, 1930, in the sweltering heat of summer, Chu and Mao approached Nanchang in the far north of Kiangxi and looked into the distance at its powerful defense works. On that date the news flashed through China that Peng Taihui's 3rd Red Army Corps, supported by clouds of peasants and by workers and intellectuals inside the city, had occupied the Hunan provincial capital of Changsha and proclaimed the Soviet government of three provinces, Hunan, Kiangxi, and Hupa, with Li Li San as its absentee chairman. The threat to Nanchang by Chu and Mao and the occupation of Changsha brought the foreign powers directly onto the battlefield in support of the Kuomintang. American, British, Italian, and Japanese gunboats had already evaluated all foreigners from Changsha, but on July 30th, one day after the occupation, they returned. Lying in the Xi'an River, they began a four-day bombardment that set great fires and killed thousands of troops and civilians in the city. The bombardment was led by the United States gunboat Palos. Under cover of the foreign bombardment, the local warlord, Ho Qian, who had fled the city as the Red Army advanced, moved up. On the evening of August 3rd, the Red troops and all the civilian organizations that had supported them began the evacuation of Changsha, taking with them the printing press, newsprint, rice, money, and other material confiscated from counter-revolutionary forces. 
railway workers on the branch line that runs eastward from Chansha into the mining areas of northwestern Kiangxi spent that night shuffling back and forth with their one railway engine and three cars as they evaluated first the wounded and then the confiscated supplies. On August 4th, warlord Ho Chien returned to Changsha. Within a week, he slaughtered so many thousand civilians that merchants and industrialists issued a manifesto condemning him as a butcher who knows only how to kill innocent people. During this same period, on August 1st, Chu and Mao threw their lane, sweating soldiers against the defense works around Nanchang, neither sleeping nor resting as their troops fell like autumn leaves under the fire of enemy artillery. Chu Tei's face became the color of clay and even seemed to have a faintly greenish tinge, as this writer saw later under similar circumstances during the National Anti-Japanese War. Men were dying at his command and no man knew what the outcome might be. Twenty-four hours later he and Mao ordered their army to withdraw. They moved westward toward Wuhan in three columns, with an interval of a few miles between each column. They encountered a representative of Peng Taihuai on the way and gathered in the forested mountains of northwestern Kiangxi where they united with Peng's army and held a conference to debate Li Li San's orders. These called for the reoccupation of Changsha and taking the Wuhan cities against which the 2nd and 4th Red Army Corps were already converging. Mao Zedong questioned this policy and was supported by Chu and Peng in particular. General Chu said that in his opinion, and he was supported by Mao and Peng and many other men, the Red Army was neither equipped nor trained to fight positional warfare, which would be necessary from this time on. Enemy reinforcements pouring into Changsha alone had thrown up three lines of defense works, reinforced by electrified wire entanglements. The defenses of Wuhan were still more powerful and many foreign men of war were anchored in the Yangtze waiting to turn their guns on the Red Army. To attack such overwhelming enemy forces and powerful equipment might result in the annihilation of the Red Army and in the crushing of the revolution for decades to come. All such arguments were voted down, however, and the second attack on Changsha began in the first week of September and lasted until the evening of September 13th. Peasants and workers by the thousands helped the army throw up trenches, transported rice and ammunition, and cleaned the battlefield of the dead and wounded. But human flesh, even when inspired, cannot endure against steel. At 8 p.m. on September 13th, Chu and Mao took one of the most serious steps of their careers, a step which precipitated a grave crisis in China's revolutionary movement. They repudiated the Lili San line, which was the policy adopted by the Central Committee of the party of which they were leading members, and ordered their troops to withdraw from Changsha. They dispersed in eight different columns and returned to Kiangxi province to concentrate on the 30th of that month, near Qian, the citadel of absentee landlordism and second to Nanchang as military headquarters of Kuomintang armies. Their orders, which were supported by Peng Taihuai and most, but not all, commanders, forced the withdrawal of the two other red armies converging on Wuhan. It compelled the Communist Party to call off all its plans for a nationwide armed uprising against the Kuomintang dictatorship. Yet, General Chu declared, any other decision would have resulted in the destruction of the living heart of the revolution. The Li Li San policy was pure adventurism, he added, a romantic gamble with little to support it. General Chu had the ability completely to forget his immediate surroundings and to relive those tragic days when his troops defied death and dropped in hundreds before enemy artillery. Under the cover of darkness groups of men adopted every contrivance to break. The electrified wire entanglements around enemy defenses, and their bodies lay in small mounds where they had met their death. The army even bought 50 water buffalo from the peasants and tried to use them as living tanks to break the wires and enable the troops to get at the enemy beyond. This was a trick lifted from the ancient tales of the three kingdoms. The animals were lined up facing the electrified wire entanglements while peasants tied strings of firecrackers to their tails. The firecrackers were lit, but instead of dashing forward and breaking the wires, the great terrified beasts lunged in every direction, scattering everyone in sight. General Chu's smile was slightly twisted at the memory of a stunt that had worked shortly after the time of Christ, but not in 1930. When he finally issued the orders to retreat, there were many party members who protested, some of whom even denounced him and Mao, 
Yet the troops obeyed without question and hotly replied to all arguments against their leaders whom they regarded as bone of their bone and blood of their blood. Neither Chu nor Mao needed to defend themselves, nor could they for that matter, because they had moved with their headquarters to Peng Taihui's base in northwestern Kiangxi. After picking up a thousand new minor volunteers, they and Peng left for the rendezvous near Qian where they found all their troops loyally awaiting them. Mao addressed the assembled troops, regiment by regiment, explaining the reasons for the retreat from Changsha, and followed this with an explanation of the plan of battle to take Qian. And when Chu went among them, the troops gathered about him as always, touched him with their big rough hands, and he rested his arms about their shoulders as they talked together as soldiers talk. Qian fell at midnight on October 4, 1930, and while Mao took over the civilian administrative work and directed the organization of the Qian Soviet, Chu moved beyond the city walls to deal with the 10,000 new worker and peasant volunteers who poured into the army. The city itself had become a teeming throng of peasants who slept knee-deep in the streets at night and, as General Chu expressed it, after seeing the sights and attending mass meetings, marched back to their villages, taking their landlords with them for trial. Fully a million peasants entered and left Qian in the two weeks the city was held by the Red Army. General Chu remembered Qian especially because there he unearthed important documents in enemy military headquarters. Some of these documents dealt with plans for the first big red extermination campaign. Chiang Kai-shek's war in North China had ended and he was transferring a 100,000 Kuomintang troops to Kiangxi against the Red Army. The war was to start in late October. The other captured documents dealt with the so-called anti-Bolshevik, or A.B., Corps, a cloak-and-dagger outfit of the Kuomintang secret police which had a network of sabotage and terrorism throughout the Soviet areas. The documents filled General Chu with foreboding because the names of A.B. members in the Soviet areas were given in code which the communists were unable to break for many months. There had been enough carelessness, however, to provide important clues, such as a receipt for money openly signed by a landlord in the Tunkusinkwo Soviet district. One of the chief communist leaders in this district, Li Wenling by name, was the son of this same landlord. General Chu could not believe that Li Wenling was connected with the A.B. Corps, yet here was a document signed by his father. Until that time the Red Army had a committee to deal with secret enemy machinations, but it was only after Qian that it organized its special committee to combat the counter-revolution and began serious work. Even after the A.B. Corps codes were broken, General Chu said, the Red Army made no arrests. Instead, members of the new special committee made friends with A, B members, joined their secret groups, and worked until the entire enemy network was in its hands. By then, General Chu declared as if recalling a horrible nightmare, many of our best comrades had been secretly murdered, one of our armies of Tunku troops had mutinied under the leadership of the sons of Tunku landlords, and such confusion and suspicion had been created that no man knew if he could trust his brother. A.B. members had organized secret superstitious religious groups to predict the destruction of the Red Army, and to isolate the masses from us they even founded free love societies where the landlords used the women of their own families in an effort to seduce Red Army fighters. The Red Army had a rigid code of morality without which the peasants would have fought them, and it was this reputation for morality that the landlords tried to destroy. They failed. Chu Tei's method of dealing with the problem was to go directly to the troops, explain all the tactics employed by the A.B. Corps, and urge vigilance. Specially trained bodyguards protected him, Mao, and other leaders, but three of these bodyguards were secretly murdered before the back of the A.B. Corps was broken forever. In early 1937, when General Chu told me of this long struggle against the tortuous Machiavellism of a predatory ruling class fighting for its ancient privileges, I once watched him and the chief of the committee to combat the counter-revolution at a big dinner. At the time, the chief of this committee was a man who had been a minor from the age of 11 and who had become one of the earliest labor organizers of China. To observe Chu Tei and this minor together was to understand the difference between the Chinese peasant and the Chinese industrial worker. In social gatherings, General Chu was as calm and relaxed as a cat. At all times he was a man who could lose himself in any marketplace where peasants gathered to sell cabbages and gossip to their heart's content. Every 
inch of him, from his commonplace appearance to his movements, was peasant. The chief of the committee to combat the counter-revolution, however, could not have disappeared in any peasant gathering. There was no rest or relaxation, no elasticity in him. Dynamic and alert, in both expression and movement he was the embodiment of controlled energy which frequently characterizes the industrial workers in Western countries during great struggles. It was undoubtedly due to this man, and to many others like him, that Chu Te, Mao Tse Tung, and other Red Army and Communist leaders had not been murdered by their secret enemies. I thought again of this man when the People's Revolutionary Army marched into Peking in January 1949 and published notices ordering all members of the Kuomintang secret police, the Blue Shirts, to surrender their weapons and register with the Peking police or be wiped out. In obedience to this order, a suave professor in Tsinghua University near Peking presented himself at police headquarters to register as a captain in the Blue Shirts which had spread terror among students professors and intellectuals in particular. He was duly registered and told to resume his teaching in Tsinghua as before, but the new chief of police quietly informed him, you have made a slight mistake in your registration. You were not a captain in the blue shirts, you were a lieutenant colonel. Book 8 Red Phalanx Chapter 26 Loud Hosannas sounded over Shanghai and other great Chinese cities in that late October 1930, when the curtain went up on the first big raid extermination campaign. Chiang Kai-shek was the hero of the hour, fresh from victory over his northern rivals. Now he was transferring 100,000 of his troops against the Red Vermin in Kiangxi. Communism was the one irreconcilable anti-imperialist and anti-feudal force in China, the only organized force whose members had proved that they were willing to die for a principle. Such men were dangerous but, being weak, could be destroyed if attacked in time. Now was the time and the outcome seemed certain. For who were the Reds in Kiangxi but peasants and workers, the most despicable of human creatures? Did not the whole world know that the Chinese peasant cared not at all who ruled him but wished only to be left in peace to till his few feet of earth? The Kuomintang press and its foreign fellow travelers made a great noise. The former proudly published the most complete details of the armies marching against the Reds and even of their routes of march. But no word came from the Red armies, above all nothing from Chu and Mao whose army, it was said, had been driven from Qian by victorious Kuomintang troops. The Red Army consisted of nothing but remnant bandits who would soon be completely surrounded and exterminated. Down in Kiangxi, Chu and Mao and their comrades studied the Kuomintang press most carefully, and General Chu made a point of marking and underscoring each military report of which the Kuomintang was so proud. The Red Army still had no radios, yet its communications and intelligence service had improved greatly, and the Kuomintang military press reports tallied with its own. It still had no news from Shanghai, but Chu and Mao had sent delegates to Shanghai to oppose the Lili San line of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. Whatever the outcome, they knew they were right. In mid-October, Chu and Mao and their comrades held a military conference in Peng Taihui's headquarters to the north of Qian. Here they decided to evaluate Qian, because to hold that city against forces twice as numerous as theirs would entail sacrifices they were not prepared to make. They would withdraw 40,000 of their main forces into consolidated Soviet territory where they would have the complete support of the people. In this region lying between the Tunku Mountain base and the walled city of Kuangcheng they would, as General Chu put it, select our own battlefields and, by swift concentrations, surprise attacks and dispersals, encircle and attack first one and then another of the enemy divisions sent to exterminate us. Of the whole campaign that followed and which lasted four months, General Chu selected one specific battle as an example of how the Red Army fought. This same battle must have been in the mind of Mao Tse Tung when he later wrote in his military textbook, Strategic. Problems of China's Revolutionary War In military history there are instances of defeat in one battle which nullify all the achievements of previous successive victories, and of victory in one battle following many defeats which develops a new situation. This specific battle, which caused the entire Kuomintang campaign to collapse, was fought in the last days of December 1930 against the 18th Division commanded by General Chang Wei-chang. 
General Chang's other two divisions were the 28th and 50th, and the three of them were the backbone of the Kuomintang armies. They were full, regular divisions, excellently equipped with foreign weapons, and excellently supplied. Before describing this decisive battle, General Chu digressed to tell of treachery in the ranks of the Red Army itself, a treachery which threatened to turn the tide in favor of the enemy. In the midst of weeks of fighting, he said, Lu Ti Sao, son of a landlord, led his 20th Red Army of Tunku peasants in mutiny. Lu was supposed to defend the Fukien region near Qian, despite a B. Core documents captured in Qian in October which had proved that at least one of the landlord families of Tunku was connected with the secret Kuomintang cloak and dagger organization. Lu Ti Sao and Li Wenling, the chief political leader in the Tunku Sinquo area, whose family was proved to be in connection with the A.B. Corps, had been among the most determined followers of Li Li Sanism which Chu Te and Mao Tse Tung were fighting. Just when and where the connection between Li Li Sanism and the A.B. Corps took place, or just how and when these leaders passed over from Li Li Sanism into the A.B. Corps, Chu and his comrades learned only much later. Despite all the complications and confusion, General Chu was convinced that landlordism in Tunku, which the communists had not yet cleared out, was the real cause of the mutiny of the 20th Red Army. Of course, Lu and Li did not dare to expose their real motives to their peasant troops. They therefore accused Chu Te of being just another Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Tse Tung of party emperor who had betrayed the communist party. Their oratory produced the desired mutiny, and they killed many communist leaders in the Fukien region. They fled subsequently into Kuomintang territory west of Qian, where they established their own small communist party and began turning out one confusing manifesto after another. In one such document Chu Tei was suddenly praised as a noble soul while Mao was branded as a traitor, while in another Mao was praised and Chu denounced. Despite all their camouflage, General Chu declared, the Red Army judged by facts, and these facts were clear, the Kuomintang armies took no action whatever against the mutineers. In the end the Tunku peasants began to realize it too, escaped and made their way back to the parent body, where they were accepted, reorganized, and re-educated. Yet the mutiny had enabled the Kuomintang 19th. Root Army to Occupy Senkuo, and General Chang Weichang's 28th Division to Occupy Tunku. The partisans and the people on Tunku had fought the enemy, but their villages had been destroyed and hundreds of people were killed. Finally, they fled eastward to the main body of the Red Army. Such was the situation when Chu and Mao and their staff decided to fight a decisive battle and break the back of the 18th Headquarters Division of General Chang Weichang. General Chu drew a rough sketch of the battlefield where this struggle took place. He marked enemy headquarters and positions and the location of his own headquarters, combat units, reserves, field hospitals, and reception stations for enemy captives. He also indicated the positions of the people's forces which, as Red Army auxiliaries, were to attack small enemy units and transport columns as well as to transport Red Army supplies and clear the battlefield of the wounded. The headquarters of Chu and Mao was in a small mountain village just four miles from Lungkong where General Chang Weichang's headquarters was located. General Chang's 28th Division was on Tunku Mountain directly above them to the east, while his 50th Division was at Niento to the northwest. Peng Taihui's 3rd Red Army Corps was deployed for holding operations between Lungkong and the 28th and 50th Enemy Divisions. One day's swift march to the south and southwest were the troops of the Kuomintang 19th Root Army. Red Army communications were good, General Chu said, and his headquarters messengers, all young peasants, were very swift. At 8 p.m. on December 29th, he and Mao issued meticulous orders for the coming battle, which was to begin at dawn next morning. These orders to all their main combat and reserve units included instructions to hold the customary political mobilization meetings during which the military commanders were to inform the troops of the plan of battle, and everything that was known about enemy strength, positions, equipment, and morale. The political leaders were to explain the significance of the battle to the campaign and the revolutionary movement as a whole. One point in General Chu's orders instructed all Red Army units to maintain close contact and exchange intelligence, and to pay special attention to the collection of medical supplies and to preserve any captured radio sets. 
The battle began at dawn on December 30th when the troops of Lin Piao and Huang Kung Lei drew the 18th Division out of Lungkong by attacking and retreating until the enemy could be split into segments and destroyed. Huang Kung Lei's troops were peasants and miners from northwestern Kiangxi where General Chang Wei Chang's three divisions had previously destroyed hundreds of villages and exterminated entire families that had sons in the Red Army. Huang's troops therefore fought with bitter hatred in their hearts. These troops, General Chu said, fought right before our headquarters and enemy machine gun. Bullets splattered against our walls. At the height of the battle, General Chang Wei Chang ordered his 50th Division to reinforce his 18th, but we captured his wireless station immediately afterwards. The 50th Division started marching. Somehow it received no further communications, and when it met Peng Taihui's troops outside Nianto, it withdrew and waited. The 28th Division on Tonka made no move at all, nor did the 19th Root Army to the south. By noon a thousand men of the 18th Division had been killed and the other 9,000 captured and disarmed. General Chang and his staff, with all his officers, were among the captives. War trophies included 8,000 rifles, light and heavy machine guns, trench mortars and other small field pieces, the precious radio set of the 18th Division, with its operators, as well as field telephones, medical supplies, horses and large quantities of provisions. Money for the entire three enemy divisions was also captured. We immediately held a mass meeting of the captive soldiers, General Chu said, where we told them why we were fighting and invited those who wished to do so to join us. Three thousand joined us and we gave three dollars to each of the others and told them to go home. The enemy had had superior firepower and supplies yet our troops were superior in conviction, morale, and swift maneuvering. This explained this quick and decisive victory, as well as the collapse of the entire enemy campaign that rapidly followed, General Chu explained. Surprise played no role because fighting had been going on for over two months and the 18th Division had expected some kind of attack. Furthermore, General Chu said, the whites, as he, in common with the Red Army and the people, called Kuomintang forces, were in Soviet territory where the entire population regarded them as mortal enemies. Still another reason for the victory was psychological. The enemy believed their own propaganda that we are bandits, and bandits can be easily crushed. The conversation which General Chu Te had with General Chang Wei Chang immediately after the latter's capture was the kind that dramas are made of. The captive general, clad in a smart khaki uniform decorated with his insignia of rank, with polished black knee boots, was hustled into Chu's headquarters. There he saw a few men as lean and poorly clad as coolies. It was clear, General Chu remarked in a voice that had grown cold and hard, that he believed we were ignorant bandits who would soon be defeated by his other two divisions when he would be released. Though his defeat and capture had stunned him, he was still arrogant and tried to outweep me. He was a big fat fellow whose headquarters was stocked with all kinds of delicacies, and though he had a riding horse he had chosen to travel in a sedan chair on the backs of carriers. General Chang's first haughty question was how much will you demand to release me? Chu replied with dignity, I am not a merchant. You will be tried before your own troops, and before the troops of one of our armies whose families you have exterminated in northwestern Kiangxi. Some of the captive general's insolence seemed to crack. I asked him, General Chu told, if he would be willing to teach in the new Red Army Academy which we were planning to establish. He said he would but I knew he was only playing for time, he expected his other divisions to rescue him. I asked him which white armies he would advise us to attack next. I needed no advice from him because our troops were already moving against his 50th division, but I wanted to see what kind of man he was. He advised us to attack the 19th Root Army, and he even gave us military information about that army which conformed with our own intelligence reports. He was betraying his own side, and he thought he was outwitting us. Just to show General Chang how we could destroy his other divisions, General Chu took him and his captive officers along when the Red Army smashed the 50th Division within the next 24 hours. The Reds then wheeled against the 28th Division on Tunku. It fled. By then the 19th Root Army had begun retreating from Sinquo and did not stop until it reached its native Kwangtung province in the far south. 
Within less than three weeks after the victory over the 18th Division, the enemy armies collapsed under the swift blows of the Red Army, and the first Red Extermination Campaign came to an inglorious end. With his staff, General Chang was then put on trial before 3,000 of his own troops, the civilian population of Tunku, and the troops of Huang Kunlei's army whose homes and families had been destroyed by him. By then, General Chu said, Chang Wei Chang's insolence had turned to fear. He was condemned to death and, with his staff, beheaded by troops whose families had been slaughtered by them. A number of weeks later a messenger from the Central Committee of the Communist Party reached General Chu's headquarters from Shanghai. He carried a letter asking for General Chang's release in return for which Chang Kai-shek offered to release many political prisoners and to pay a sum of $200,000. We were sorry we had executed him, General Chu remarked, not because of the money but because Chang Kai-shek killed many of our imprisoned comrades in reprisal. The victory of the Red Army really frightened the Kuomintang and its foreign supporters and financiers and unleashed a new wave of terror throughout Kuomintang, China. By the end of 1930, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek had appointed himself Minister of Education of his Nanking regime and issued a manifesto stating that his heart was pained by students who had fallen prey to communism and had called meetings distributed handbills, and even opposed their university presidents, which is tantamount to opposing the government. The Generalissimo declared that he was not afraid to shoot students and set about proving it. Five universities were closed down and scores of students secretly arrested in Shanghai, never to be heard of again. The Shanghai Press laconically reported that 60 students in Peking National University, another dozen or so in Tianjin, and scores in Canton, Changsha, and Hankou had been arrested. On February 7, 1931, 24 young writers, artists, and actors were arrested by the British police in Shanghai and delivered to the Kuomintang garrison commander who, that same night, shot them in a mass grave which they had been forced to dig. In February 1931, the monthly issue of the Kuomintang's anti-red suppression monthly at Nanchang published an interview with a high Kuomintang officer who said, If the government cannot find a better method of solving the red bandit problem than it is using today, it will be obliged to isolate all those regions and kill the last person with poison gas. Every man, woman, and child from 10 to 60 is either a spy for the Reds or is a member of the Red Army. Chapter 27 When General Chu next came to resume the story of his life, I proposed that he select a typical day out of the year 1931 and tell me what he did from morning to night. After some reflection he said it would be impossible because he could not remember everything he did in any particular day, but that he would try. This was the story he told, I had a lifelong habit of arising very early. I slept only after my work was finished, which was very late, nearly always after midnight. My life has been built around disciplined work and study, yet my work and studies were never regular because in such warfare as ours there was much work that had to be supervised directly by headquarters. Generally, but not regularly, I lectured to the troops on military subjects and I frequently inspected nearby troops to see their organization and work. I attended regular staff conferences and there were also party meetings once or twice a week as well as headquarters cell meetings. There were frequent conferences with heads of various army departments and still others to deal with special problems that arose. Before each battle there were one or two mobilization meetings of the combat units, where military commanders reported on our plans and enemy conditions and our political leaders explained the significance of the battle or campaign and the political tactics to demoralize or win over the enemy during fighting. Following each battle, if there was time, but always after each campaign, we held two conferences, the first of commanders and the second of commanders and men together where the battle or campaign was analyzed. I tried to attend such conferences, which were of the greatest technical and educational value for our army. Each fighter and each commander had complete freedom of speech in these joint conferences. They could criticize one another or any aspect of the general plan or the way it had been carried out. In this way we were able to correct mistakes, weed out weak commanders, and promote men on merit. Through them we aimed to eliminate all feudal practices, keep our army democratic, and develop voluntary discipline among the fighters. 
Any man who had shown cowardice or bad judgment, or who had violated orders in the midst of battle, had to explain his conduct and learn to correct his mistakes. Any commander who cursed or struck a fighter or otherwise violated army rules had to answer before this court of public opinion, if guilty he was dealt with by headquarters. The results of such conferences were published in pamphlets and used as study material throughout the army. There was much of the work, he continued, and he told of the spring plowing and sowing, and the harvests, when every army man not occupied with military duties helped the peasants. Whenever possible, General Chu did his share of field work and found it an excellent way to maintain my health. Red Army recreational and cultural activities were relatively weak in those days, but a few dramatic troops toured the Soviet districts to play to the troops and the people, and if they played anywhere within reach of headquarters, General Chu was sitting on the ground or on one of the benches in the front rows. The army had some songs, he said, but singing was not as highly developed as in Yunnan at the time he talked. There were also daily intelligence and other reports which had to be read and dealt with, he proffered next. I read every newspaper or book I could find, but it was not easy to get books and magazines in those days. An occasional package of books came in from Shanghai, but they were in such demand that others often seized them before I had a chance at them. At that time I was trying to improve my knowledge of Marxism-Leninism and I read and reread any book on such subjects that reached us. During the first enemy extermination campaign we captured many books and pamphlets on military strategy and tactics which I read and which were useful to our army. During the occupation of both Changsha and Qian, the army had confiscated Kuomintang printing presses and removed them to the country. It now published a military fortnightly which contained reports about other red armies, partisan areas, and general conditions of the whole country. At that time there was a movement among teachers and professors in Shanghai, Peking, and other Kuomintang cities to prepare textbooks for the red army and the primary schools in the Soviet areas. These manuscripts were smuggled through the enemy lines and either printed or lithographed, and General Chu found time to go through those intended for the troops. After the defeat of the first enemy campaign, General Chu continued, our troops were scattered over a large area. Peng Taehui commanded on the northern front where we had occupied two new districts. Peng cleaned out the walled city of Nanfong, which had been held by General Su Kosiang, the peasant butcherer who had been hanging on until Chiang Kai-shek could prepare the second Kuomintang extermination campaign against us. Because of these preparations, we enlarged our army, established supply depots at various strategic points, and trained our troops. Enemy airplanes were now bombing us periodically, while the A.B. Corps intensified its activities everywhere. A.B. activities sometimes kept us in conference the whole night through. Because of the bombings, as well as our food supply, our headquarters moved four or five times within four months. Food was a serious problem because it was spring sowing time, our territory was small and our resources limited, and we had to conserve rice to meet the coming enemy campaign. Our troops confiscated rice from landlords, but there was a limit to this, and we not only helped the peasants plow and sow, but our troops reclaimed wasteland, which was poor in any case. Our army had a system of soldier committees in each division which managed supplies, maintained discipline, and directed educational and entertainment activities. Throughout the spring of 1931, these committees led the campaign to conserve food. They reduced our rations so that we ate meagerly twice a day, at ten and four. The food was poor and we were hungry all the time. Only the sick and wounded had enough. We also developed an air raid warning system throughout Soviet territory, and our engineering corps, made up of miners, constructed good air raid shelters for the troops and the people. These miners were highly skilled workers who could do many things, including the manufacture and use of explosives. Many of them were deaf from explosions in the mines where they had previously worked. Even before joining our army their political level was very high because most were old party members who had been labor organizers and leaders from the earliest days of the labor movement. I often took part in conferences called by them to initiate new defense methods. My days were crowded with still other work. Since we were the armed forces of the people, our army until then had been tied up with all mass activities. 
We helped rearrange the old Soviet districts and consolidate the people's sovereignty in new ones. We confiscated the food and land from the landlords, helped divide the land, established mass organizations in the Soviets, and led the plowing and sowing campaigns to increase production. In early March 1931, we received resolutions passed by the Fourth Delegates Congress of our party which had met secretly in Shanghai. We had sent delegates to this Congress, which finally repudiated the Lili San line and affirmed ours. The resolutions which we now received instructed us to introduce the systematic education of our troops and to make a clear division of labor between our army, the Soviets, and the mass organizations. The Congress also called on us to arrange for an all-China Soviet Congress to meet in South Kiangxi on August 1, 1931, the fourth anniversary of the Nanchang Uprising. We began work on the resolutions by calling a conference of party delegates from all the Soviet districts and we moved our headquarters once more, this time to a small mountain village, Shantang, which had a big family temple large enough to house our headquarters and the conference delegates. The conference lasted for nearly a month. Among other things, we arranged for committees to prepare for the All-China Soviet Congress on August 1st. However, the new enemy campaign began soon and the Congress had to be postponed, first to November 7th and then to December 11th. December 11th was the anniversary of the Canton Commune. After the Shantang Conference, which I attended as one of the Presidium and sometimes the Chairman, our work became much better. The Soviets and mass organizations henceforth became independent of our army. Personal relationships in the Soviets, which had played a considerable role in some places, were eliminated, and these councils or Soviets became efficient. Administrative organs dealing with such problems as finance, land, communications, the local armed forces, health, education, production, and the problems of women and children. The Soviets were organized in pyramidal form from the village up to the region, then to the province. After December 11th, 1931, the highest organ was the Central Soviet Government at Jukin, of which Mao Tse Tung was chairman. We also established regular lecture hours on military and political subjects for our troops and intensified the campaign against the literacy. Many intellectuals arrived from the outside to help us, but they were still too few and our medical corps was still weak. Shanghai printers and other industrial workers from different cities began coming through the enemy lines to join us. I also kept my eye on the new radio school which we had established after capturing the wireless set from the 18th Division. Its chief, Wang Chen, joined us and at once organized the radio school. Wang is still director of our radio school here in Yan'an and is called the father of radio. After joining us, Wang began intercepting enemy messages from which we learned that General Kung Pingfong's 28th Division had a new wireless outfit. Our radio students began clamoring for it and I told them they should have it. From intercepted enemy messages, we also learned of enemy supply dumps which were being established behind the fortified defense positions which were being constructed in preparation for the second extermination campaign. We learned all about these fortifications because the Kuomintang conscripted peasants to build them. By April our food and ammunition problems were very serious, and to avoid using up our supplies for the second campaign we began borrowing rice from the peasants, promising to return it by a set date. When peasants asked me how we could set a date, I asked them if we had ever failed to keep a promise to them. They said we had not and we all laughed, and General Chu added proudly for the peasants knew what that meant. By the time General Chu finished talking it was past midnight. His fine white teeth gleamed in the candlelight as he yawned and remarked quizzically, such was a typical day of my life in the spring of 1931. Chapter 28 I in early May, 150,000 Kuomintang troops under the supreme command of General Ho Inchin, Minister of War in the Nanking regime, took up positions behind their defense works which by then ran zigzag across Kiangxi from Qian on the west to Qianning in Fukien province on the east, a distance of some 700 li, or about 250 miles. The second extermination campaign began. General Chu remarked dryly that the Red Army knew everything about these enemy defenses because the peasants forced to build them had told their location and even explained just how deep the trenches were, just how many loopholes each fort had how many bricks or stones had been used in them, and had drawn rough sketches in the dust to show each path leading up to them. 
we planned to use the same tactics as in the first campaign. That meant to draw the enemy out from behind their defenses, entice them into Soviet territory where they would be at the mercy of our troops and the people, and in big sweeping flank movements attack their rear and destroy them. We first decided to destroy the 28th and two other divisions between Tunku and Kian. We needed the food and munition dumps behind the enemy defense lines, and our radio school kept clamoring for that 28th division's new wireless set. After issuing battle orders to Red Army regulars and partisan auxiliaries on the night of May 16, 1931, Chute and Mount Setung moved their headquarters to the Tunku Mountain stronghold where the medical corps had established two rear base hospitals. The masses were so confident of victory that thousands of them gathered at various points with stretchers of every description to transport Red Army wounded and with baskets and carrying poles to carry away captured enemy supplies. Instead of shunning all mention of ancient feudal concepts which still lingered on in the minds of the peasants, General Chu spoke frankly of them. The peasants, he said, refused to obey his orders to transport the enemy wounded to Red Army hospitals and to treat them the same as they treated their own wounded. Mass meetings were called to explain the order, but Chu found that it was useless to talk about modern rules of warfare. The peasants could not understand why they should act humanely to enemy soldiers, even when wounded. After all, they had been sent to wipe them off the face of the earth. The only argument that impressed them was that such men could be won over to the revolutionary cause, yet even then they remained reluctant and some of them resentful. Three nights before the enemy offensive was scheduled to begin, and Chu Tei knew the exact date, the main Red Army forces made forced marches into the enemy rear in the Kian area. Because of enemy bombers, they marched only at night and fought on moonlit nights. On dark nights they attacked in the earliest dawn. Fighting was supposed to begin on the night of the 17th, but no sound of gunfire reached Chu and Mao. Two more days passed and still they had. Received no report and heard no sound of fighting. Huang Kung Lei's 3rd Red Army had been ordered to hold the front between Tunku and Qian while Peng Taihui and Lin Piao's troops in particular were to attack the enemy rear, yet no news came even from Huang and no sound echoed in the valleys beyond. The silence was so ominous that Chu Tei took his chief of staff and two companies of guards and started down the mountain to the west to investigate. He had nearly reached the foot of the mountain and was in a narrow valley abutted by two mountains when he suddenly came face to face with the advance guards of the 28th Division which was marching directly up the mountain. We could only scatter along the forested mountainsides and fight and retreat, General Chu said, but I could see by the cautious movements of the enemy that they did not know how strong we were. Three hours later, when we were approaching the Tunku Plateau and when Mao had readied our headquarters, hospitals, and the people to retreat, I saw that the enemy had begun to draw back. The distant sound of gunfire reached me. Our 3rd Red Army was attacking the rear of the 28th Division. By nightfall, most of that division had been disarmed. General Kung Pingfang was among the captives, but he had learned something from the first campaign. He wore an ordinary soldier's uniform without any insignia of rank and mingled with the soldiers. When we gave each captive soldier three dollars and told them to go home, General Kung lined up and took his three dollars, the only time in his life that he had accepted so little money. He outwitted us, but we got his guns and supplies, and our radio students crooned over his new wireless set with its generator, both intact. A messenger arrived with a report from Peng Taihui that same night. This was a second messenger. Peng's first messenger had been captured and killed. For two days and nights Peng's 3rd Red Army Corps had fiercely assaulted both the front and rear of the enemy 43rd Division, a division of northern troops, capturing their mountain fortifications and chasing them into the valleys where half were disarmed and the rest fled to their brother 47th Division at Chuenan. The whole Western Front was now in the hands of the Red Army, yet Chu Tei's voice became disconsolate at the memory of the two battles because they netted only 7,000 rifles, machine guns, mortars and other weapons together with medical supplies and great quantities of food, ammunition and considerable money. This poor haul, he said, was because the 28th and 43rd Divisions were only half the size of the 18th Division which had been destroyed in the first campaign. 
deploying partisans and a few companies of regulars to hold the liberated area, Chu and Mao took their headquarters with the radio school and joined their main forces which began rolling in one of the most dramatic offensives in the history of their army. Thousands of peasants, including women and children with baskets and carrying poles, eddied around the army as it drove against the walled town of Xuanan where remnants of the 43rd Division had joined the 47th. After one regiment of these northerners was disarmed, the others fled eastward, leaving the great supply dumps behind them. The red troops laughed as they spoke of our white supply troops. Chu Te made a quick inspection of the supply dumps which the peasant thousands were already cleaning out, and the peasants laughed as he said to them, Didn't I tell you that we'd return all borrowed rice on a set date? Something like all was in General Chu's voice as he remembered the swift thoroughness with which the peasants worked. Swarming like ants, they filled their baskets and lumbering carts drawn by water buffalo, while the thrifty women and children swept up the last grains of rice with their hands. The older men, women, and children moved in disciplined columns back into Soviet territory, while younger men, organized into battalions, moved eastward with the Red Army with rice and ammunition for the troops and, like the troops, seemed completely oblivious of the pouring spring rains. As he talked of that campaign, General Chu appeared to be living through it once more. Our offensive rolled forward, and for the next fifteen days our troops fought and slept alternately. Combat units fell to the earth and slept while others arose from sleep and took up where they had left off, attacking in great sweeping movements into the enemy rear. Two days after Xuanan, at Pesha, we disarmed the 47th and remnants of the 43rd Division. These big northerners shook their heads and complained that they were not used to fighting in the mountains or in the rain. They were hustled back to our enemy reception stations by peasant partisans, and our own and the enemy wounded were transported back to our hospitals. I have never needed much sleep, but I hardly remember sleeping at all in the next two weeks. We were determined to teach the enemy the lesson they would never forget. Our troops swept forward like a flood, shouting slogans as they fought, singing, and fighting with wild fury for each inch of ground, and the enemy went down before them. The rains poured, enemy bombers could not operate, and we chased the enemy troops into flooded rice fields where we dragged them out, covered with mud. They wore full regulation Kuomintang uniforms, with leggings and shoes or sandals, while our troops wore thin shorts and jackets and were barefoot. I think I wore sandals, but I don't remember. Yes, Mao and I wore the same clothing as the fighters. I remember the heavy packs of enemy troops, which were filled with loot from our villages. Deep in Soviet territory where the enemy had driven a wedge, we found villages burned to ashes and the corpses of civilians lying where they had been shot, cut down, or beheaded. Even children and the aged. Women lay sprawled on the ground where they had been raped before or after they had been killed. After that only the seriously wounded could be induced to leave the battlefield, and a fierce song crashed over our lines day and night, fear not the rain of bullets or the forest of enemy rifles. Advance. Kill. Take the crippled Ho Inching alive. Along every road and path I saw peasants transporting our wounded and enemy wounded to the rear. Some had stretchers made of doors of houses, or boards, slung on ropes, and many carried the wounded on their backs. Despite our orders to care for the enemy wounded as our own, the peasants had their own method of obeying the order and expressing their hatred of the whites. When tired, they would lower the white wounded man to the ground and curse or kick him or even tear a branch from a tree and beat him, all the time cursing him, white bandit. Raper and murderer. Paid dog of the landlords. They would then pick up the wounded man and carry him until weary, and then would lower him and ask him, Why should I carry a dog like you on my back, and beat him? Though some people tried to stop them, I had no time, for we were rolling forward and fighting without rest. In the Ninkan area, to the north, we met more divisions of northern troops of the 26th Root Army which Chiang Kai-shek had transferred to Kiangxi. Chiang did not trust this army, which had once belonged to Marshal Fong Yuxiang. We had a number of party comrades in this army and discontent among its troops was widespread. When we first contacted them, three regiments surrendered to us without firing a shot, and the others retreated. We left them in peace to think things over, while we rolled forward. 
The final battle in this great campaign took place on May 29th in the Qianning district in Fukien province, the end of the enemy defense works. Here the Red Army met the 6th Root Kuomintang Army under Lu Hoting who for years had been one of the most notorious bandits of Fukien province. Lu had been made a Kuomintang general and his 10,000 bandit followers organized into the 6th Root Army. On the moment we attacked his troops, General Chu said with bitter hatred, Lu fled from his headquarters inside Qianning City, and his troops followed him. We chased him right through the city and onto the bridge over the Min River. Some of our troops had already crossed and were waiting on the banks beyond. That bridge soon became so packed with bandit troops, horses, and luggage that no one could move. Our machine gunners on the west bank poured a hail of fire into their ranks and they began throwing away their guns and hurling themselves into the river where our troops picked them off, while our troops on the bank beyond seized and disarmed everyone who succeeded in crossing. With the capture of Chienning the Red Army, after leaving combat units behind, wheeled and went back along the enemy fortified lines, smashing them along the entire length. They seized whole new districts on either side which political workers began consolidating into Soviet districts. When the enemy fortifications were thoroughly destroyed, the Red Army again wheeled southward into the Soviet territory against the 19th Root Army from Kwangtung province in the far south. This army was also expert in retreating and did not stop until it had reached its home province. This retreat, General Chu said, was due to a new conflict between the generals of Kwangtung and Kwangtze provinces on the one hand, and Chiang Kai-shek on the other. Now that the Red Army had brought two extermination campaigns to ridicule, foreigners and the Chinese ruling class had become violently critical of Chiang Kai-shek, and the southern generals were trying to convince the representatives of the foreign powers in China that they could succeed where Chiang had failed, and thus be worthy of foreign recognition and support. General Chu Te summarized the second extermination campaign in these words, this campaign lasted 20 days and 20 nights. During that time our army marched over 300 miles, fighting day and night, pillowing their heads on their rifles on the earth while the rains poured. In that time we defeated 13 white divisions, killed at least 10,000 enemy troops, and disarmed over 20,000. Our trophies were too great to remember, they included some 20,000 rifles, with other weapons, money, blankets, medicine, clothing, wireless sets with generators, field glasses, mine throwers, automatic pistols, hand grenades, and great stores of rice, flour, and ammunition. Among the captives were many army doctors whom we ordered to work in our hospitals and some of whom later joined our party and remain with us still. A few, however, got entangled in the network of the A, B, Corps and murdered some of our wounded commanders. We shot them. This campaign, General Chu said, brought sorrow to thousands of peasant homes. Apart from the peasants slaughtered, the Red Army alone had 4,000 casualties while the Red Guards and other partisan units lost heavily. Yet neither death nor suffering could crush the revolutionary ardor of the people and there were moving scenes in the great memorial meetings that followed the victory. Because of the espionage of the counter-revolutionary A.B. Corps, the Red Army no longer accepted white captive soldiers en masse, but carefully screened each man before admitting him as a volunteer. We spoke frankly to such volunteers, General Chu said, and never offered anything but bitterness and long struggle before victory would be ours but we were certain of final victory. We could now attract only men willing to give up their families and perhaps their lives, or men whose families were already bankrupt or destroyed so that they had no hope except in the revolution. Such men we took into our army. We kept the others for two or three weeks of education in the history of the Chinese revolution and the principles and policies of our party and army. After that we gave them traveling expenses and allowed them to go where they wished. The second enemy extermination campaign proved to us that Kuomintang officers tried and partially succeeded in brutalizing their soldiers by ordering them to rape, burn, plunder, and murder so that they would not dare surrender to us. In this way they tried to make their troops immune to our propaganda and make them fight hard to prevent capture. Despite these brutalizing tactics, which incidentally the Imperial Japanese Army also used in China during the Second World War for the same reasons, 
There was nearly always someone in almost every Kuomintang regiment or division who managed to send reports to the Red Army by peasant messengers or who left messages behind. These messages and reports, whose authors he never knew, moved General Chu to deep emotion. Some reports, he said, were awkwardly written in unlettered script, but others were clearly the work of educated men because they were systematically composed and well-written and gave the plans, location, and number of arms of the white troops with whom they served. By comparing them with our own intelligence reports, we found them to be exact, General Chu declared. After occupying a place, we often found some chalk message on tables or doors telling us just where the enemy unit was going. General Chu also said that the Red Army espionage network was now well organized and stretched throughout Soviet territory and into Kuomintang regions. The Army had special schools to train intelligence workers, many of whom were women and boys, while still others were peddlers and itinerant handicraft workers whose work took them far and wide in Kuomintang territory working for or selling goods in the homes of the rich and poor alike, or into military camps of the enemy. One section of the intelligence service made a study of enemy codes, documents, publications, and of talks with captives. Another section gathered information in newly occupied regions. Still another was historical. It made complete studies of each enemy army, with its commanders and soldiers, just what province the army came from, what changes had been made in it, its past history and organization, its fighting ability, and so on. From such studies, General Chu explained, we finally decided the best methods of working with each particular enemy army. From the historical files of the Red Army which he had collected and preserved for many years, General Chu placed reports from his field commanders of that period at my disposal. Many were more exciting than anything a fiction writer could conjure up from his imagination. General Peng Taihui's reports, for example, were marvels of concentrated military and social fact in which not one superfluous word appeared. There was one from him dated May 17, 1931, just as the second extermination campaign began. It was written in microscopic handwriting on both sides of a yellow postcard. Following A description of the battle that began that night, Peng wrote, enemy left much rice and flour here. Masses hate white bandits and helped us greatly in fighting. Wounded soldiers transferred to Yang Miling Soviet area. Enemy soldiers are northerners, have not been influenced by us. Feudal relations between them very strong. Did not surrender until wounded. We marched too far, 80 li, 27 miles, before fighting. Our troops very tired. Reporting on one of his divisions which captured the enemy mountain defense works, Pang wrote, Our side, dead and wounded, commanders and fighters, about one-third of this division. In some units about one-half of our cadres dead and wounded. The reports always began, Commander-in-Chief Chu, Political Commissar Mao, and ended simply, Peng Taihui. All reports from Peng and other commanders gave concise details about their own and enemy troops, losses on both sides, captives, trophies, transfer of the wounded, problems and worries, and many ended, please instruct us about our work. One report from Huang Kunglei, commander of the 3rd Red Army, was written across a military cap captured in battle. A number of reports from a divisional commander and his political commissar, who sounded very young, always ended, hail to complete victory in this second period of the war. General Chu also gave me a copy of a peasant ballad in nine stanzas which was born of the second campaign. The first stanza ran, Warlord Chang Kaishik sits trembling in Nanking. Mobilized a great army to suppress the revolution, Aiyo. Aiyo. Sent paid hounds to suppress the revolution. Aiyo. Aiyo. We held memorial meetings, we sang, we worked and we planned after the second extermination campaign, General Chu concluded. We were victorious, but we had had heavy losses and our troops were very tired. Bombers in the air above, wire entanglements on the earth below. Powerful white armies for open attack, concealed agents for secret destruction. Then came the agent Huang Meichuan to bribe his nephew Kung Lei and split the Great Red Army. Imperialist hunting dog Chang Kaishik reached Nanchang in summer's heat. In parallel columns his armies marched over long distances to South Kiangsi. 
Left-wing commander Qin Mingxu unleashed his hordes on Kuangchang. Right-wing commander Chu Xialiang raped and killed at Nanfeng. Central route commander Sun Lingcheng fed his horses on the crops at Qian. The Iron Red Army with discipline firm enlarged its ranks. Summoned partisans and armed the masses to win the war. In Lichuan, Qianning, and Taining it fulfilled two missions, seized and divided the land, and provisioned itself for battle. Peasants rid themselves of twin evils, landlords, and the feudal gentry. Five new districts were Sovietized and combined with Fukien Kiansi. With horses fattened and fighters fed, we met the advancing enemy. Our men fell like autumn leaves, crying, White brothers, come over to us. Poor men should not. Fight poor men. The whites fled, their arms shattered, burning villages and forests and slaying the people. On the ashes of our burnt homes we rebuilt the Soviets and tightened the people's sovereignty. The Red Army is tempered in a thousand battles. Red Army Ballad, Victory in the Third Campaign Book 9 The Long March Chapter 29 Song of the Long March In the wild autumn wind of October the Central Red Army began the Long March, and under the starry heavens passed through U2 and fought victoriously at Kupu and Sinchen. In November, occupying Ichang, Lingwu, Lanshan, and Taochao, the second enemy blockade line was broken and the dog Ho Chien's liver turned cold. In December, we crossed the Xiang River. The Quanxi warlords trembled. Three blockade lines were broken irresistibly like the splitting of bamboo. In December, in the fragrance of plum blossoms, we entered Kwai Chao and crossed the Wu River and in quick succession occupied Tian Xin. The Red Army's name spread to the four seas. In February, at Tunsa and Zunyi, the army reformed and reorganized. We developed guerrilla armies in South Sichuan and new volunteers joined us. In March, we fought back to Kwaichao again and reoccupied Zunyi, crushing eight regiments of Warlord Wang, wiping out two divisions of Si and Cho. In April, we turned southward, fought from Kwaiang to Kunming, crossed the Golden Sands River in triumph, and marched through western Sichuan. In May at Luding Kayo, we sent Lu Wen Wei reeling backward and crossed the Tatu River at leisure. The names of the seventeen heroes were written on our banners. In June's hot weather, the snow still mantled Kaya Chinchen. Two armies, the first and fourth, united at Fankung. In July, we entered northwestern Sichuan, where the Black Water River flows and green wheat ripples in the wind at Liwa. In August, we advanced, fearless of hunger and cold, through the dread grasslands which few men have ever crossed. The Red Army conquered all, struggled in bitterness to fight the Japanese and save China. In September, we left Panchechen, marched to the northeast and crossed the Latsikyu and Weiho. Fighting infantry and cavalry, we reached North Shenzi. The Red Armies of the North and South united, shattering the enemy's new extermination campaign and uniting the people to save China. Neither facts nor figures, nor the names of a hundred rivers and mountains, can ever explain the historical significance of the long march of the Red Army. Nor can they describe the tenacity and determination nor the suffering of the hundred thousand men who took part in it. From Qianxi and Fukien, from which the march began, and across the Great Plains, the wild rivers, and mountains of eternal snow to northwest China, was an estimated distance of 25,000 li, or about 8,000 miles. Chu Te marched farther. While Mao Zedong led the main column of the army directly onto the northwest, General Chu remained with troops for an additional year in the Chinese-Tibetan borderland of Sikong, reaching the northwest only two years after leaving Qianxi. In early September 1934, after long preparation, General Chu began, we called many chief political and military cadres to Jukin and informed them of our plans for evacuation. Xiang Ying, vice chairman of the Soviet government and a member of the Central Committee, came from the Eastern Front. We informed him that he was to remain in the Central Soviet District as the party leader and political commissar of all the armed forces and political cadres left behind to continue the struggle. Chen Yi, who had been commanding troops on the Sinkwo Front, was to remain as supreme military commander. Ni Yunchen, Chen's political commissar, who was sick with malaria, was to go with us. 
The armed forces left behind were 5,000 men of the 24th Division commanded by Chao Chi and Ping, 3,600 men of the Fukien Red Army, 2,400 men of the Kianxi Provincial Red Army, 2,400 men of the Kiangnan Red Army, and 15,000 of the anti-Japanese vanguards in northeastern Kianxi. We left many of our ablest military, political, and mass leaders behind. One was the chairman of the All-China Federation of Labor, who was captured and beheaded by the Kuomintang seven months later. Ho Shukong, Commissar of Justice, and Chu Chiu Pai, former secretary of the party and now Commissar of Education, were also left behind because Ho was in his middle sixties, while Chu was slowly dying of tuberculosis. Chu Chiu Pai had been one of the leaders of the Cultural Renaissance and a member of the Central Committee of the Kuomintang under Sun Yat-sen's leadership. Ho and Chu were to be smuggled to Shanghai. Eight months later they were captured by the Kuomintang and beheaded at Lunyin, together with a number of women leaders. We also left behind about 20,000 of our wounded, scattered in mountain hospitals. After recovering, these men left the hospital and reported for duty. Maimed men were given money, sent to their homes, and allotted a pension of $50 a year. These pensions were paid out so long as our comrades in Kianxi had money. The enemy used 20 full divisions to occupy the main Soviet cities and towns. They never succeeded in completely conquering the countryside where the people had arms, but they did succeed in slaughtering hundreds of thousands of people. Large numbers of women and girls were captured and sold at $5 a head to Kuomintang soldiers, officers, landlords, and brothel keepers. All the landlords and loafers who had fled in previous years returned with the white armies and became officials, but they never dared go into the villages where the peasants shot on sight. The white occupation of Soviet districts was very slow and bloody, but the armed forces which we left behind were never exterminated. 100,000 men and 35 women were selected to go on the long march. 80% of these were seasoned, disciplined veterans, the others were party and government cadres, and people who had played a leading role in the revolutionary movement. The chief engineer of the Central Red Army Arsenal told me the way the evacuation was organized. In late September, he said, he received orders to destroy certain heavy arsenal equipment and guns. This done, the Arsenal was divided into six units, one to be taken on the long march, the rest to be distributed to five different regions in Kianxi and Fukien. One hundred arsenal workers were to make the long march, the others were sent with the arsenal machinery to the various Soviet regions. The arsenal workers and staff, together with five hundred red guards, all organized into companies, carried the arsenal machinery and supplies throughout the long march. On October 13th, this engineer continued, the Manchurian engineer who was director of the Central Arsenal stood with me on a big meadow and watched our 600 men march past. Each man carried five pounds of ration rice and each had a shoulder pull from which hung either two small boxes of ammunition or hand grenades or big kerosene cans filled with our most essential machinery and tools. Each pack contained a blanket or quilt, one quilted winter uniform, and three pairs of strong cloth shoes with thick rope saws tipped and heeled with metal the people also gave us presents of dried vegetables, peppers, or such things. Each man had a drinking cup, a pair of chopsticks thrust into his puttees, and a needle and thread caught on the underside of the peak of his cap. All men wore big sun rain hats made of two thin layers of bamboo with oiled paper between, and many had paper umbrellas stuck in their packs. Each man carried a rifle. Everyone going on the long march was dressed and equipped the same. Everyone was armed. Though we were in Soviet territory and the people turned out to bid us farewell, we marched at night to get accustomed to night marching before entering enemy territory. On October 14th, we reached our concentration point, Quantian. The 1st Red Army Corps under Lin Piao, which had been fighting on the Sinkwo Front, and the 3rd Corps under Peng Tae Huai, which had come from the Eastern Front, had already left to clear the way for the rest of us. Lu Pacheng, Chief of Staff Directing Field Operations, had gone with them. Some of our rear organizations had already reached Quantian, and others poured in throughout that and the following day. I saw General Chu Tei and Cho En Lai ride in with General Headquarters, followed by Mao Tse Tung and the Central Committee. 
Mao was thin and emaciated. At sunset on the 15th we began moving out through the mountains to the southwest. The order of march was issued by General Chu Te. The first column consisted of a regiment of the Red Army University under the general command of Ye Chieneng, chief of staff to Chu Te's headquarters. Next came General Headquarters, the Revolutionary Military Council, and the party's Central Committee. Then came the Soviet government, party and young communist league members, and a part of the anti-imperialist league. There followed the supply department, our arsenal unit, printers with their printing presses and supplies, the government mint, the sanitary department with doctors and nurses, and 120 sets. Of stretcher bearers, for to each stretcher, the Red Army Uniform Factory, with many tailors carrying sewing machines, and long columns of men carrying supplies for each department. The 7th Red Army Corps protected our left flank, and the 9th Corps protected our right. The 5th Red Army Corps, whose commander was Tung Ching Tan, was our rear guard. I remembered Xiang Ying, one of the first labor leaders of China, who came to Quintian with Chu and Mao. Xiang Ying stood on a knoll and watched us leave, then returned to the 24th Division. A few weeks later he wired Chu Te that the division had just destroyed one enemy brigade at Waichang, south of Jukin, but the enemy was so powerful that the division was splitting up into battalions for widespread guerrilla warfare. On October 21st our 1st and 3rd Red Army Corps passed through the 1st enemy defense line in the Sinfeng region. The rest of us followed. On November 3rd, we passed through the second defense line, and ten days later broke the third along the Canton Hankow Railway. The enemy knew nothing about our movements until we had broken through the second defense line and were in their rear. Once in enemy territory, we often marched at night to avoid air raids. Night marching is wonderful if there is a moon and a gentle wind blowing. When no enemy troops were near, whole companies would sing and others would answer. If it was a black night and the enemy far away, we made torches from pine branches or frayed bamboo, and then it was truly beautiful. When at the foot of a mountain we could look up and see a long column of lights coiling like a fiery dragon up the mountainside. From the summit we could look in both directions and see miles of torches moving forward like a wave of fire. A rosy glow hung over the whole route of march. We marched through Kiangxi and along the mountain ranges of the Kwangtung, Hunan, and Quanxi borders. For weeks at a time we fought our way across the plains, capturing cities and supplying ourselves from landlord warehouses and enemy ammunition dumps. We marched in three parallel columns, the first corps on our right, the third on our left, we in the center, and the fifth corps in the rear. 90,000 enemy troops swarmed into South Hunan alone, and the warlord, Ho Qian, was so scared that he scorched the earth of eight districts to prevent us from linking up with Ho Long's second Red Army. While burning and destroying, Ho Qian told the country that we were devastating South Hunan. The Quanxi warlords also drove peasants from our route of march, then burned villages and told the people that we did it. We often saw villages burning far to the south where we had never been, and we sometimes captured Quanxi agents in the act of setting fire to villages. We shot them down. Our first and third corps often made forced marches to occupy towns and cities and protect villages. In such places we always confiscated the property of the landlords and militarist officials, kept enough food for ourselves, and distributed the rest to poor peasants and the urban poor. When we captured great warehouses of salt, every man in our ranks filled his pockets and ate it, like sugar. Our medical workers searched everywhere for quinine and other drugs, but never found sufficient. We also held great mass meetings. Our dramatic corps played and sang for the people, and our political workers wrote slogans and distributed copies of the Soviet Constitution and the fundamental laws of the Soviet government. If we stayed in a place for even one night, we taught the peasants to write at least six characters, destroy the Teheo, feudal gentry and landlords, and divide the land. When hard-pressed by superior enemy forces, we marched in the daytime, and at such times the bombers pounded us. We would scatter and lie down, get up and march, then scatter and lie down again, hour after hour. Our dead and wounded were many, and our medical workers had a very hard time. The peasants always helped us and offered to take our sick, our wounded and exhausted. 
Each man left behind was given some money, ammunition, and his rifle and told to organize and lead the peasants in partisan warfare as soon as he recovered. Sometimes one or two companies would become separated from our main forces during battle, but they merely retreated into the mountains and developed partisan areas. General Chu often made inspection trips of all units, encouraging everyone, but the morale of our forces was high in any case. General Chu was very thin and tough, although a tender-hearted man. He was old and his face deeply lined. He was never sick and never pessimistic. As a matter of fact, Chu Te was 48 in the year the Long March began. The Long March was not only a great epic in the history of revolutionary warfare, but the seedbed for great folk literature. In the two-volume history of the Long March, written in the form of stories, poems, sketches, and diary notes by hundreds of Red Army men of every rank, I found this story. Our most bitter trials came when we had to pass along narrow and dangerous mountain paths, through narrow passes, across narrow bridges, or swim icy streams. At such times our advance troops slowed down and the rear ones would take one step forward and stand for ten. We could not move forward and we could not sit down to rest. Some men fell asleep as they stood. At other times we marched through storms with a fierce wind and rain whipping our bodies. Under such circumstances we would not use our torches and the paths were slippery and dangerous. Sometimes we covered only a few li a night and, soaked through, had to bivouac in the open. There was Laos Han, Old Mountain, on the Quancy border where we went up a mountain so steep that I could see the saws of the man ahead of me. Steps had been carved out of the stone face of the mountain, they were as high as a man's waist. Political workers went up and down the columns encouraging our struggling men and helping the sick and wounded, news came down the line that our advance columns were facing a sheer cliff and that there was no way of getting the horses up. After a time came the order to sleep where we were and continue climbing at daybreak. The path was no more than two feet wide at any point and even if one succeeded in lying down he could not turn over without rolling down the mountainside. There were great jetting boulders everywhere and even the path was covered with sharp stones. Since there was nothing else to do, I folded my blanket, placed it beneath me, and tried to curl up on the path. I was so weary that I fell asleep. Sometime during the night the cold awoke me. I wrapped the blanket about me and tried to roll myself up in a little round ball, but I still could not sleep. I lay and watched the twinkling stars in the sky. They looked like jade stones on a black curtain. The black peaks towering around me were like menacing giants. We seemed to be at the bottom of a well. Up and down the path I saw many small fires lit by men also awakened by the cold. They were sitting around and talking in low voices. Apart from their faint voices the silence was so great that I could hear it. It was sometimes near, sometimes far away, sometimes loud and sometimes faint, and at other times like spring silkworms eating mulberry leaves. I listened intently, and it sounded like a complaining mountain spring, then like the distant murmur of the ocean. Next morning my group finally reached the sheer cliff that had stopped us the night before. It was Lycungii, Thunder God Rock, a solid cliff of stone jutting into the sky at about a 90 degree angle. Stone steps no more than a foot wide had been carved up its face, and up this we had to go without anything to hold on to. Horses with broken legs lay about the foot of the cliff. Our medical units suffered the most because the sick and wounded had to get off the stretchers and either crawl or be pushed, dragged, or carried up. The women comrades of the medical corps ceaselessly comforted and helped the men in their care without once showing any sign of weariness. Old Mountain was the most difficult mountain we had climbed so far, but after crossing the River of Golden Sands, the Tatu River, the Great Snow Mountains, and the Grasslands, it seemed very small indeed. In January 1935, after suffering heavy losses, the Red Army broke into Kwai Chow Province, smashed enemy fortifications, crossed the Wu River, and seized Zunyi, a city on the road from the capital, Kwaiang, to Chungking in the north. By that time, Chiang Kai-shek had drawn armies from all the Yangtze provinces, built roadblocks, and fortified all Yangtze crossings to prevent the Red Army from crossing into the north. Simultaneously, the Sichuan warlords began a reign of terror, trying to arrest and destroy every person suspected of even the mildest liberal leanings. 
in a Kuomintang. Newspaper at the time, General Chu found a news item about his second wife, Yuchen, and son. Kuomintang militarists had fallen upon his wife's home in Nanchi and destroyed everything. Chu Tei's son, a student of 19, the report laconically remarked, had escaped but was being hunted down. General Chu waited in the hope that his son would make his way to the Red Army. He never heard of his wife or son again. There was no doubt in his mind but that they were killed by the Kuomintang. Though outnumbered a hundred to one, the Red Army now turned on the enemy and began four months of distracting maneuvering warfare of which both Chu and Mao were masters. The opium-sodden troops of the provincial warlord were no problem and were soon shattered and immobilized, General Chu said, but Kui Chao was swarming with 200,000 of Chiang Kai-shek's best troops and Chiang himself arrived at the provincial capital, Kuiang, to take command. The Red Army completely destroyed five enemy divisions, recruited nearly 20,000 new volunteers, and its intrepid political workers penetrated every town and village in the province to hold mass meetings and organize the people. The army encircled Kuiang, but found itself too heavily outnumbered. Chiang Kai-shek, however, fled Kuiang. Among the records of this period, which General Chu preserved, I found many roughly penciled notes among his papers, many of which had apparently been jotted down while he was resting at small villages, or late at night before he slept one mentioned a mass meeting in Zunyi on January 15th at which he spoke in memory of Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, and during which enemy bombers plastered a nearby town. This same note mentions that trade unions had been organized, but members are afraid they will be killed if the whites return, as indeed 200 of them were. Other notes reveal General Chu's ceaseless preoccupation with the living problems of the people. One read, corn, with bits of cabbage, chief food of people. Peasants too poor to eat rice, sell it to pay rent and interest. Rice seized by militarists as war rice tax. Peasants call landlords rent gentry and themselves dry men, men suck dry of everything. Three kinds of salt, white for the rich, brown for middle classes, black salt residue for toiling masses. Even black salt so expensive peasants place small chunk in a bowl and rub cabbage on it when eating. It was apparently while resting in a village that Chu Tei jotted down these lines, poor hovels with black rotten thatch roofs everywhere. Small doors of cornstalks and bamboo have seen no quilt except in landlord houses and cities. One family of ten persons here. Two board beds, one for husband, wife, baby, one a shelf for grandmother. Others sleep on earth floor around fire, without covering. Another note read, people digging rotten rice from ground under landlord's old granary. Monks call this holy rice, gifts from heaven to the poor. Taoist and Buddhist. Temples everywhere, Christian churches in cities. Christian converts preach for slogans, boycott Japanese goods. Buy British and American goods. Fight the Reds. Believe in God. General Chu most certainly was in a hovel in a village when he jotted down these lines, young land laborer thinks himself too humble to join Red Army because Army is book learning army. Said he had worked for landlord for five years and was paid 3,000 coppers for the five years, ch $27.99, with food. Landlord fled when we approached, laborer took rice, flour, corn and came home. Buried it from warlords. Went back and brought mother one quilt, one pair trousers. While discussing the Kui Chao campaign, I showed General Chu a number of old clippings from the Chinese and foreign press which I had preserved because they reported, and confirmed, his death. These reports, which emanated from a Chinese, Thomas Chow, chief correspondent of Reuters news agency, were typical of both Chinese and Western reporting about the Red Army at the time. The first report, dated April 9, 1935, read, It is now revealed that Chu Tei was killed during a battle at Chu Teishin, Pig Head Mountain, in the Tsatsu area. Chu was leading his column of troops in an effort to reach Kuiang. His body has not been encoffined. It is wrapped in red silk and carried by his close followers. Chu had been suffering from a serious wound before he met his death, 
His close followers in the Red Army offer sacrifices before the Red Silk Wrapped Body at close intervals when they have a chance to take a brief rest in their escape for life. It is now confirmed that the Red Army consists of no more than 10,000 men. A contemptuous smile formed about General Chu's lips as he read this report which, incidentally, was about the tenth time he had been reported killed. He pushed the clippings aside and said, I once read a report in the Shen Pao of Shanghai about an American YMCA speaker who said the Red Army gets recruits by surrounding a village and cutting off the ears of every man who refuses to join it. I asked General Chu if he had ever been wounded. No, he said. I have never even been sick for a day in my life. To tell the truth, though, I caught a cold while we were in the snow mountains. The Kuomintang often reported my death. That outfit can't tell the truth. Chang Kai-shek offered $250,000 for my head, for Mao's, and others. He even published price lists for heads, according to rank, from squad commander up. His planes dropped these over our lines. Men were insulted if their names were not on the lists or if only a few hundred dollars were offered for their heads. General Chu continued speaking of the Kuaichao campaign. By April, he said, enemy armies were concentrated in north, east, and south Kuaichao. The Yunnan army had also moved into the south, leaving the western route into Yunnan province open. Unable to shake off such heavy enemy forces, on May 1st the Red Army suddenly drove westward through. Northern Yunnan over mountainous territory well known to General Chu from the past. In order to get the army across the river of Golden Sands, which crashes along the Yunnan Sichuan border, before enemy bombers could discover it, Lin Piao was sent with one division to make a feint at the provincial capital, Yunnanfu, and draw enemy armies and bombers after him. While Lin's division was making a loud noise on the road to Yunnanfu, Lu Pucheng, chief of staff of field operations of the Red Army, led vanguard forces in a forced march directly across northern Yunnan. On the night of May 4th, he reached the ferry crossing at Choping Fort, disarmed the astounded Sichuan garrison, seized nine large boats, arms, ammunition, food stores, and the complete war plans and orders of Chiang Kai-shek. The rest of the army followed and crossed in safety. On the way to Yunnanfu, Lin Piao's division captured an enemy caravan of military and medical supplies on its way to Kuaichao. When his division came within sight of the gates of Yunnanfu, Chiang Kai-shek and his wife, who had flown there from Kuaichao together with other Kuomintang figures, hurriedly left again. Lin's division now wheeled northward and three days later crossed the River of Golden Sands at Choping Fort, destroyed the boats on the northern bank, and disappeared into the wilderness of mountains and forests of La, La Land. The Red Army was not heard of again for three weeks. The Red Army was moving northward through the mountains and forests of La, La Land toward the torrential Tatu River, while Chiang Kai-shek flew to Chengtu in Sichuan and ordered the warlord armies in the west to repeat history by destroying the Red Army at the Tatu River as the Taiping Army under Shi Takai was destroyed. General Chu spoke contemptuously of Chiang's order, saying, We repeated the observation of Karl Marx that world historically important events and persons occur, as it were, Twice, the first time is tragedy, the second is farce. Chiang Kai-shek waited in Chengtu for months, but history had still not repeated itself. Chapter 30 Consider the great historical drama being enacted in the vast mountains and primeval forests of distant Sikong province. The Chinese Red Army, now no more than 60 or 70,000 men, for their losses had been heavy and they had left many partisans behind, was marching northward through La, La Land. Chu Te had known this route in 1922, and 40,000 men of the Taiping army had, just 72 years before, trodden along the same paths up the terrible fire mountain where no tree or shrub or blade of grass grew and not a drop of water could be found. Tung Pai Wu, Old Tongue, consoled the little devils, sons of soldiers who were to grow up in the army, by telling them the ancient story of Monkey who crossed this same fire mountain on his way to India to search for Buddhist manuscripts. But the mountain was so hot that all the hair on Monkey's behind was burned off, which is the reason monkeys have bare bottoms to the present day. If that is true, one red army little devil laughed, why is not your long mustache burned off? Ah, if monkey could cross this desolate mountain and live happily ever after, sure we need have no fear, Old Tongue replied, turning the subject. 
The thirsty Red Army found water at last in scattered small villages surrounded by terraced fields of rice and sugar cane, and in a sparkling river washing the feet of other fields. And they bathed in the river at night, treading the faint reflection of the moon, as one Red Army man put it, before spreading their blankets on the soft sand, looking at the moon and talking of many things. Sometimes the Red Army built bonfires on both sides of a river and cursed their dead balls engineers for failing to bridge the Lolo's broad deep river for them. To cement friendships with the semi-savage Lolo tribesmen whose ancestors had waged war on the Taipings, Chief of Staff Lu Puching was not above drinking an oath of blood brotherhood with the chieftain of a black Lolo tribe. Until then the Lolos had greeted the Red Army with a long drawn out war cry that sounded, Woo you, woo you, woo you at which the Lolo warriors, naked to the waist, had seized their spears and attacked like swarms of hornets from every mountainside. A red army man who knew the Lolo language went out and arranged for a meeting with the black Lolo chieftain. At a pond called Haizu Pian, the chieftain met and talked with Lu Pucheng. It was there that the chieftain killed the chicken and let some of the blood drop into two bowls of water. He said as he did so, on this day, in this month, Commander Lu and Xiao Yauda, on the banks of the Haizu Pian, become blood brothers. If at any time either of them betrays the other, he will die like this chicken. Commander Lu took one bowl of the bloody water and spoke in a loud voice for all assembled Lolos and Red Army men to hear, I, Commander Lu Pucheng, and Xiao Yauda, today at Haizu Pian, become blood brothers. If I ever violate this, Oath, heaven will kill me and the earth destroy me. After Lu had drunk, the Lolo chieftain lifted his bowl and also proclaimed in a loud voice, I, Xiao Yauda, and Commander Lu, today become blood brothers. We are willing to live and die together. If I ever betray this oath, I will die like this chicken. And he drained his bowl. The black Lolo chieftain, with many of his warriors, then escorted the Red Army through their territory, and when they came to the tribal border the chieftain ordered twenty of his slaves, who were white Lolos, to guide the Red Army northward, and remain with it to learn its ways of fighting, and then to return and teach his tribe how to fight the Sichuan warlord Lu Wanhui. The Red Army taught the white Lolos indeed. These men became communists before returning to Lalaland, but what happened to them thereafter General Chu Tei did not yet know. In late May, Lin Piao's vanguard division reached the Tatu River at the market town of Anshancheng, the very place where Shitakai and the Taiping army perished. The savage river tumbled down from the towering, dead mountains, outposts of the Tibetan ranges covered with everlasting snows. The river roared like thunder and cast up rainbow mists as it crashed against the cliffs. The river broadens out at Anshancheng, where there was a ferry crossing with three ferry boats, each large enough to take eighty men at one time. Only one ferry was tied up at Anshancheng, while the other two were on the northern bank where a garrison of Sichuan troops had built fortifications and was waiting to obey Chiang Kai-shek's order to destroy the Red Army as the Taipings were destroyed. It is at this crossing, so runs the legend, that the spirits of the Taipings wail on dark nights, crying for vengeance, and it was here that General Chu, who had come up with Lin Piao's vanguard division in advance of the main forces, told a group of men the tales which the old weaver had told him in his childhood about Shitakai's revolutionary army. In the midst of his stories a soldier came up and said, We bought and slaughtered a hog. I snitched the liver and a few other pieces for you. Suppose we have a meal. Good. General Chu exclaimed with gusto. I'm a good cook. Come, you cut up the meat and I'll do the cooking. A dozen men followed him into the house where he had established headquarters and stood about sniffing the odors of the cooking food while listening to his tales of the Taipings. When the food was ready and being eaten, General Chu turned to the soldier who had snitched it for him and said, If you lay your hands on some tripe, bring it along and I'll cook it to make your mouth water. By the time they had eaten their meal, all preparations for Lin Piao's division to cross the river were completed. The ferry was pushed far upstream, where eighty men boarded it, set up machine guns, and shoved off much as had the Taipings some seventy years before. They landed on the north bank with machine guns rattling and rifles crackling. They captured the ferries and sent the lot back to bring others. By next day, the entire division had crossed and the enemy redoubts on the north bank were in Red Army hands. 
Then the main forces came up. But enemy bombers had turned up also and began plastering the ferry and Anchancheng. The only other place where the river could be crossed was at Looting Village 140 miles upstream where a famous suspension bridge had been built in past ages. There were also Sichuan garrison troops and strong defenses at Looting Kayo, as the suspension bridge was named, but Lin Piao's vanguard division could take them in the rear while the main forces crossed. The decision was acted upon at once, and the two columns began marching, signaling each other across the river. At night they marched by the light of pine torches. Only after a cruel eighteen-hour march did the columns halt to sleep for four hours. Then they got up again and continued toiling along the narrow paths up and down the monstrous mountains. A few hours before they reached Ludinkayo, Lin Piao's division fell behind. They signaled that they had encountered enemy troops. The main column pushed on fiercely and reached Ludinkayo at dawn on May 30th, the 10th anniversary of the Shanghai Massacre. They decided to cross Ludinkayo by some means on this historic day to prove that history never repeated itself save as a farce. General Chu described the famous suspension bridge as made up of about 20 heavy iron chains embedded in huge piles of cemented stone on both banks of the river, each chain as thick as the diameter of a rice bowl and two or more feet apart, with iron bars to hold on to. The river at this point narrowed to about 300 yards. Looting village, with the enemy redoubts, was on the north, and only a few houses stood on the south bank. The enemy had prepared a welcome for the Revolutionary Army by removing all plank flooring of the bridge up to about a hundred yards from the north bridgehead. So for about two hundred yards there was nothing but iron chains swaying over the roaring torrent five hundred feet below. Lin Piao's division had still not come up, and no one knew how many enemy troops it had to cope with. There was no time to lose. The bridge had to be crossed, a new bridge floor laid. The troops began felling trees from the surrounding forests and collecting planks, doors, and everything which could be used for flooring. At the same time volunteers were called for to make the first crossing. Whole units volunteered, but first honors went to a platoon commanded by Ma Tachiu. Then a second platoon was chosen. The men of both platoons strapped their guns, swords, and hand grenades on their backs, and platoon commander Ma Tachiu stepped out, grasped one of the chains, and began swinging, hand over hand, toward the north bank. The platoon political director followed, and after him the men. As they swung along, red army machine guns laid down a protecting screen of fire, and the engineering corps began bringing up tree trunks and laying the bridge flooring. The army watched breathlessly as the men swung along the bridge chains. Matachiu was the first to be shot into the wild torrent below. Then another man and another. The others pushed along, but just before they reached the flooring at the north bridgehead they saw enemy soldiers dumping cans of kerosene on the planks and setting them on fire. Watching the sheet of flame spread, some men hesitated, but the platoon political leader at last sprang down on the flooring before the flames reached his feet, calling to the others to follow. They came and crouched on the planks releasing their hand grenades and unbuckling their swords. They ran through the flames and threw their hand grenades in the midst of the enemy. More and more men followed, the flames lapping at their clothing. Behind them sounded the roar of their comrades, and, beneath the roar, the heavy thud, thud, thud of the last tree trunks falling into place. The bridge became a mass of running men with rifles ready, tramping out the flames as they ran. The enemy retreated to their second line of defenses, but Lin Piao's division appeared suddenly in their rear and the battle ended. The Battle of Luting Kayo lasted just one hour. Seventeen men were killed, many scorched and wounded, and a few severely burned. A staff officer who was with Chu and Mao while the bridge was being crossed told me that Chu made no sound, no sign, but stood like a man turned to stone. He knew that the fate of the Red Army was being decided at that moment, that 20th century Chinese workers and peasants were succeeding where other Chinese warriors of past history had failed. By late afternoon, when the enemy began bombing the bridge and village, General Chu ordered a withdrawal. That night he spoke at a memorial mass meeting. 
General Chu told his audience that 17 heroes had sacrificed their lives to pave the way for the army's advance to Mukong where the Red Army was to meet the 4th Front Red Army and proceed to North China to fight the Japanese. May 30, 1935, he said, was a historic day. It was the 10th anniversary of the massacre of Chinese students and workers at Shanghai by British imperialism. And 72 years before, in May, Shitakai had attempted his crossing of the Tatu River. After briefly reviewing 72 years of Chinese history, General Chu went on to a theme on which he often spoke in following years, heroism is an ancient concept, he said. In the past, individual heroes arose above the masses, often had contempt for the masses, and sometimes tried to enslave the masses. The Red Army embodies a new concept of heroism. We create mass heroes of the revolution who have no self-interest, who reject all temptation, and are willing to die for the revolution or live and fight until our people and country are liberated. The way before us is even more difficult than the one behind us. We must cross some of the highest mountains in the world, glacier-clad mountains wrapped in eternal snow, and often we will have to break our own paths. We must cross torrential rivers, construct our own bridges. In this vast region of the Tibetan-Chinese borderland are warlike tribes who fight all Chinese. Chinese oppressive regimes for centuries have tried to exterminate these tribesmen and have succeeded with some. But we must try to make friends and work with these oppressed tribes as we have worked with Chinese workers and peasants. In the vast regions before us are also many enemy mountain forts and a hundred thousand enemy troops under orders to exterminate us. Kuomintang planes, which never molest the advancing Japanese, will bomb us even in the mountains of eternal snow. We will often have to march at night to avoid them. Our difficulties are great, our enemies are many, but there is no mountain and no river we cannot cross, no fort we cannot conquer. Chapter 31 on the map, it is less than a hundred miles from the Tatu River to Mukung where the Central Red Army planned to meet the 4th Front Red Army from Sichuan for the final march to North China. It was seven weeks before the unification took place. Ten days were spent in preparing to cross the glacier and snow-clad mountains ahead, and another week in rest after this had been accomplished. There was also some fighting before the march began. A regiment of Tibetan braves came down from Takienliu to reinforce the Sichuan troops. The Tibetans were clad in sheepskin coats and their Chinese officers in fur-lined uniforms. The officers had brought their concubines along, baby-faced women hung with jade and swathed in beautiful white fur, and, like their masters, riding fine horses. Since the Red Army needed fur garments, it did not take them long to strip the Tibetan regiment, including the baby-faced concubines. They also took the horses and the boxes of silver which the officers were carting with them. In preparation for crossing the first snow ranges ahead, General Chu issued an order of the day which instructed each man to be as warmly clad as possible and to carry enough food and fuel to last ten days. The order included a report on the some 100,000 enemy troops in the vast Chinese-Tibetan borderland between Luding and the Kansu provincial border in the far north. Of these General Chu said, all such enemy forces have poor fighting power and have been defeated by Red Armies in the past. They are incapable of constructing new forts, standing guard in the fierce cold, or of prolonged fighting. Our army has better fighting power and, since our troops and political leaders are very active and courageous, we are confident of our ability to defeat them. This was followed by orders about fighting tactics in the Great Snow Mountains where the paths are narrow and dangerous, the distribution of troops difficult and, under some circumstances, fighting is altogether impossible. Troops were to move no more than six or seven hours a day. They had to be prepared to build shelters and to use white camouflage in certain regions. Enemy boats were to be seized, or leather and wooden boats prepared, to facilitate the crossing of rivers. All frontal attacks on the enemy were to be avoided, night attacks carefully planned, and all attacks simultaneous and continuous until the enemy capacity for resistance is completely shattered. This order of the day, like other orders, reports, letters, and articles by General Chu in the next 18 months, was written on paper which told an eloquent story of the backward, primitive life in the vast Chinese-Tibetan borderland. 
Some were written on the reverse side of old military maps, roughly torn into squares, some on cheap, soft paper of many gaudy colors which Chinese use for New Year celebrations, others on coarse, thick Tibetan paper decorated with Tibetan designs or on pages torn from military account books, and some on great square sheets of coarse paper from which previous Tibetan printing had been roughly washed off with water or chemicals. One of General Chu's articles, written about the time the above order of the day was issued, was entitled How to Win Enemy Soldiers to the Anti-Japanese Anti-Chang Front. It contained this significant quotation from a letter which a captive Szechuan soldier had written his family, while I was in the Szechuan army, our officers told us the Red Army cuts out the tongues of all captives before killing them. My whole company was captured, but we were not even searched. A communist talked with us. He asked us how many rich men were soldiers. We said no rich men are soldiers. He asked us what we and our families got from the warlords for whom we fought. We said our families just get more taxes and we soldiers were often not paid for months. He asked us why we fought for the warlords. We said because we were ordered. He said we fought poor men like ourselves and helped rich landlords and warlords who are running dogs of Chiang Kai-shek and the Japanese dwarfs. He asked us to join the Red Army, but said if we didn't want to, his army would give us expense money to go home. We are now in the Red Army. It is very different from the Szechuan Army. Its officers and soldiers live and eat alike, and no officer can curse or beat a soldier. We have lectures and meetings, and we sing. Since General Chu Tei was too busy to discuss this period of his life with me, he referred me to men who could give details of the march northward and placed important documents written by himself at my disposal. A political worker with whom I talked said he thought the worst mountain to cross was Kuchau, which was not so high as others, but was completely covered with forests so dense that they shut out all light. The troops climbed this mountain in a pouring rain, wading in mud up to their hips and pulling themselves out by the branches of trees. After that, the man continued, the Kayachenchen range was the worst, most of our comrades thought it the worst of all. When we came to it we had already crossed many mountains and many of our men were exhausted. Before crossing, General Chu Te made an inspection of every unit, looking at our shoes, lifting packs to test the weight, inquiring about everyone's health and instructing medical units to march in the rear to care for exhausted or older people who fell behind. He encouraged us to put forth every effort. Kaya Chinchin is blanketed in eternal snow. There are great glaciers in its chasms, and everything is white and silent. We were heavily burdened because each man had to carry enough food and fuel to last ten days. Our food was anything we could buy, chiefly corn, though we had a little buckwheat and some peppers. We carried our food in long cloth pouches over our shoulders. General Chu carried his food like everyone else. He had a horse, but he gave it to sick or wounded men to ride. We would not have suffered so much or had such heavy losses in life if we had been able to buy rice. The change from rice to a corn diet gave our men diarrhea and other stomach disorders. The corn passed straight through them. They couldn't digest it at all. Another torment was lice. Wherever we slept in the huts of the people, the lice seemed to come up out of the earthen floor to settle on us. Everybody had lice, everybody hunted lice. Of all the men who talked of crossing Kaya Chinchin, however, Tung Pai Wu seemed the most graphic. A learned man of fifty, Mr. Tung was one of the earliest communists. In describing the crossing of Kaya Chinchin, he said, We started out at early dawn. There was no path at all. But peasants said that tribesmen came over the mountains on raids, and we could cross if they could. So we started straight up the mountain, heading for a pass near the summit. Heavy fog swirled about us, there was a high wind, and halfway up it began to rain. As we climbed higher and higher we were caught in a terrible hailstorm and the air became so thin that we could hardly breathe at all. Speech was completely impossible and the cold so dreadful that our breath froze and our hands and lips turned blue. Men and animals staggered and fell into chasms and disappeared forever. Those who sat down to rest or to relieve themselves froze to death on the spot. Exhausted political workers encouraged men by sign and touch to continue moving, indicating that the pass was just ahead by nightfall we had crossed at an altitude of 16,000 feet 
and that night we bivouacked in a valley where there was no sign of human life. While most of us were stretched out exhausted, General Chu came around to make his usual inspection. He was very weary, for he had walked with the troops. Yet nothing ever prevented him from making his rounds. He gave me half of a little dried beef which he had in his pocket. He encouraged everyone and said we had crossed the worst peak and it was only a few more days to Mukung. To avoid enemy bombers, we arose at midnight and began climbing the next peak. It rained, then snowed, and the fierce wind whipped our bodies, and more men died of cold and exhaustion. The last peak in the range, which we estimated to be 80 li, 27 miles, from base to summit, was terrible. Hundreds of our men died there. They would sit down to rest or relieve themselves, and never get up. All along the route we kept reaching down to pull men to their feet only to find that they were already dead. When we finally reached a valley and found a cluster of tribal houses, we gathered around and rejoiced at the mere sight of human habitation. The tribespeople had fled because we were Chinese, and centuries of cruel oppression had engendered in them fear and hatred of every Chinese. We had a number of Lolo tribesmen with us, but they also could not understand the tribal language in these areas. I lost track of time, but I think it was middle or late June. When we finally reached a broad valley dotted with many tribal villages of huts or black yurts made of yak wool. Here were great fields of barley, two breeds of wheat, millet and peas, and herds of pigs, yak, sheep and goats. We established such friendly relations as we could with the tribes people and bought food from them. We paid for our food with national currency. By that time we had so many sick and exhausted men that our main forces decided to rest for a week while Peng Tehuai led 11 regiments ahead to establish contact with our 4th Front Red Army in the Mukong, Lianghako, Lifan, and Maoshan districts. The 4th Front Red Army had occupied these areas for a number of months, but there were still many mountains and rivers to cross before we reached it. The mountains were not so terrible as those behind us, but the whole territory ahead was peopled with fierce fan tribes who fought every step of our advance. One of the political workers who went with Peng's vanguards told this story, for four days we fought fan tribesmen in the Blackwater River region and finally reached a shabby little village called Waiku. The people had evaluated and destroyed the rope suspension bridge over the river. They took up positions on high, precipitous cliffs directly behind Waiku and rolled huge boulders down the mountainside against us. Peng had to send troops to drive them away. Everywhere from the cliffs and mountains we heard the tribal horns calling men to battle, Wang Ji Ji Ji. Wang Ji Ji Ji. Wang Ji 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 Ji. Our troops had begun building a pontoon bridge when we saw a column of armed men coming down from the hills on the far shore, running and shouting, but the roar of the river was so great that we could not hear them. One of them wrapped a message around a stone and hurled it across to us. It read, We're 4th Front Red Army Troops. Forty Lee up the river at Inyan is a rope suspension bridge where you can cross. On the way to Inyan we passed through empty tribal villages where the Fan tribesmen again hurled boulders down from overhanging cliffs. The river at Inyan was wider than at Waiku and the rope suspension bridge had been destroyed. Again, we saw marching men, and when they reached the bank of fan guide who was with them threw a message across the river to us. It was from Su Xianqian. We all marched back to Waiku where our engineers constructed a pontoon bridge and we crossed the Blackwater River and united with our comrades. We embraced, we sang and wept after a week of rest, the main body of the army followed along the same route taken by Peng Tei Huai. Before leaving, General Chu issued this order, Though the environment is very difficult, our military political educational work must continue without interruption. Six major disciplines must be observed. 1. Obey orders. 2. Act swiftly. 3. Keep time. 4. Love and protect your weapons. 5. Pay attention to sanitation. 6. Be kind and courteous to one another and to the tribespeople. Be kind and courteous to the tribespeople must have been a discipline difficult to obey. The route of march was dotted with the corpses of Peng's men who, weary from marching and fighting, had straggled behind. The tribesmen had murdered them. When I asked General Chu what his attitude had been at such times, he replied, When attacked, we drove the tribal warriors away, 
but we tried not to kill. We left their homes as they were, taking nothing, hoping they would understand that we were not enemies. Peng Tehuai's troops had tremendous success with the tribespeople afterwards. He even organized a tribal people's government over a large territory, exactly as we had done in Kiangxi. When the main forces of the Central Red Army at last met advanced troops of the 4th Front Red Army, the battered, emaciated Southerners broke ranks and ran toward their comrades, shouting, weeping, and singing. Many were so overcome with joy that they could not even speak. On July 20th, in a pouring rain, they marched into the village of Irhokuo, in the Mukung area, to unite with the 4th Front Red Army officially. Posters and slogans had been put up everywhere, field telephone wires were strung from village to village, and on a meadow stood ready a speaker's platform. What happened at that meeting, and at the conference of the Politburo of the Communist Party immediately afterwards, was told me by different men. Chu and Mao came out of the village in the pouring rain to await the arrival of Chang Kuotao, political commissar of the 4th Front Army. They had already had long talks with the 4th Army military commander, Su Xianqian, with other officers and men, and what they learned had been disturbing. A Red Army political worker explained the situation in these words, the 4th Front Red Army had about 50,000 men. They were big, brave fellows from Sichuan, Honan, and Hupa. They were poor peasants or former slaves, and anything could have been done with them. They had fought with great heroism and they had suffered. Chang Kuotao had taken good care of them physically, they were well fed and warmly clothed, but he had done almost nothing to educate them generally or politically. Chang had been appointed political commissar of this army by the central committee of our party. His duty was clear to develop the troops politically to prevent the army from becoming an instrument of any ambitious military leader. Chang Kuotao had transformed the 4th Front Red Army into his own personal instrument. He had, following a good old Kuomintang custom, built up a powerful clique of officers as his personal followers. He had organized the army on the Kuomintang pattern and even introduced the same officer rank. He had established special privileges for himself and his clique, the best clothing and food, for example, and kept 30 horses for himself and his bodyguard. Of course Mao and Chu and a few other commanders in the Central Red Army each had. A horse. Mao had to ride because he was sick, and he had one bodyguard. Chu Te also had one bodyguard. Except when he inspected army units, Chu Te gave his horse to others to ride. We often protested because he had to direct the whole army during the long march, but he said nature had given him a particularly strong body and that other men needed his horse. Chang Kuotao had contempt for the whole Central Red Army because we were so ragged and battered and were now numerically weaker than his army. Before leaving Kiangxi, we had fought a million enemy troops for months. Our men went on the long march directly from the battlefield. In the nine months of fighting and marching across the plains, rivers, and mountains, we had suffered heavy losses. We had left most of the sick and wounded with the peasants. We had also left companies along the way to develop partisan warfare, so that we had only 45,000 men left when we reached Mukung. We had approached Mukung as men approach an oasis in a desert. Because of this we were appalled at the attitude of Chang Kuotao and his officer clique. They acted like rich men meeting poor relatives. Chang Kuotao's arrogant attitude was clear from the very beginning. When we held our unification meeting at Erhokuo, he came riding in with his mounted bodyguard of 30 men, like an actor coming onto the stage. Chu and Mao rushed forward to meet him, and he waited for them to approach him. He didn't even meet them halfway. General Chu's speech to the assembled troops praised Chang Kuotao's long revolutionary record, but when Chang spoke he introduced Chu Te to his army merely as the man who has struggled with us for eight years. Our party alone could determine the policies and program, strategy and tactics of all the Red Armies. They had been decided on the long march to North China. The guiding Politburo had called a conference at Erhokuo, following the unification meeting, where our continued march northward was to be mapped. Despite all this, in his speech to the assembled troops Chang Kuotao announced his own private program, stating that the vast borderland regions of Sikong and western Sichuan were an ideal place to establish a Soviet base and build a new world. 
We had not made the long march in order to stick in the high Tibetan Chinese borderland while the Japanese continued lopping off province after province and Kuomintang traders continued surrendering. Of course, in every great revolutionary upheaval, all kinds of problems arise and mistakes are made. Problems must be solved and mistakes corrected. The mistakes of the 4th Front Red Army leadership were therefore discussed frankly at the conference of the Politburo. Chang Kuotao, however, was not a man to accept criticism or admit mistakes readily. He was even arrogant enough to point to the good condition of his 50,000 troops and to the losses and poor condition of ours, by which he implied that he was the only man capable of leading. The Red Army Instead of carrying out the northern policy, he insisted that we remain in the borderland and develop it into a revolutionary base. The conference was stormy, but before it ended Chang had promised to eradicate all personal militarist habits and all militarist practices in the 4th Front Army. He continued opposing the northern policy, arguing that Chiang Kai-shek had thrown 100,000 troops across our route of march. The best strategy, he said, was to march back over the same route we had come, to Tian Chuan, take the Tibetan city of Takian Lu, and establish our power in Sikang province. He was voted down and the northern policy reaffirmed. Chu Te reminded Chang Kuotao that while Chang Kai-shek had sent 100,000 troops against us, we also had around 100,000 troops. Since the 4th Front Army was rested and in good condition, General Chu proposed that it open the northern route by taking the Sumpan region, thus seizing positions of great strategic importance. Chang refused outright, saying the enemy defense works were too powerful. We finally compromised by dividing our troops into two columns to continue the northern march. The first, or eastern column, led by Mao Tse Tung, consisted of the main forces of the Central Red Army from the south. The second, or western column, under the general command of Chu Te, Lu Pucheng was Chu Te's chief of staff, consisted of the 4th Front Red Army which Chang Kuotao commanded and our southern 9th and 5th Red Army Corps. We began moving at once. Our eastern column reached Maurakai, 70 miles from Sumpan, where it remained for three weeks to rest and prepare for crossing the grasslands and to wait for Peng Wai's troops to come up. Peng's troops were collecting food supplies for the whole army. They were also organizing the tribespeople into a tribal people's government. The western column reached the banks of one of the raging rivers that pour down from the great Kunlai mountain ranges. It halted to reconnoiter for a place to cross. Chang Kuotao declared that the river could not be crossed and that the column had no alternative but to turn back into Sikang province, which was what he intended doing all along. He insisted that Chu Te and Lu Pucheng should turn back with him. Both Chu and Lu were Sichuan men whose names were famous throughout West China, and Chang Kuotao wanted to use them for his purposes. Chu Te also had the only radio generator in the army. General Chu and Chief of Staff Lu said a crossing of the river could be found, and, if that failed, the western column could join the eastern at Maurakai and continue the long march. That same night Chang Kuotao brought up special troops of the 4th Front Red Army, surrounded General Headquarters, and took Chu Te and his staff prisoner. Chang ordered Chu Te to obey two commands. The first was that he denounce Mao Tse Tung and cut all relations with him. General Chu replied, you can no more cut me off from Mao than you can cut a man in half. Chang's second command was that Chu denounce the party decision to move into North China and begin the anti-Japanese anti-Chang war of liberation. General Chu replied, I helped make that decision. I cannot oppose it. Chang Kuotao said he would give Chu Tei time to think things over, and if he still refused to obey these two orders, he would be shot. Chu replied, that is within your power. I cannot prevent you. I will not obey your orders. A number of factors prevented Chang Kuotao from carrying out his threat. First, there were the 9th and 5th Red Army Corps who wanted to take Chu Tei and his staff back to the Eastern Column. Chang Kuotao warned them not to try. Faced with this situation, which would have led to bloody fighting on the high plateau of Central Asia, Chu Te and his staff finally turned back with Chang Kuotao. The Western Column, now commanded by Chang, marched back into Sikang province, where it remained until Ho Long's Second Front Red Army of 35,000 men came up one year later. 
Ho's army had made the long march along the same route taken by the central troops, but, instead of crossing the terrible mountain ranges as we did, swung west, encircled Takian Liu, and joined the 4th Front Red Army. When Ho Long and his political commissar, Xiao Keh, learned what had happened, that Chu Te and his staff were working as best they could with Chang Kuotao, he seriously advised Chang to allow Chu to assume command and lead all the red troops into North China. By then Mao's column had reached northwest China and had developed a powerful revolutionary base directly across the route of a possible Japanese advance. By then, also, political conditions throughout the country were better for the revolution and the food situation in Sikong so bad that Chang Kuotao agreed. General Chu therefore assumed command and led the Red Forces northward to rejoin Mao Zedong. Chang, however, still retained control of the 4th Front Red Army, whose troops had still not been educated properly. General Chu Te never talked with me about the year he spent in Sikong as the virtual prisoner of Chang Kuotao. By the time we reached that part of his life, the Japanese had invaded China below the Great Wall and he went to the front. I therefore had to depend on others, and on his writings on military and political subjects during that period from these it seemed clear that not only had General Chu become a writer of power during his year in Sikong, but that he had done everything possible to help Chang Kuotao in the struggle against the Sichuan warlord armies. One report written by him during this period was an analysis of the warlord armies. Another, apparently written at Kangsa in western Sikong, and undated, was on tactics to be adopted in fighting in mountains of eternal snows. Mixed in with these pages, I found two sheets of gaudy pink paper on which he had jotted down fragments of two. Old Chinese poems which had apparently fitted his unhappy mood, tears flooded the yellow river, regrets loaded the three peaks. Washan, one, sank beneath their weight. A peach tree outside the beloved's gate, beneath the tree an iron bridge. Crossing the bridge the lover grows weak, crossing the bridge the beloved loses strength. Only when the iron bridge rusts away will love vanish. Chu Te kept himself informed on world affairs via his radio. That was revealed in his detailed analysis of the tactics employed by the Abyssinian armies and of the support of Italian fascism by the imperialist powers. Still another document, dated December 25, 1935, was a lengthy open letter to the officers of the Sichuan armies. Tersely and powerfully written, it began with an historical analysis of China's struggle for independence from the mid-19th century down to that moment. This letter analyzed not only the notorious Tanku Agreement between Tokyo and Nanking, but also the terms of the secret Huyumetsu Agreement signed in July 1935 by which the Nanking government agreed to suppress completely the anti-Japanese movement in China. The document reveals both Chu Te's deep historical knowledge and vision, as well as the consuming passion with which he pursued the struggle under the most disheartening circumstances. The following are verbatim extracts. For two months now the Abyssinians have been fighting for the independence of their country. Though Abyssinia has a population of only 10 million and a territory of only 300,000 square miles, its people are still fighting an imperialist power many times their numerical and military strength. We Chinese have many tens of millions of square miles of territory, a population of 400 million, and a history that began 4,000 years ago with our Huangti ancestors. Yet the Kuomintang government has not lifted one rifle to resist the Japanese enemy but, instead, has progressively surrendered our territory to the Japanese. The Abyssinian War and the Japanese invasion of China are part of the same imperialist war of invasion, partition, and colonialism. These are skirmishes which will spread into a second world holocaust in which no country can remain neutral. In this coming world war China will become a vast battlefield, it will be the meat and the imperialists will be the butchers. We, all of us, were born in this country. We exist here, it is our only home. How, then, can we be so slavish as not even to think of saving our country from ruin? You, Sichuan officers, have many million of soldiers, and you have good modern weapons. Why can't you even dream of following the example of little Abyssinia whose dark soldiers are fighting gloriously for their independence? Why should not brave and gallant men in our country also step out to fight for national survival? Traitor Chiang Kai-shek, 
who is willing to sweep the way for imperialism, destroys or bans all anti-Japanese organizations, thus demonstrating his loyalty to Japanese imperialism. Is there any living Chinese who wishes to be a man without a country? The appeal continued with a proposal that the Szechuan armies form a national united front with the Red Army and fulfill three conditions. One, end the civil war. Two, grant democratic rights to the Chinese people in all territory held by the Szechuan armies. And three, guarantee the right of the people to organize and arm themselves into anti-Japanese volunteers. It ended, if you accept these terms, please appoint representatives to consult with us. If you still continue to take orders from traitors and continue to attack and carry out the orders of Chiang Kai-shek to suppress the people and exterminate the communists, then you are the vanguards of imperialism, sweepers of the path for imperialism. The anti-Japanese mission now rests on the shoulders of the Chinese masses, and if you wish to fight Japan you must not fear the masses, but must share responsibility with them. If China sinks deeper into subjection, you will not escape. When the nest falls, the eggs are broken. Your goal is glory and wealth, yet if China is destroyed, what matter if you have wealth and own 100,000 mu of land, if you reject our offer and continue selling China and acting as servitors of Japanese imperialism, the final result will be the ruin of our country and your families, and the destruction of your own reputation and bodies. You can then never escape the punishment of the people. Decide, which way do you choose? That the Szechuan generals continue to sweep the way for Japanese imperialism is clear, not only from history, but from an article written by Chu Te following two battles between the Red Army and the troops of General Yang Sen, at Tinhu and Mingya in Sikang, during which many Szechuan soldiers went over to the Red Army. Many pages of this article gave advice about the treatment and education of prisoners of war. After captives are disarmed, the article read, they should be divided into two different groups, the officers in one, the soldiers in another, each group assigned different billets. The soldiers should be treated very well, the officers kept under surveillance. The soldiers should be screened and the more politically conscious trained and asked to join the Red Army. Methods of dealing with the soldiers were these, we must first comfort the soldiers, ask them where they come from and what work they did before they became soldiers. Ask each man what he gets for fighting for Chang, if wounded what he gets, if killed what his family gets, if neither wounded nor killed, what he gets. The reply will always be the same, nothing, but we must ask it again and again. We must also ask detailed questions about conditions in the homes of each soldier. This done, we must use these facts to prove to the soldier who are his friends and who his enemies. After he has thus become class conscious, we must compare our policies and actions with those of the Kuomintang, compare the principles and actions of the Kuomintang with the Kumchantang, Communist Party. Which party, which army, represents the interests of the workers and peasants, and which the landlords and capitalists, which educates and develops the soldiers, which keeps the soldiers in darkness, which is for, which against, Japanese imperialism. We must start with the realities of the soldier's existence, the oppression and insults, the cursing and beating to which he is subjected by landlords and capitalists for whom he worked, and by army officers after he became a soldier. We must never forget that while in the white armies the soldier has little or no care if sick or wounded, and is left to die without care. After leaving the white armies he is penniless and homeless, yet forced to pay high taxes and high interest on any money he may borrow. We must discuss all these things and compare them with the way our army treats soldiers. Some captives will want to join the Red Army, some will want to return to their old army and lead a revolt from within, and some will want to go home and join revolutionary activities of some sort. Those who wish to return home must first be taught guerrilla tactics and methods of dividing the landlord estates. Those who merely wish to return home to see their families should still be taught how to organize guerrilla detachments and divide the land. Those who wish to fight the Japanese can be trained in the Red Army. Even the old professional soldiers must be given constant training before being released because they can be very useful for propaganda in the old armies. The division of the land has a great effect on the captive soldiers because some of them come from Soviet regions and their families have already received land. 
The majority have been forcibly conscripted by the warlords and gentry, and some have fought the Red Army for years. Many do not want to fight. All of them repeatedly told us that they fought because their officers constantly told them that the Red Army splits open the stomachs of captives. They also fought because high officers hold petty officers responsible for desertions, and the petty officers kept a sharp eye on every man under their command. In our work with the captives, we must expose the lying and deceptive propaganda of the Kuomintang, demolishing every idea voiced by the Kuomintang. We must convince the captives that they must fight the Japanese invaders. The conditions in Sikom where General Chu Te spent one year of his life under duress can be understood by at least one incident as related to me by one of his staff, since Red Army troops were workers and peasants who know every kind of work. They spun and wove and made woolen uniforms from yak, sheep, or goat's wool, or made skin garments and boots. The altitude was so high and the air so rarefied that water boiled at a very low temperature. Under these conditions, cooking took so much time that the food was only half. Done. Following one battle, I was with Chu Te and a column of men moving along a mountain path. We came to a group of black yurts such as the tribesmen use for dwellings. They had fled, of course, as Han, Chinese, troops approached, taking all food with them. We went into one of the yurts and found fifteen of our men who had gone in advance. They were sitting cross-legged on the earth around a pile of cold ashes. We called out, but they did not reply. They sat with heads bowed, like statues. We went up and touched them. They were frozen to death. The tribesmen had taken their guns and packs. In another yurt we found five others, sitting around a pile of cold ashes, each with a shot through the back. Chapter 32 I once listened to a number of Red Army men in Peng Tehuai's headquarters talking about the Long March. One of them remarked, speaking of the way comrades should act, I'd like to ask which of you stole my needle during the Long March. I haven't mentioned it until now, but I'm reminded of it because I still don't have any needle. Everyone smiled, and one man answered, perhaps you gave your needle to some village girl to prove you were rich. I've seen Chu Te spin and weave, but I've never seen you even sew a button on your jacket. Chu Te had a lot of time on his hands in Sikong, the man who had lost his needle replied. When we came out of the grasslands, I didn't have anything worth sewing a button on. That was when we began eating rats. We cleaned every village of rats. They tasted awful, but we ate them. I pitted the dogs and cats. Another man spoke up. I remember when we came out of the grasslands and broke through enemy lines into Kansu and saw Chinese peasants. They thought we were crazy. We touched their houses and the earth, we embraced them, and we danced and sang and cried. The grasslands. The grasslands. Every man talked of the grasslands. The first Red Army column, led by Mao Tse Tung, crossed the grasslands in September 1935. One year later, General Chu Te led the rest of the Red Army through that same dread region of terror. The Grasslands is a vast and trackless swamp stretching for hundreds of miles over the high Chinese-Tibetan borderland. As far as the eye can reach, day after day, the Red Army saw nothing but an endless ocean of high wild grass growing in an icy swamp of black muck and water many feet deep. Huge clumps of grass grew on dead clumps beneath them, and so it had been for no man knows how many centuries. No tree or shrub grew here, no bird ventured near, no insect sounded. There was not even a stone. There was nothing, nothing but endless stretches of wild grass swept by torrential rains in summer and fierce winds and snows in winter. Heavy black and gray clouds drifted forever above, turning the earth into a dull, somber netherworld. The Red Army marched along the eastern fringes where the swamp was less deep and where there were often narrow strips of land which tribal horsemen used on rare occasions. Each man carried enough food and firewood to last eight days, and Lin Piao's first front Red Army, which spearheaded the march, also carried bamboo screens to build shelters for those coming after. The food carried by each man consisted of parched wheat and tea. One Red Army man wrote of crossing the grasslands in the history of the Long March, friendly tribespeople around Maurakai, who had been influenced by Chinese culture and were therefore more friendly, 
told us that we would freeze to death if we did not have woolen socks and sheepskins. We prepared as best we could, but we couldn't buy enough skins or woolen garments for so many men. Just before entering the grasslands, we heard shots in our rear. A party of tribal horsemen had fallen upon some of our stragglers and seized their guns. We marched ten hours on the first day, then lay down and slept on the narrow freezing path, tying the high grass on either side into a kind of tent above us. On the fourth day we came to a stretch where we sank into muck up to our knees and our horses had to be pushed and beaten out. The clouds rolled heavily above, and except for the rustling grass it was a land of the dead. I asked a comrade how he would describe the grasslands if he were a writer. He said he would describe it as a desert except that everything was water grass instead of sand, that one could die of thirst in a desert but there was plenty of water here, and that the sun shone in a desert but never here. He said, I've heard that you can sometimes see a mirage in a desert, but we do not even have that comfort here. We finally agreed that the grasslands was a place where your feet were always soaked, where the hoof prints of the horses disappeared immediately, where men and horses fell into the muck between the grass clumps and shivered in the bitter cold after they were dragged out. We agreed that we could not really describe the dreary waste about us. Another Red Army man, Mo Su, kept a diary in which he wrote, Today I discovered a comrade struggling in the muddy water. His body was crunched together and he was covered with muck. He gripped his rifle fiercely, which looked like a muddy stick. Thinking he had merely fallen down and was trying to get up, I tried to help him stand. After I pulled him up he took two steps, but the entire weight of his body was on me, and he was so heavy that I could neither hold him up nor take a step. Urging him to try and walk alone, I released him. He fell on the path and shrunk together, but he still clung fiercely to his rifle and tried to rise. I tried again to lift him, but he was so heavy and I so weak that it was impossible. Then I saw that he was dying. I still had some parched wheat with me, and I gave him some, but he could not chew, and it was clear that no food could save him. I carefully put the parched wheat back in my pocket, and when he died I rose and passed on and left him lying there. Later, when we reached a resting place I took the wheat from my pocket, but I could not chew it. I kept thinking of our dying comrades. I had had no choice but to leave him where he fell, and had I not done this I would have fallen behind and lost contact with our army and died. Yet I could not eat that parched wheat. As the days passed, more and more corpses lay along the route of the march, many in the shelters built by the vanguard troops. Exhausted men had lain down in the shelters to gather a little strength, and those who came after found them dead. Little piles of parched wheat lay near the head of each man. Comrades had left food which they themselves needed. Fires had burned into piles of cold ashes. Sometimes the rain poured so fiercely that a man could not hear the voice of the one behind him. The rain would be followed by a fierce, freezing wind. The sun would come out for a few moments, then be swallowed up, and the rain again come down in sheets. When men came to a shelter they would crowd inside and try to build a fire, only to find that their wood was soaked and would not light. On the sixth day they saw the faint, distant outlines of low hills with smoke here and there, and their rejoicing knew no bounds. Next they saw a few stones in the path, and they picked them up and exclaimed at their beautiful meaning. On the eighth day they again saw smoke, find the next afternoon some distant trees and low houses. They pushed forward like famished men in a desert, but an order came down the line, turn left and make another due encampment tonight. They obeyed in silence, and when they came to firm earth they found bushes covered with red gold berries hanging in grape clusters which they ate. After days of eating only a few grains of parched wheat and hot water, the sour berries tasted delicious. The next evening they came to a deserted tribal village where all houses were made of yak manure, which was so inflammable that special fire patrols had to be organized. Some of the buildings were huge structures of 30 or 40 rooms. By then all the provisions of the army had been used up and the men began eating anything they could find, unripened wheat from the fields, grass, wild greens, berries. Some of the rich tribesmen, who had fled before the Hans, had secret storehouses in their great homes. These were built into the walls and completely sealed up. The red troops discovered them, tore down the walls, and distributed the food. 
Some men boiled cowhides for 24 hours and then ate them, or they boiled big leather boots and drank the broth. Every rich fan tribal family had a special religious hall in which Buddhist manuscripts and bowls of sacrificial food, nuts, dates, rice, and cheese, were kept, and on the altars were figurines of gods and animals painted green or red. One Red Army unit of twelve men was billeted in such a hall for a number of days while the army was cruising far and wide to find and buy wheat. One of the men of the unit of twelve returned one evening and noticed that some of the altar figurines had disappeared. When he asked the reason, one of his comrades gave him a bowl of steaming hot wheat porridge with butter floating on top. The fragrance was so delicious that he almost fainted. His comrades had scraped the paint from the figurines and found them to be made of wheat and butter. We were so selfish that we kept the secret, this man said. At each mealtime we would peel the paint off a few more images and cook them in water with a handful of wheat, which was our only army ration. We were so demoralized by hunger that we secretly planned to raid the family altars of other homes. But one day, after treating two famished comrades, our secret came out and after that our living conditions sank deplorably. Chiang Kai-shek had even shipped a division of the famous 19th Root Army into the borderlands, but after two regiments were destroyed in battle with the Red Army its commander fled and 800 soldiers surrendered. These soldiers told the Red Army that almost all their old commanders had been replaced by blue-shirt, fascist, officers who spread propaganda that the Red Army cut off the ears, gouged out the eyes, and ripped open the stomachs of all captives. One soldier hit himself on his head with his fist and exclaimed, What a stupid head I have to believe such lies. Another captive laughed and remarked, If you beat your head for each lie our captain told us, you'll beat your brains out. I don't have to hit myself at all because I never believe that ghost talk, another declared. Our officers said we were being sent to the north to fight the Japanese devils. Only after we got into this wilderness did we know we were being sent to fight our own countrymen. I'm going to join the Red Army. Another soldier spoke up, I'll go with the Red Army until we get out of this savage country, then I'll go home. You'll never reach home, his comrades protested. You'll be grabbed and stuck back into Chiang Kai-shek's army before you're halfway home. How can you reach home without money? I'll beg my way home, and even if they grab me and stick me into Chiang's army again, I won't fight. When the time comes you can't be your own master. Your officer will shoot you in the back if you don't fight. That kind of talk makes me sick, the beleaguered soldier exclaimed. If I'm ever sent to fight the Reds again, I'll surrender my rifle again. Starving and fighting, the Red Army finally broke through the enemy fortifications on the Kansu border and poured down onto the Kansu plains. It was an army of ragged skeletons, with hundreds of men coughing their lungs out, yet it smashed one militarist division after another, seizing rice, uniforms, money, and medicine. By then Mao's column had only 20,000 men, perhaps the hardest, toughest, and most politically conscious veterans in the world. On October 20th, 1935, after many fierce battles with Utsungman's fascist troops, with Muslim and Manchurian armies, Mao's column finally reached North Shenzhen province and united with 10,000 Red Army partisans under Lu Tseitang, who had been fighting in this region since 1927. Su Haitung's regiment, left in the northwest by the 4th Front Red Army in 1934, had now grown to a division and was fighting in eastern Kansu. On October 6, 1936, one year later, Chu Tei led the other Red troops along almost the same route of march and made contact with Lin Piao's 1st Front Red Army in the district city of Huizhen in southern Kansu. On almost the same date, the young marshal, Chang Suliang, commander of the old Manchurian army which was driven out of Manchuria by the Japanese in. 1931, wired from Xi'an, Shenzhen, to Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, proposing a national united front with the Red Army against the Japanese. Chiang angrily rejected the proposal and ordered the young marshal to close down his new military political training school at Xi'an which, he charged, was filled with communists. Marshal Chang replied that his school accepted any man who loved and was willing to fight for his country. 
Generalissimo Cheng called an anti-red military conference in Luoyang in the north where he informed the assembled northwestern generals that China's chief enemies were not the Japanese but the traitorous red bandits. His crack commanders in Kansu, Generals Hu Tsung Man and Wang Chun, agreed with him, but the young marshal, who had already lost a number of regiments to the Red Army, had his own thoughts. During these events, the Japanese army was driving westward into Suiyuan province to encircle and lop off five North China provinces whose mines, railways, and other strategic industries were essential for Japan's planned conquest of all China. General Fu Tsui, governor of Suiyuan, began fighting, but an enraged nation knew his troops could hold out for only a short time. Thousands of North China students were pouring into Suiyuan to fight, but the three divisions which Chiang Kai-shek felt constrained to dispatch to Suiyuan never went near the front nor did they fire one shot at the Japanese. The Japanese drive, together with Chiang Kai-shek's new extermination campaign against the Red Army, had the appearance of a Japanese Kuomintang pincer movement not only against the Red Army, but also against the Manchurian troops under the young marshal, and the Shinsi Provincial Pacification Army under General Yang Huchen, which was allied with the Manchurian Army. Chiang interpreted the reluctance of these northwestern armies to fight the Red Army as nothing but poor discipline and leadership, a state which he decided to correct by calling a special anti-Red military conference in Xi'an on December 11th. Xi'an was the headquarters of the young marshal and also of General Yang. In preparation for the anti-Red extermination campaign, which was to follow the Xi'an conference, Chiang shipped new divisions into Kansu province in the northwest, together with enough rice, ammunition, money, and clothing for the entire campaign. Hundreds of armed secret police, with a radio transmission set, were also secretly dispatched to Xi'an to prepare for an armed uprising against the young marshal. Many national and international events convinced the embittered Chinese communists and other Chinese that an actual Kuomintang Japanese conspiracy existed against all anti-Japanese forces of the nation. The Tanku and Hoyumetsu agreements gave credence to this belief, as did a number of public statements by both Japanese and Nanking officials. Shortly after Mao Zedong's column reached northwest China, for example, the Japanese foreign minister, Koki Hirota, proposed a Tokyo Berlin Nanking anti-red pact to prevent the Bolshevization of Asia. Shortly afterward, Hirota made this statement before the Diet, the suppression of communist activities in our part of the globe and the liberation of China from the red menace is, therefore, a matter of vital importance not only for China but for the stabilization of East Asia and of the world. It is the desire of the Japanese government to cooperate with China in various ways for the eradication of communism. Hirota added that, much to Japan's regret, there was still student agitation in China which contravenes the very spirit of our program, but that it is expected that the present situation will soon be rectified by the Chinese authorities. Though the Nanking regime never signed the Tokyo Berlin anti comintern Pact of November 1936, still Chiang Kai-shek's foreign minister, General Chang Chun, repeatedly assured Japan that China was determined not to relinquish, even temporarily, her firm stand against the communists. In early 1935, General Chang Chun, known as one of the chief pro-Japanese leaders of China, had officially assured the Japanese government that his government appreciated its concern about communism in China because internal agitation in one country is bound to be felt by its neighbors, and that the Chinese government had waged a relentless struggle against the Red Menace until we are confident of the early liquidation of the whole trouble. Chiang Kai-shek's new anti-red extermination campaign was therefore undertaken, if not with direct Japanese cooperation, at least under the watchful eyes of their military and diplomatic representatives in Nanking and other major cities of China. Xi'an, headquarters of the young marshal, was the only strategic city in the country without Japanese observers. In Sichuan province the people attacked such Japanese. Kuomintang troops and the secret police prevented similar actions elsewhere. Thousands of Chinese patriots, including lawyers, bankers, and newspapermen, were being arrested, imprisoned, or killed by the Kuomintang as communists because they called for the end of civil war and the establishment of a united front against the Japanese. Such was the political and military situation into which General Chu Te led the red troops out of the Tibetan Chinese borderland into northwest China. The long march was being completed and the Red Army keeping its rendezvous with history. 
The meeting between General Chu Tei's forces and the 1st Front Red Army under Lin Piao's command was described by a young American physician, Dr. George Hatem, who went to the Red Army in the summer of 1936. Dr. Hatem, a graduate of medical schools in Switzerland and in Beirut, Syria, joined the Red Army Medical Corps and remained with it through all the momentous years that followed. In his letters and diaries, this American physician described how the 1st Front Red Army occupied six counties in Central and South Kansu to receive the advance of General Chu Tei's forces coming down out of the borderlands. Every household in the district city of Huizhen and all surrounding villages and towns set aside rooms to accommodate Chu Tei's troops, while the 1st Front Red Army transported food supplies and 40,000 new winter uniforms made in the Red Army Uniform Factory, to care for them. A peasant walked swiftly for four days to deliver the first letter from General Chu Tei to the 1st Front Red Army, then walked back with an answer. General Chu's vanguard division reached Huizhen on October 7, 1936, Dr. Hatem wrote, but passed on through to leave room for the troops behind them. Troops of the 4th Front Red Army with General Chu Tei and Chang Kuotao arrived on the 8th. The rest of the 4th Front Army arrived the next day, but the 2nd Front Red Army under Ho Long and Cao Keh, which had served as regards, arrived only on October 19th and 20th. These troops were in relatively good condition and excellently equipped, Dr. Hatem said. Since they had fought many battles on the way, each man was burdened with extra rifles, machine guns, and ammunition. There were so many men, however, that the 40,000 new winter uniforms were too few and others had to be prepared. Ho Long's ragged army received new uniforms only two months later. Dr. Hatem described General Chu Tei as thin as a ghost, but strong and tough, with a full growth of beard and clad in a lousy skin coat. Chu changed into a new winter uniform and coat, he added, but kept his beard until he reached Bowen in northwestern Shenzhen, where Mao Zedong had established the Soviet government and General Red Army headquarters. Dr. Hatem wrote in one letter, The most striking thing about Chu Tei is that he does not look like a military commander at all. He looks like the father of the Red Army. He has the most piercing eyes, he is slow to speak, quiet, and with a wonderful smile. He carries an automatic, and is a sharpshooter and a heavy smoker. He is fifty, but looks much older, and his face is deeply lined, yet his movements are vigorous and his health excellent. His headquarters is a bustling beehive with messengers and commanders coming and going, the phone ringing all the time and radiograms being sent and received. Chang Kuotao, the political commissar, is fat, tall and smooth. I wonder how he kept so fat while others lost every ounce of excess weight. Chu Tei had just stepped into his headquarters in Huizhen when Chen Kang, divisional commander in the 4th Front Red Army, telephoned him. Chu Tei became very excited. The reunion of the Red troops in the region was held in the late afternoon of the following day, to avoid bombings, which are daily. What a reunion! Men threw their arms around each other, laughing and weeping at the same time, or walking arm in arm and pouring out questions about other comrades. Chu Tei was completely swallowed up. A number of buses along the Siam Lanchao Highway had been captured and sent to transport the sick and wounded. The 4th Front Red Army were peasants who had never seen a bus before. They were afraid to ride in the thing. Though sick, they preferred to walk to the hospitals. At Siahokan on October 26, there was a great mass meeting of all red troops in the region. Lin Piao and other leaders gave a complete report on the Northwest, on the war between the Red and White Armies, and on the continued advance of Japanese armies into Suiyuan. Chiang Kai-shek had ten divisions under Generals Hu tsung Man and Wang Chun, fighting the Red Army in Kansu. For months, the Red troops had been appealing to these divisions to unite with them to fight the Japanese. Under orders of Chang, the young marshal, Chang Suliang, continued to order Tungpei, Manchurian, troops to fight the Red Army, but many had joined the Red Army instead, which now had a cavalry division made up entirely of former Tungpei cavalrymen. As early as October 20th, Mao Zedong had ordered the Red Army not to fight any Kuomintang troops unless in self-defense, but to intensify their United Front propaganda. He also ordered that no more Tungpei troops be accepted into the Red Army. 
By October 27th, the Red Army began drawing back before enemy forces while political workers posted United Front appeals everywhere. General Lutsungnen merely moved up more divisions against them. Dr. George Hatem's diary described the events that followed October 29th. News that four divisions of Hutsungnen are trying to surround us. We know their exact positions and plans. One of General Hu's cavalry commanders arrived at headquarters today to say he had orders to attack us at a certain place at 11 a.m. tomorrow morning. Since General Hu uses an airplane to watch his troops, this commander said he himself would have to make a show of fighting, but he advised us to pass through his region at 6 a.m., which gives us five hours leeway. This development forced us to change our plans and we began marching rapidly by day. Enemy planes found us and began bombing. They have destroyed many hamlets. October 30th Heard Chu Tay speak for the first time at the Red Army Military Academy. He speaks clearly and distinctly. He's enthusiastic and confident about the future. He advised the students to study night and day to meet the great tasks before China in the coming anti-Japanese war. Ho Long also spoke. What a pep talker he is. He has a voluminous and clear voice and speaks with many gestures, raising the fighting spirit of the lost, lethargic or weary person. November 1st. Went to Northwest Party Bureau, and Bureau read a copy of October 3rd issue of Ta Kung Pao from Tientsin, which says Red Army under Mao Tse Tung was disastrously defeated at Huizhen. At Huizhen, Chu Tei's forces concentrated without fighting. Mao Tse Tung was at Bowen, 1300 Li away at the time. November 3rd. Hid in cave during air raid with commanders of Tu Tung Pei. Regiments who came over to Red Army with their troops. Talked with them for three hours during the air raid. They and their troops want National United Front against the Japanese. Talked with their troops later, who are sad and depressed because the Red Army is sending them back to their own army to spread United Front principles. Heard Chu Tei speak to both regiments in a meeting on a hillside. Chu talked of urgent necessity for them to return and convert their comrades to anti-Japanese United Front. Chu is a very serious, convincing speaker, not dramatic. Organizes his ideas carefully and presents them slowly and clearly like a teacher, often repeating. Soldiers with wistful, sad faces gathered around him later. Chu Te is like a father. He loves all soldiers. November 9th, 10, 11. First, second, fourth Red Army commanders in daily meetings with Chu Te and staff. Chang's army is still concentrating against us, but we refuse to give up more territory. Momentous days before battle with many meetings of Red Army warriors to explain why we evaluated great regions in effort to preserve all troops for the anti-Japanese war and to win over enemy to United Front. General Wang Chun killed in airplane crash. We found his body. Chu Tei knew this fellow in Sichuan. November 23rd to 24th. The battle finished. The Red Army attacked at dusk when bombers could not come. A bitter cold wind from Ningxia Plains swept down. Fingers of Red fighters became so numb they could not pull triggers or even remove caps from hand grenades. So they launched bayonet charge. Many grabbed white soldiers and disarmed them, and others used their potato masher hand grenades as clubs, beating whites over the head with them. Red, Tumpei. Cavalry chased one white regiment which fled in wild disorder. Dead enemy soldiers litter the paths for miles around. I saw 150 dead whites piled up at one end of a valley, other hundreds in other places. Hundreds of whites fell into ravines and empty wells. We have spent a day pulling them out with ropes. Talked with captives who said they had been brought by rail from Hunan and told they were being sent to Sui Yuan to fight the Japanese. When taken off trains to fight the Red Army, they were promised double pay, but never got it. They say fascists permeate their ranks, driving them on, telling them lies about atrocities of Red Army. They are now being well-treated and educated, attending daily lectures and dramas and mingling with our troops. General Lutsungnen reforming his lines. December 3rd. I'm back at Bowen, headquarters of Soviet government and Red Army. 
Chu Te and Mao Tse Tung and staffs met and held long conferences. Hear men talking of Chang Kuo as the slick. These are the conditions under which the epic long march ended just two years, one month, and nineteen days after leaving Quaintian in Kianxi province. The reunited Red troops now numbered some 80,000 effectives, or about the combat strength of the Central Army when it left. Kianxi in October 1934 Gathered on the plains and mountains of the Northwest, it was a force unique in history. At Yan'an, which became Red Army headquarters on January 1, 1937, Chang Kuo-tao was finally brought to trial before the Central Committee of the party which he had helped found, but whose basic principles and policies he had violated. He and a few officers loyal to him defended themselves against the testimony of their own men, of Chu Te and Lu Pecheng, and other men of their staff whom he had taken prisoner. In this trial, General Chu Te made no mention of the treatment which he himself had received at the hands of Chang, but confined himself to Chang's violation of Red Army and party principles and policies. Suave and furtive, Chang apologized for his treatment to Chu Te and accepted the verdict of the trial, which was to study until he had rectified his mistakes. In the summer of 1938, after the anti-Japanese war began, a group of Kuomintang military men who visited Yan'an to confer on military problems smuggled Chang Kuo-tao to Hankou, where he joined the staff of General Tai Li, head of the Dread Blue Shirts, the secret police. While talking with General Chu about this incident, I once remarked that thousands of Chinese were actively helping the Japanese conquer China and that even one of the founders of the Communist Party had now joined the secret police to help hunt down Chinese progressives. General Chu replied that China is a semi-feudal country that had been a semi-colony under the major imperialist powers for a hundred years. During that century, he said, Chinese governments had been the sordid instruments of Western imperialism. Peking, Nanking, and Shanghai had been nurseries of traitorous plots to sell national interests to the highest bidders. China, he declared, certainly had more traitors than most countries in revolution, but this was because China was greater in extent and population. America also produced large numbers of traitors during your revolutionary war, he reminded me. Even if you were not taught about them in school, still large numbers of Americans actively served the British tyrants during your own war of liberation. Consider Franco and his henchmen who are selling Spain to Hitler and Mussolini. Consider the white Russians who sold out to the capitalist powers and fought their own people during the October Revolution. Look at India and Korea, look all over the world, and you will find men who are always willing to betray their own people for power and money. Our party has also had traitors. The Chinese Revolution is like a train that starts out on a long journey. Some men get off at side stations, others get on, but the vast majority will remain on until the train reaches its destination. Chang Kuo-tao followed a rightist opportunist policy which resulted in serious losses to our army. However, the correct leadership of our party and the political consciousness and loyalty of our troops led to the correction of his policies and to the strengthening of our army and party. Chang can cause the death of many more men, but he cannot turn the course of history. Our party and army will lead the revolution to a victory which will influence all oppressed colonial peoples as well as the people of the whole world. Book X, Rendezvous with History Chapter 33 Gloom Shrouds the Spring Day, Taihang Peaks Tower Fiercely. Loyal hearts shed no tears on these great heights. Strong wills demand a northern expedition. A hundred million new army menaces the enemy, ancient Shanxi has created many heroes. Three years I've given to hard fighting. We drink to the defeat of the dwarf devils. Chu Te when Chiang Kai-shek and his staff arrived in Xi'an on December 7, 1936, for the anti-red conference, Chiang established himself at the Lentung Sulphur Springs outside the city, while his staff put up at the Xi'an guesthouse within the city walls. The situation was what Chu Te would have called politically favorable. Before he could carry out another large-scale red extermination campaign, Chang would first have to control the Manchurian, Tumpei, army, which was determined to fight nothing less than the Japanese. To change this subversive trend, the Generalissimo would first have to rid himself of the young marshal, Chang Suliang, his deputy commander in the northwest, 
who for years had surrounded himself with young men who harbored dangerous thoughts about democracy and the necessity of driving the Japanese from Chinese soil. The young marshal and his staff were prepared for Chang. Instead of resuming the civil war, they had drawn up a plan for an anti-Japanese united front of all Chinese armies. Their program included the granting of civil rights to the Chinese people, the abrogation of all laws and restrictions on the anti-Japanese movement, the release of political prisoners, the realization of the last will and testament of Sun Yat-sen, and the formation of a national defense government of all parties, groups, and organizations. Instead of calling a general conference at which such plans could be presented and discussed, Generalissimo Chang summoned first one and then another high Manchurian officer to whom he offered rank and money if they would unseat the young marshal and lead their army against the communists. He had success with only one, a general who was soon assassinated by a young Manchurian officer. The others reminded the Generalissimo that the Japanese had occupied their homeland and killed their families, and that the Manchurian army wanted to fight the Japanese instead of their own countrymen. Chang remained adamant. At dawn on the morning of December 11th, therefore, Marshal Chang's troops went into action. The headquarters of Chang's secret police and of the Kuomintang, and the home of Xiao Li Zhu, Chang's governor of Shenxi, were raided, and every man in them arrested. The Xi'an guest house, in which Chang's staff was housed, was invaded and the officers hustled out of bed, shoved into motor cars, and driven to the young marshal's headquarters. While Xi'an resounded with machine guns and rifles, a young Manchurian officer led troops to Lintung where they shot down and killed Chiang Kai-shek's nephew, one of the most hated fascists of the country, as well as a number of his bodyguards. Chiang fled in his nightshirt, but was captured and taken into Xi'an to Marshal Chiang and General Yang Huqing. There the Generalissimo was assured that he was being forcibly detained that he might hear and discuss the demands of the anti-Japanese armies of the Northwest. Manchurian armies throughout the Northwest were simultaneously taking over all the ammunition, rice, and clothing dumps which Chang had built up for civil war. At the same time, the main Red Armies marched to within a few miles of Xi'an and drew a cordon across the province while Chu Tei and Mao Zedong took over and established headquarters at the small town of Yan'an in the north. Three days after Chang's kidnapping, as the Kuomintang and foreigners called his detention, a new military affairs council, to which all anti-Japanese armies, including the Red Army, were invited to send representatives, was established in Xi'an. The young marshal, who had seized 25 bombers and fighters assembled on the Xi'an airfield for the anti-Red campaign, sent one to bring Red Army representatives to the Military Affairs Council. Cho Enlai, chief of the Red Army delegation, thereafter joined in the enforced conference with Chang. The full story of the Xi'an incident has never been told, nor did the book which later appeared under Chang Kai-shek's name tell the facts. Despite denials, Chang agreed to end the civil war, which had already been brought to an end by the Xi'an incident, and to begin negotiations with the communists for the formation of a national united front against the Japanese invaders. Chang's detention set reactionaries of the whole world in motion. Japanese generals from Manchuria and North China immediately gathered in a secret military conference in Tientsin, undoubtedly to decide if the moment had come for the all-out occupation of China. Mussolini's daughter, whose husband had formerly been minister to China, sent frantic cables to the young marshal to release Chang, while American, British, and French diplomatic officials kept the wires hot with messages to their governments. American and Kuomintang broadcasters in China declared that General Chu Tei was in Xi'an, that red flags were flying from its walls, and that red armies were looting, slaughtering, and raping helpless girls and women north of the city. These developments, which threatened to bring China into the Axis fold, seemed the only possible explanation for the editorials in the Moscow press which condemned the arrest of Chiang Kai-shek as a Japanese-inspired plot, charges which aroused great hostility among the Manchurian troops. These charges, however, made clear to the communists that Moscow felt any action against Chiang would help the fascists. It was Chiang's own promise to prepare to defend China against Japanese imperialism that led to his release. To prove his own sincerity, on December 25th the young marshal released Chang and flew with him to Nanking. There the young marshal was brought to trial, sentenced to prison, and immediately pardoned and released. 
Chang, who regarded any affront to his person as a criminal offense, arrested the young marshal and imprisoned him in his own home in Chekiang province. From that date on the young marshal remained Chang Kaishek's personal prisoner. With Chang's release, the long and tortuous struggle for the organization of a national united front began. The young marshal's imprisonment demoralized the Manchurian army, which was soon split up by Chang and scattered over the country, some of its divisions later joining the communists. In mid-January, the extreme rightist general, Hu Tsungnan, took over Xi'an, and patriots fled in every direction, some to the Red Army and some to North China from which they had come, to continue the struggle. Yunnan now became the focal point of the anti-Japanese movement of the whole country. A living river of workers, students, professors, teachers, and cultural leaders soon began pouring to North Shenzhen, making great detours to avoid hostile Kuomintang armies who still declared that the Japanese are only a skin disease, while the communists are a disease of the heart. General Chu, Mao Zedong, and their staffs were in almost continuous conference in Yunnan. In February 1937, when Chou Enlai headed a communist delegation to Nanking, Chu and Mao, representing the Red Army and the Communist Party respectively, addressed a long telegram to the Central Committee of the Kuomintang, then in session in Nanking, in which they appealed for a national united front and offered to make important concessions provided the Kuomintang introduced democratic reforms throughout the country. If the United Front were formed, they wired, the Red Army would change its name and place itself under the general command of the Central Military Council, provided it were given the same treatment as other armies. In order to draw every element of the country into the anti-Japanese struggle, they offered to stop the confiscation of landlord estates and to transform the northwestern Soviet regions into a special administrative district administered by the communists, but under the direction of the central government. They declared their intention to carry out fully the principles and policies of Sun Yat-sen in this region. In return for these concessions, the Communist Party and the Red Army urged the Kuomintang to give the masses something worth fighting and dying for by restoring civil liberties to them. They should also release all political prisoners and grant the people the right to organize and arm themselves for the anti-Japanese struggle. However, it was months before the United Front began to take concrete form. Interpreting the communist offers as surrender, the Kuomintang tried to use the situation to destroy the Red Army, insisting that four of its seven divisions be disbanded and the other three reorganized into a new army. Staffed by Kuomintang officers The communists argued against the disbandment of any of their troops and suggested a brotherly exchange of officers between the Red and Kuomintang armies, a suggestion which caused the Kuomintang to drop the subject like a hot potato. Talking with me about these Kuomintang maneuvers, General Chu declared, our army would be destroyed and there would be no resistance to the Japanese at all if we accepted the Kuomintang proposals. Chang and his clique do not really want to fight the Japanese, yet Chang realizes that if he does not, he will be swept from the stage of history by our own and other anti-Japanese armies and by the Chinese people. Our army may have to accept subsidies and ammunition for only three of our divisions but we will not disband the other four because war with Japan will most certainly start soon and all manpower and national resources of the country must be mobilized for victory. The Kuomintang has refused us new guns of any caliber, and we will get no clothing, blankets, or medicine. At best, we will get ammunition and money for three divisions. After the war begins, however, all our troops will go to the front. We will root ourselves in the people as we have always done, and mobilize, train, arm, and educate them. We will survive and fight. Shortly after this conversation, a Kuomintang military delegation arrived in the northwest to inspect the Red Army, then came on to Yan'an, where I also had gone when the army of Hu Tsungnan took over Xi'an. During the week's stay of the Kuomintang military delegation in Yan'an, I saw General Chu in the role of host to generals and colonels who had fought him for ten years. Instead of the blunt, simple soldier I had learned to know, he now appeared with all the graces of the old social order, yet without any of its indirectness and obsequiousness. Through his graciousness ran a cold stream of dignity, gravity, and self-confidence. At the first breakfast of welcome to the Kuomintang officers, which I also attended, he welcomed them in these unadorned words.
This is a historic moment marking the end of a decade of bloody fratricide in which millions of the best sons and daughters of our country have died. Had this National United Front been formed years ago, China's manpower and natural resources would have been preserved, none of our territory would have been lost, and we would today be strong enough to meet the Japanese on equal terms. China is now entering a new era, and the Red Army and the Communist Party will do everything within their power to consolidate and maintain the United Front for the purpose of waging a war of national and racial survival. Some people still say China is too weak to fight Japan. It is not. We can mobilize, train, and arm our people in the midst of battle. The history of the Red Army proves this. We are not afraid of the Chinese people. Our people are good people and require only to be told about the causes and purposes of the war of resistance and help to solve the problems of their livelihood. When I asked General Chu later what the Red Army troops thought of the United Front, he spoke with the utmost frankness, our troops are workers and peasants. They are not intellectual, cultured men. Their ideology is Red Army ideology. As peasants and workers, they have hated landlords and militarists all their lives. They knew how to work before, but it is now very difficult for them to be called upon to work with every person willing to fight Japanese imperialism. To retrain them, we have called hundreds of cadres to Yan'an to pass through special training courses in Kanta, the Red Army College, on the principles and tactics of the United Front. After completing their courses, they will return to the Army and others will be trained. Our Army must be a model in carrying out the United Front. Until now our Chief Red Army Discipline has said, we are the sons of the workers and peasants, and the interests of the workers and peasants are ours. We must now say, we are the sons of the Chinese nation and the interests of the nation are our interests. We must teach our troops to realize that if China becomes a Japanese colony there will be neither a Kuomintang nor a Kumchantang, Communist Party, but only a nation of slaves. We must keep our eyes on the goal and not be diverted by intrigues or hostility from the right or from the infantile left. Yan'an was soon bursting at the seams with the thousands of youth who kept pouring in from every part of the country. New schools had to be organized to accommodate them. The North Shensi University, the Lu Sun Art Academy, and a special school at the Red Army Front near Xi'an were founded. Mao Zedong and Chu Te, like other leaders, somehow found time to lecture in the new schools, but General Chu still devoted most of his teaching time to Kanta. Yan'an was a small place unable to accommodate so many people. To solve the housing shortage, the Reds began excavating caves in the Lusk Cliffs up and down the valleys. Students who had never before done a stroke of physical labor now took up picks and shovels and, together with the troops, began transforming the whole region into a small city of cave dwellers. After the war began, Yan'an grew to a small city of 50,000 people. The hard shell of reaction began to crack here and there, and in April a party of Shanghai printers, with a new printing press, arrived on Red Army trucks from Xi'an. The new China Daily, poorly printed until then, appeared in a new dress, and on April 20th the Emancipation Daily, central organ of the Communist Party, made its bow to the world. The leading article in the new Emancipation Daily was on the Spanish Civil War. Written by Chu Te, it was, like many of his chief articles, historical. Following an account of Spain's long struggle for democracy, he wrote, There are around 100,000 Italian and German fascists fighting in Spain today. Spain is not only fighting for her own independence, but is fighting to prevent Western Europe from falling into German and Italian hands. The Spanish people have the support of international democratic forces, American, German, French, British, Italian, Polish, Russian, and other volunteers. Many people believe that China will also have a civil war like that in Spain, but there will be no such civil war because we have a united front for war against Japan. Anyone who wants to stir up civil war in China is merely helping the Japanese. The special administrative, or Yan'an, border region, into which the old Soviet region had been transformed, was the only place in China that voiced support for Republican Spain. Posters sent to China by the Spanish Republican government soon plastered the walls of Shenzi towns and villages. Chapter 34 When Japanese imperialism began its attempted conquest of China by striking at the 29th Root Army near Peking on July 7, 
1937, the United Front had still not been consolidated, and Chiang Kai-shek had still not made up his mind to fight. Despite this, the Special Administrative Border Region was put on a war footing, and within 24 hours the commanders who had been studying in Kanta began marching southward to rejoin their troops, while other hundreds left their units and marched to Yan'an. Ten days after Japan began the invasion of China, Chiang Kai-shek finally issued a proclamation calling for resistance and stating that there could be no turning back. By then the Japanese had occupied Hopiai province and were pouring into northwest China. By August 13th their armies began the campaign which led to the fall of Shanghai and, by December, of Nanking. Only at Shanghai did Chiang Kai-shek's armies really begin to fight, and only when Nanking was menaced did the Kuomintang agree to active cooperation with the Red Army. On August 9th, General Chu Te and Cho Enlai, with a group of Red Army and Communist Party representatives, flew to Nanking for a conference of the National Military Defense Council. On September 6th, three divisions of the Red Army were reorganized into the National Revolutionary Eighth Root Army, with General Chu Te as Commander-in-Chief and Peng Te Huai as Vice Commander. Not one new gun was given the three divisions, the 115th, 120th, and the 129th, and the only medical supplies issued to them consisted of three pounds of iodine crystals and two pounds of aspirin tablets. They were, however, supplied with ammunition and money for three divisions. These three divisions, 45,000 men strong, left at once for the front in Shanxi province. They still wore their old Red Army uniforms and caps. Not even one blanket had been issued them. One of Chiang Kai-shek's lieutenants later remarked cynically to me, the Reds boasted that they captured all their guns and supplies from us in the past. Let them do the same with the Japanese. One month after the 8th Root Army left for the front, I joined General Chu Tei's headquarters in the Wutai Mountains in northeastern Shanxi, which by then was in the Japanese rear. On September 25th and 26th, the 115th Division under Lin Piao's command had fought and won the first Chinese victory over the Japanese at the Great Wall Pass, Pingxinquan. During all this time, Communist representatives in Nanking were urging Chiang Kai-shek to permit them to assemble all the old Red Army guerrillas which had been left in Kiangxi and Fukien provinces when the main Red Army went on the long march. However, it was not until Nanking fell to the Japanese and 200,000 civilians and captive soldiers were slaughtered that the Minister of War issued an order to these guerrillas to concentrate along the lower reaches of the Yangtze to be reorganized into the new 4th Army. As these emaciated, ragged and battered peasants marched from the mountains of the old Soviet districts, landlords and their men Tuan waylaid them, sniping and killing wherever possible. With gnawing bitterness, Xiang Ying and Chen Yi, their commanders, ordered that not one shot be fired in return, and that the columns march at night through dangerous areas. The new 4th Army, numbering 11,000 men, assembled in South An Wei in April 1938 and was placed under the command of General Ye Ting, with Xiang Ying as vice commander. Chen Yi was commander of a division which left at once to penetrate the Nanking area. The whole army was assigned a fighting zone about 50 miles wide and 150 miles long, directly along the banks of the Yangtze. The war ministry had planned things beautifully. The new 4th Army was ordered not to leave its zone even for maneuvering operations against the Japanese. In their rear, in the Nanking area, was stationed an army made up of the same terrorist bands of Shanghai and Nanking gangsters which had once been used to exterminate villages in Soviet territory. These gangsters, whose supreme commander was General Tai Li, chief of the Kuomintang secret police, were excellently equipped and provisioned, and assigned the task of hemming in the new 4th Army and driving it directly against Japanese columns. There was no doubt in the minds of informed Chinese and foreigners that the Kuomintang expected the Japanese to achieve what they themselves had been unable to do, exterminate the 8th Root and new 4th Armies. When I arrived at General Chu Tei's headquarters in the Wutai Mountains in late October 1937, the Japanese were already driving on Tai Yuenfu, the provincial capital, from two directions, through the mountains from the north, and from the east along the branch railway which ran from Shichaichwang up through deep gorges to the capital. Kuomintang and provincial armies were holding the Japanese on the northern front, 
Tumpei, and other Kuomintang divisions, with the 129th Division of the 8th Root Army, were holding them on the east. The other two divisions of the 8th Root Army were using mobile and guerrilla tactics in the enemy rear. Ho Long's 120th Division was ranging far and wide in North Shanxi while regiments of Lin Piao's 115th Division were campaigning through northeastern Shanxi and eastern Hopiai provinces, where they had already driven the enemy from a number of occupied district cities and even attacked the Peking Fanko Railway. Like all the Kuomintang forces, the old warlord governor of Shanxi, Yin Shishan, would not permit the people to be organized and armed unless they were already in enemy-occupied territory. The 8th Root Army, which operated in enemy-occupied territory, was therefore organizing, training, and arming the people on the same pattern that had proved so powerful in South China during the Civil War years. Peasants, workers, merchants, women, youth, and children's organizations had been founded. The older men in villages and towns were being organized into local self-defense corps. Able-bodied young men, formed into anti-Japanese guerrilla detachments, were fighting as auxiliaries of the 8th Root Army. Armed with captured rifles, these detachments were the reservoir from which the 8th Root replenished its losses. General Chu Tei's headquarters in the Wutai Mountains was in a large white building, formerly a landlord's home, where two Chinese newspapermen and I found him sitting on a stool while a barber shaved his head clean. He waved and shouted the greeting, and later led us into a room papered with great military maps that stretched from floor to rafters. After pointing out Japanese and Chinese positions, he explained 8th Root strategy and tactics. Strategically, we aim at sustained warfare and at the attrition of the enemy's fighting power and supplies. Tactically, we fight quick battles of annihilation. Because we are militarily weaker than the enemy, we always avoid positional battles, but engage in combined mobile and guerrilla warfare to destroy the vital forces of the enemy while at the same time we develop guerrilla warfare to confuse, distract disperse and exhaust the enemy our guerrilla warfare creates such difficulties for the enemy that our regulars can launch mobile attacks under favorable circumstances he explained future plans our plan is to establish many regional mountain strongholds in the enemy rear throughout north and northwest china such as this one in the wutai mountains where the enemy's mechanized forces cannot operate our regulars can return to such bases for rest, replenishment, and retraining, guerrilla forces and the masses can be trained in them, and small arsenals, schools, hospitals, cooperative and regional administrative organs centered there. From these strongholds, we can emerge to attack Japanese garrisons, forts, strategic points, ammunition dumps, communication lines, railways. After destroying such objectives, our troops can disappear and strike elsewhere. We will consolidate and use these strongholds to enlarge our fields of operation until our defensive strategy can be turned into a strategic offensive. Chiang Kai-shek has agreed to this plan and the Wutai regional base is being organized with his permission. As we talked, General Peng Tehuai entered. Generally a grim, dour man, he was now very gay as he told us of hourly reports of small victories over a vast territory in the enemy rear. General Chu listened with narrowed eyes, his shabby cap with its faded red star shoved back on his newly shaved head. You must investigate our methods of mass mobilization and training, General Peng exclaimed, with a happy wave of his hand. The people are like the sea, and we are like the fish swimming through it. This is a national revolutionary war. Victory will depend on the courage, self-confidence, and fighting power of our troops and on. Brotherly relations between commanders and fighters, and on our close cooperation with other Chinese armies. We are carrying on intensive political work among our troops and the people. The people have rallied to us to the last man, woman, and child. General Peng braced his hands on the table and continued, You'll find a lot of inspiring slogans and posters, of course, but of greater importance is the gradual process of educating our troops, the guerrillas, and the people. Our aim is to develop deep national consciousness and to educate and inform our troops and the people about the condition and designs of the enemy. Everyone must realize that victory cannot be had for nothing. The war has only begun. General Chu's eyes remain narrow, tense points as he replied, true. But the Kuomintang armies must also make many changes. 
Kuomintang officers still curse and beat their soldiers, they enforce unreasonable obedience. These are feudal practices. They must be replaced by friendship, mutual respect, confidence, and help. Sorrows and happiness must be shared by all. Living conditions of officers and soldiers should be approximately equal so everyone can take part in the war wholeheartedly. Will all that be done? I inquired skeptically, and the ever-optimistic Chu Tei answered, It will take time. Our army must be the model. As the war continues, the Kuomintang armies will have to reform or be defeated. Why are so many Chinese puppets fighting in the Japanese army? Why do the Japanese boast that they will conquer China with Chinese? Why? Because the Kuomintang has done nothing to wipe out feudal conditions in the country and feudal practices in the armies. We must convince the Kuomintang, and we must win over the puppet troops. Chu and Peng told us of the destruction by Lin Piao's division of one Japanese brigade at Pingxinquan, and of other battles in which the Japanese never surrendered unless wounded. Even the wounded pretended to be dead, they said, and when 8th root stretcher bearers bent over them, they sprang up and killed on the spot. When Ho Long's troops destroyed enemy transport columns, the Japanese clung to the trucks until cut off. Searching the pockets of the Japanese dead, Ho Long's troops had found a number of anti-war handbills signed by the Japanese Communist Party and the Japanese Anti-Fascist League. General Chu became excited when he talked of these handbills. Perhaps we have been killing our own comrades, he exclaimed. But we can do nothing else. Our troops must now learn enough Japanese to shout to the Japanese soldiers that we do not kill captives. Enemy soldiers are taught by their officers that we torture and kill all captives. General Chu placed one of the handbills, already translated into Chinese, before us. A part of it read, Pity those 200,000 brothers who died during and after the Manchurian incident. For whom? For what? For the militarists, for the ambition and avarice of our own militarists. Shall we? Play into their hands once more, dear comrades in arms. Demand that the militarists give back the lives of our brothers. We must arise and turn our guns against our real enemies, the militarists and financial magnates. Only by beating them down can we achieve permanent and genuine peace in the Far East. Even before these handbills were taken from the pockets of the Japanese dead, a branch of the political department of the 8th Root Army had been engaged in propaganda work with the enemy. This enemy work department, directed by men who knew the Japanese language, was now ordered to develop their work swiftly and to start teaching the Japanese language to the troops, activities which eventually spread throughout the 8th Root and New 4th Armies. While talking about Japanese soldiers, General Chu exclaimed with cold hatred, the Japanese prefer death to capture, but their desperate fighting is not mere bravery. It is guilt and fear. They have killed so many of our people and outraged so many women and girls that they are afraid to be captured by us. They openly boast of their slaughter battles. They believe we will torture and kill them as they torture and kill Chinese soldiers who fall into their hands. From now on we will make a special point of capturing Japanese. On the evening following this conversation, General Chu received orders to move at once to the Branch Chengtai Railway to the south where the Japanese who had broken through were marching on Tiyuanfu. The light burned in his headquarters throughout that night, and at dawn we were marching southward over the dry, forbidding ranges of eastern Shanxi. Ho Long's division remained in North Shanxi, while General Ni Yunchen, one of the administrative geniuses of the 8th Root Army, remained with two battalions of the 115th Division in the Wutai Mountains which he eventually developed into the powerful Chen Cha Chi stronghold in the enemy rear. The rest of the army moved with Chu Tei's headquarters and crossed the Chengtai Railway just as the Japanese 20th Division, preceded by planes, began pouring through the gorges from the east. In the first three days of November, the 115th Division of the 8th Root Army, joined by the 129th Division which had just inflicted losses on the Japanese column, began a running battle against the enemy division. The first two uninjured Japanese were captured in this battle, one a radio operator, one an infantry captain. 
a column of over 400 pack horses laden with supplies of every kind, including food, medicine, ammunition, and winter overcoats, was lopped off. A group of 30 Manchurian peasants who had been conscripted to care for the pack animals were also captured. These operations, however, did not prevent the Japanese from occupying Tiyuanfu on November 13th. After that, General Chu left the 129th Division in the railway region to prevent the Japanese from consolidating their power, while General Headquarters and the 115th Division marched southward through Shanxi, slogging through freezing rains and a soggy snowstorm, and halting in villages and towns to hold mass meetings. Everywhere organizers were left behind to transform the interior of the province into a base of Chinese resistance. In one town, where the two Japanese captives were presented as speakers, pandemonium broke loose and hoarse voices shouted, Kill the devils! Eighth root speakers were still trying to silence the crowd when cries of Chu Tei. Chu Tei sounded, and General Chu strode to the platform where the magistrate, who was presiding, stepped forward and said, We have all heard of Chu Tei for many years. He is here in the flesh, and he needs no introduction from me. General Chu first spoke on the role of the people in the War of Resistance. This done, he asked the people to realize that the Japanese soldiers were workers and peasants who had been conscripted and sent to China by the Japanese warlords and financial magnates. The Japanese people had not made this war, he said, and large numbers of Japanese anti-fascists had already been imprisoned or killed for opposing it. The 8th Root Army intended to capture, educate, and train Japanese soldiers to fight their own rapacious ruling classes and to help China win the war. This was the first time the people in these regions had ever heard such ideas. One of the Japanese captives, the radio operator, stepped to the front of the platform and said, I am a soldier, but I am also a worker. The Japanese militarists want this war, but the Japanese people do not. I was conscripted against my will and sent to your country, but until I was captured I did not know the Chinese people could be so kind. In the future I intend to stand side by side with the Chinese people. General Chu Tei later told me of the insolent attitude of the Japanese captain after his capture. Lin Piao had gone into a village hut where the man was held, but the captain remained seated and ordered Lin to provide him with chicken, eggs, and rice to eat. In a cold, level voice, Lin replied, Do not misunderstand the kindness with which we treat you. It does not mean that we are your inferiors. We serve you rice while we ourselves eat millet. I hear that you struck a peasant who came to look at you. We won't kill you for this, but if you ever strike a Chinese again, we will whip you in public. General Chu's lips tightened and his eyes became hard points as he told this story. We made the fellow walk until today, he said. Today, I gave him my horse to ride, also a box of captured Japanese cigarettes. He was embarrassed, but took them. He will learn. General Chu also gave me a copy of an order to all 8th Root Army troops which he and Peng Taihui had just issued. It read, Japanese soldiers are the sons and brothers of the toiling Japanese masses. Under the deception and coercion of Japanese warlords and financial oligarchs, they have been forced to fight against us. Therefore, one, any kind of injury or insult toward Japanese captives is strictly forbidden, and no confiscation or damage to their personal possessions is allowed. Commanders and rank-and-file fighters of our army who disobey this order will be punished. Two, special care and proper medical treatment shall be given to all sick or wounded Japanese captives. Three, all possible conveniences shall be given to help Japanese captives who wish to return to their country or to their original troops. 4. Those Japanese captives who wish to remain in China or to work for the Chinese army shall be given proper work, while those wishing to study shall be helped to enter a suitable school. 5. Facilities shall be given to those who wish to correspond with their families or friends. 6. Japanese soldiers killed in battle shall be buried and a proper headstone or board erected over their graves. General Chu explained point 3 of this order, if we allow Japanese captives to return to their troops we will destroy the propaganda lies of their officers that we torture and kill captives. We showed that order to the two Japanese captives. 
They told us of a Japanese military law which states that no Japanese taken captive in battle shall be allowed to return to his country, while one who returns to his army after capture shall be shot. Despite this, any Japanese captive who wants to return to his original troops will be allowed to do so. If his officers kill him, it will merely arouse unrest among their troops. The time will come when Japanese soldiers will surrender to us without fighting or desert and join us. A few days later, I heard General Chu talking to the Japanese captain whom he had just given some flaky biscuits bought in a village. The captain bowed his thanks, ate the biscuits thoughtfully, and began to talk. There ought to be an international movement to change the present method of settling affairs. Here we are, Chinese and Japanese, and one American, all quite friendly. You are now marching with such a movement, that is why you are alive, General Chu replied. There are men in your own army who are also a part of that movement. We have taken anti-war leaflets from their pockets on the battlefield. I have heard nothing of such leaflets, the captain exclaimed. You were an officer. The time will come when Japanese soldiers will help us defeat Japanese warlords. It's not so easy to defeat the Japanese army, the captain remarked dryly. Yet it will be done. General Chu retorted. Marching through slush, speaking at mass meetings, at small conferences of Communist Party branches, General Chu finally led his troops into the Hongtong region of South Shanxi where some rested and studied while others moved to the west of Tianfu, where the Japanese had established positions. The dry wheat fields around General Chu's headquarters were soon dark from morning to night with a harvest of tall, strong peasant volunteers under training. Sitting in General Chu Tay's headquarters one night, sipping American coffee, we talked of everything and nothing. I had been on a trip to General Wei Li Wong's headquarters at Lintung, and upon my return found that a New Zealand journalist, James Bertram, and a United States Marine Intelligence Officer, Evans F. Carlson, had arrived at headquarters. Carlson had brought the coffee. Bertram passed on to the front and Carlson now sat sipping coffee from an enamel cup and listening to our talk. I was telling of an air raid on Lintung while I was talking with the Kuomintang general. We ran across a drill field to a cave just as the planes came back the second time, I said. Who reached the cave first, one of General Chu's staff inquired politely. And who left at last? Was it General Wei? I must say that General Wei's staff is more stylish than you fellows. I remarked. They wear fine woolen khaki uniforms, high leather boots polished like mirrors, officers' belts, and insignia of rank. They have fur caps and winter overcoats with fur collars. They may be more stylish than us, but we are more important. General Chu remarked, grinning. The Japanese pay more attention to us. They have just posted proclamations on the walls of Taiyuan and other places offering rewards for any information about us or for any document issued by us. They say they've come to China just to exterminate us. Are you going to read that copy of the New Testament sent you by that foreign missionary in Hong Kong? I asked him. For an old missionary had indeed sent him a copy of the New Testament in Chinese, and in return General Chu had sent him a copy of what is fascism? I read everything. General Chu speculated. Who'd ever think I'd be exchanging gifts with a missionary? I hear his Bible school has sent out some converts to turn our troops into Christians. They did. I replied. They even tried to convert me and were angry when I wouldn't be converted. We'll see who converts whom. General Chu remarked laconically. Who converted whom was right? On January 14, 1938, Dr. Walter Judd, subsequently a leading United States congressman but then medical missionary at Fongyang, Shanxi, wrote a medical missionary friend of his in Hankow, who in turn passed the letter on to me. Judd wrote, Most people believe that Yan Shishan has made a deal with the Japanese. In fact, the vice commander of the army told me in person while I was treating his venereal disease six days ago that there would be no more fighting here, that China's strength was too small now, too shattered, and there would have to be a political settlement. I know the leaders of the Shanxi troops feel that way, the officers believe in a political peace, but the soldiers don't, and I know the 8th Root Army is not party to any deal with the Japanese. 
They are organizing the countryside, especially in the mountains, preparing to make their own clothes, etc., so as to be self-sufficient for as many years as necessary to wear the enemy out. Fully half of the students in our mission school have joined up with the 8th Root Army. Several of our preachers and teachers have also joined. They have left $30 and $70 a month jobs to get $10 jobs, and they are bursting with enthusiasm and devotion about it. I wonder often why we can't succeed in capturing the imagination of Chinese for this work in the churches. It was precisely that sort of vision and devotion which the missionary challenge meant to me. But I have been singularly unable to arouse in my colleagues that which it meant to me. I suspect a large part of the reason for our failure is because we haven't asked our church converts to sacrifice enough. They've had too soft and easy a job. We haven't demanded their all, as the 8th Root Army does. Yin Shishan invited the 8th Root into Shanxi because he thought he could hold the Japanese off indefinitely and the 8th Root would be as lukewarm or worse toward Nanking as he was and, in the settlement after the Japanese were smashed, they would be satisfied with what he would give them as their share. Now he finds he's got the Japanese as his masters, and he must get the most out of them that he can. The eighth route has become a decided embarrassment to him. Most people here think it will transpire that his present trip to Hankow is a go-between for the Japanese, the Japs promising generous treatment for the central government, etc., if they will break loose from the eighth route and accept most of what the Japanese have seized in the north, the Shanghai customs, etc., it is interesting that when the Japs occupied Taiku, they occupied and looted every house except the home of H. H. Kung, which was promptly sealed by the Economic Cooperation Gang, and protected even from Japanese troops. Dr. Judd made one mistake in his letter. His converts had not deserted him $4.10 a month. They had deserted him for 50 cents or less a month, and sometimes not even that. Chu Tei's salary at the time was $3 a month, but he didn't get it, because all money received from the Chinese government was being spread over all seven divisions of the 8th Root Army. 8th Root Army officers had been allowed the same salaries as Kuomintang officers, and the troops likewise. All this money was pooled to provide food and clothing for everyone. A man with 10 cents in his pocket was regarded as practically a rich man. Evans F. Carlson, a captain in the United States Marine Corps at the time, looked on this passing scene with growing amazement and regarded General Chu Tei with something approaching awe. For years he had heard of Chu as a bandit, but when he met him in the flesh, and after he had studied the practices and educational system of the army, he exclaimed to me, up to this time, the only practicing Christian I ever knew was my own father, a congregational minister. Chu Tei is the second practicing Christian. Chu Tei's no Christian. I protested. I don't mean one of those. Him singing, Grace saying Christians. Carlson replied. I mean one who devotes himself to freeing and protecting the poor and the oppressed, who practices brotherly love instead of grabbing as much as possible for himself. Carlson's remarks led to many discussions which were never finished because the end of 1937 had come and the Japanese had begun a new offensive to occupy all Shanxi and to wipe out the 8th Root Army. Carlson left with 8th Root troops for the Wutai Mountains. I left for Hankow to collect medical supplies, clothing, and money for the 8th Root Army and the Northwestern guerrillas, and General Chu Tei led two regiments and detachments of new recruits eastward into the Taihang Mountains to help Kuomintang troops stop advancing Japanese divisions. Chapter 35 Ian A Savage Offensive In the early months of 1938, the Japanese occupied the main cities of Shanxi and drove Kuomintang armies either across the Yellow River or into pockets on the borders of the province. Six enemy columns, marching by different routes, converged simultaneously on the 8th Root Army stronghold in the Wutai Mountains. There they bogged down and gradually advanced into northwestern Shanxi where Ho Long's 120th Division had established another guerrilla base in the mountains on the shanxi Yuan border. In this same offensive, a part of Lin Piao's 115th Division, reinforced by local partisans and with regulars from Yunnan, fought fiercely in western Shanxi to prevent the Japanese from reaching the Yellow River and crossing into the Yunnan border region. Lin Piao himself was dangerously wounded in this campaign. It was in this offensive that General Chu Tei, 
over the protests of many of his comrades, took personal command of the two regiments and of detachments of new recruits, helped them against the Japanese in the Taihang Mountains, and barely escaped death in a number of fierce battles. Preceded by bombers and fighters which ranged the skies from dawn to dusk, the Japanese finally broke through, occupied all walled cities in South Shanxi, and began patrolling all major highways and railways through the province. They held the main cities. The Eighth Root Army and peasant partisans held onto the countryside and devoted themselves to tearing up railways, destroying bridges, and waylaying enemy trucks along the highways. Eleven counties in southeastern Shanxi which fell to the enemy during this offensive were recaptured by General Chu's forces by mid-1938. A new mountain stronghold in the enemy rear was established in the Taihang Mountains on the shanxi Honan border, where the chief administrator was a professor from Peking National University. An Australian nurse, who had made her way to General Chu's headquarters, returned to Hankow, the temporary national capital on the Yangtze, with grisly tales. General Chu's headquarters, she said, was in a town in a broad valley in eastern Shanxi. To reach it she had passed through hundreds of villages which had been bombed and burned by the Japanese. She had seen thousands of new shallow graves and countless unburied corpses. Survivors in the villages were crawling about in the debris of their homes, tending relatives or neighbors who were dying. The 8th Root Troops were sharing such food as they had with the people, but they also had little, and the field hospital near General Chu's headquarters was jammed with sick and wounded army men and civilians. General Chu Tei had given this nurse freedom to work where she wished. He had given her such medicine as his hospital could spare, and had sent a bodyguard to help her. She had worked in villages until her body also became bloated with beriberi. Then she left for Hankow to save her own life. This same terrible period inspired. General Chu Tei to jot down a few short poems in his notebook, which he later sent me. One of them read, I draw on my horse on Taihangshan. White winter snows are flying. Fighters shiver in thin coats, night after night killing dwarf bandits. In midsummer, 1938, General Chu passed through the Japanese lines to the west, crossed the rolling Yellow River with its cliffs shrouded in clouds, and rode on to Yan'an to report on one year of war of the 8th Root Army against the Japanese. This report was delivered to the 6th Plenary Session of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, of which he was a member, that autumn. The report stated that in the first year of war the 8th Root Army had suffered 25,000 casualties, about one-third of them killed. Of these, 7,000 had been members of the Communist Party. By that time, 8th Root troops were operating across all North China from the mountains of Shenzi to the Yellow Sea, and from the Yellow River in the south up into Jihol province of Inner Mongolia where they had founded another mountain stronghold and were coordinating their operations with the Manchurian volunteers. They had even raided Sinan, capital of Shantung, and had attacked the coal mines and power plant that serviced Peking. Students and some professors from the American Missionary University at Yenching, six miles from Peking, were working with 8th Root guerrillas, and many Yenching graduates had joined them straight from the university. Before the war ended, 700 Yenching graduates had joined the 8th Root Army. In his report, General Chu stated that the activities of the 8th Root Army and the civilian guerrillas in the north had prevented the Japanese from crossing the Yellow River and moving southward against Kuomintang armies. The Japanese had been forced to halt to divert troops to guard their lines of communication and convoys, to drive away attackers, repair roads, railways, and bridges. They had also begun building forts as the Kuomintang had done during the decade of civil war, and had begun pacifying the population by wholesale massacres. As he had proposed in conferences in Nanking when the war began, General Chu again advocated a national strategy and the adoption of tactics based on China's strong points and the enemy's weak points. China, he declared, could not defend itself by remaining rooted in positions and waiting to be blown out by the enemy. Instead, all Chinese armies should choose favorable terrain and timing and avoid any engagement on equal terms with the more powerfully equipped enemy. Though the 8th Root Army had suffered heavy casualties, enemy losses had been 34,000. 
Enemy captives, most of them Chinese puppets, totaled 2094 men, while 1366 Manchurian soldiers who had been conscripted and inducted into the Japanese army had gone over to the 8th Route Army with all their Japanese equipment. Considering the poor equipment with which the 8th Route Army went into the war, its captured war trophies were impressive. These included 6387 rifles, 171 light machine guns, 84 heavy machine guns, 72 field pieces, 25 mortars, 190 motor cars, 847 trucks, 4 radio sets, 6 radio speakers, 19 telephone sets, and 9 field glasses. There were also 5 cases of poison gas. The Japanese considered all means justified in fighting the 8th Route Army. The army had also destroyed 24 enemy planes on an airfield in North Shanxi, for which Chiang Kai-shek had rewarded it with $20,000, also five enemy tanks, five armored cars, and 901 motor cars and trucks. By the end of 1937, while I was with General Chu's headquarters, thousands of 8th Route Army troops were already wearing captured Japanese overcoats. As the 8th Route Army increased its strength and spread its influence across all North China, alarm spread and grew among Kuomintang reactionaries. When the news reached Hankou that the 8th Route Army had introduced changes in all regions liberated from the enemy, the old cry of the communist menace began to sound. In every liberated area of the North and Northwest, all men and women over 18 were given full suffrage rights. They elected their own village and town administrative organs to take the place of the old Kuomintang officials who had either fled before the Japanese or had joined them and headed local puppet governments. Since most traders were big landlords, the peasants had confiscated and divided their land in the liberated areas. The peasants were also cultivating the estates of landlords who had fled but had not turned traitor. Such land was not confiscated, but the peasants had no intention of paying rent to men who had fled from the enemy. With these developments in mind, General Chu said, the central government should spare no effort to improve the people's livelihood so as to enlist the people's material support and mobilize manpower. The government should also encourage and aid patriotic organizations and activities and organize the masses to participate in the war directly or indirectly. After one year of war, during which the Chinese government had released political prisoners and allowed some degree of liberty to the people in the territory it controlled, there were serious signs that the reactionaries were again coming to the top. Premier Wang Qingwei, supported by large numbers of followers, had been ringing the alarm bell of communist banditry and urging the government to accept Japanese peace terms. The reactionary C, C, clique within the Kuomintang also campaigned against, and prevented, the organizing and arming of the people. If the war continued, Wang Qingwei warned, the Kuomintang would lose China to the communists. Knowing that he would be swept into limbo if he surrendered to the Japanese, Chiang Kai-shek rejected all enemy peace proposals. He was as fearful of his red allies as Wang. During the summer of 1938, for instance, Chiang dispatched a special army with appointed Kuomintang officials into North China to take over areas liberated by the 8th Route Army. At the same time, Kuomintang troops along the Yellow River began raiding the liberated areas. Other Kuomintang troops in western Suiyuan province on the northern frontier of the Yunnan border region began making truces and alliances with the Japanese for joint attacks on the 8th Route Army. In mid-October 1938, while the Japanese armies were converging on Hankou, General Chu Tei flew to the capital for a conference with the National Military Defense Council where he warned against all such activities and pleaded for the introduction of democratic reforms throughout the country. Only such reforms, he urged, could improve the livelihood of the people and give them something to fight for, and if necessary, to die for. In support of his arguments, he reported on the achievements of the 8th Route Army which had turned the North into a bulwark against enemy exploitation. The elected village and town councils were fully democratic, he argued, and the communists had restricted communist participation in elected bodies to no more than one-third. General Chu had no success whatever, yet he still assured the government that the 8th Root Army, as well as its younger brother, the new 4th Army fighting along the lower Yangtze, would maintain the united front and do everything within their power to develop close and brotherly relations with Kuomintang armies. 
Two months after the Japanese occupied Hankou on October 25th, Premier Wang Qingwei and a number of his followers mysteriously left Chongqing by plane for Indochina. From there he made the jump to Shanghai and the Japanese. In March 1939, Wang headed the Japanese puppet government at Nanking which announced its purpose to be the extermination of communism. In an article published in the Yunnan Press on July 18, 1939, General Chu Tei described the growing power of Kuomintang reaction and the twin dangers of civil war and surrender to the Japanese. From the time Hankow fell to the Japanese in late 1938, we realized that powerful cliques within the Kuomintang were preparing the way for surrender by splitting the National United Front and resuming civil war. We have documents proving that three Kuomintang armies in southeastern Shanxi, South Hopiai, and western Shantung have formed what they call an interprovincial joint defense agreement against the 8th Root Army. One of these armies, commanded by General Lu Chenglin, was sent by Chiang Kai-shek to take over areas which we had liberated from the enemy. It entered one of our liberated areas, where it disbanded all local administrative organs and installed old feudal officials who had fled before the Japanese in 1937. It also surrounded, disarmed, and disbanded the local people's forces, and replaced them with a peace preservation corps whose function was to suppress the anti-Japanese and democratic activities of the people. Reforms which we had introduced, such as reduced rent and the abolition of usury, were declared illegal and old as well as new taxes imposed on the people. Villagers were again conscripted by press gangs, and only those able to pay General Lu $3,000 can buy themselves off. These activities went hand in hand with the progressive suppression of the people's activities in all territory controlled by Chongqing. All publications and organizations not directly under Kuomintang control were suppressed, concentration camps founded, and even the new industrial cooperatives were regarded as potentially subversive because they were jointly owned by those who worked in them. One Kuomintang politician told me that the communists had a network of cooperatives in the north, and that cooperatives must therefore be communist institutions. Such institutions, he said, might be useful during the war, but would be a danger afterwards because the workers would become so independent that they would not return to the old factories. Until March 1939, the communists desperately tried to smooth over all incidents threatening a renewal of civil war. In late March, however, in the dead of night, Kuomintang troops fell upon a transport station of the new 4th Army in Hunan province and buried every man in it alive. Abandoning their former reserve, Mao Zedong and Chu Tei wired Chongqing and released their wire to the press, disclosing the full details of the atrocity. They demanded the immediate punishment of the men responsible for the crime, an official apology, and an assurance that no such atrocity would be repeated. In August, General Chu again wired Chiang Kai-shek, this time in confidence, informing him that General Shi Yusan, commander of the Kuomintang 6th Army on the Hopi Ihonanshantung border where the liberated areas began, was actively collaborating with the Japanese in joint attacks on the 8th Root Army. Though General Shi Yusan was an unscrupulous warlord with a long pro-Japanese record, Generalissimo Chang immediately rejected Chu Tei's charges. General Chu repeated his accusation. Chang did not reply. On August 24th, Chu Tei and Peng Tehui sent Chang a long documented wire, quoting one of Shi Yusan's orders to his officers. This order read, under orders of Generalissimo Chang, and for the sake of our country, people, existence, and development, our army must exterminate the communist bandits who are an obstacle in the war of resistance. In the present stage we are to clean out the communist bandits, and in the second stage we are to carry on the war with Japan. 1. If the 6th Army comes in conflict with the Japanese, you shall immediately withdraw and send representatives to the Japanese to explain. When Japanese planes come, spread a white cloth on housetops and give orders to your troops not to shoot. This was followed by orders explaining methods of communication with the Japanese, flag signals. During the day and colored flares at night. When on the march, the distance between the 6th Army and the Japanese was to be at least 10 li, about 3 miles. By an understanding with the Japanese, the 6th Army was to carry out no actions after 8 o'clock at night. 
The order concluded, when the 6th Army is opposed by communist bandits and has other than garrison duties to perform, you must notify the Japanese. When necessary, we will send troops to help the Japanese fight the communist bandits. Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek rejected this telegram as a fabrication, but General Shi Yusan's treason became so open that Chiang was forced, a few months later, to arrest, try and shoot him. After this execution, a Kuomintang politician remarked in my presence, Shi Yusan wasn't a bad fellow. He said that only one who has been a traitor can really appreciate the beauty of patriotism. By December 1939, the danger of civil war became so menacing that General Chu Te left the front for Yan'an where he could be in constant contact with Mao Zedong and the Central Committee. In a letter which he wrote me three years later, he said that the first undisguised military operation by Chiang Kai-shek against the 8th Root Army was the December incident of 1939. This incident developed almost simultaneously with two others. First, a Kuomintang army commanded by General Chu Suping in South Shanxi openly joined with the Japanese in a mopping-up campaign against the 8th Root Army. Almost at the same time Kuomintang and Japanese forces in Suiyuan began a simultaneous attack on it from the northern frontiers of the Yan'an border region. General Hu Tsungman chimed in with an offensive on the southwest borders of the Yan'an border region. General Hu operated with planes and artillery and his forces destroyed hundreds of villages, killed thousands of people, and occupied a number of districts of the border region. For the first time since the anti-Japanese war began, General Chu Te withdrew troops from the fighting front to protect the 8th Root Army rear and the Yan'an border region. The Kuomintang attacks were so undisguised that the international press reported on them. On January 6, 1940, for instance, the New York Times reported that General Chu Te had sent a strong message to Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek demanding cessation of attacks by the central government troops quoting General Chu's charge that the communists were being attacked in the rear while fighting the Japanese. In his annual military report in 1940, as well as in a number of articles, General Chu Te stated that 1940 was the year when danger signals were so many that it seemed civil war would begin on a wide scale. This was the period when Chungking began to disintegrate under the impact of many developments favorable to the Japanese. 1. The permanent closing of the French Indochina Railway into Yunnan province, and the temporary closing of the Burma Road by the British actions which cut Chungking off from seaborne military supplies. 2. The beginning of the European War, and 3. The founding of Japan's puppet central Chinese government headed by Wang Qingwei which proclaimed its purpose to be the extermination of communism. Instead of introducing bold and courageous democratic reforms which would have aroused all the latent strength and enthusiasm of the people, as had similar reforms in North China, Chungking sank deeper into reaction and corruption. A few generals led their armies into the Japanese camp. The Kuomintang not only suppressed every mention of the treachery of its armies, but threw up a protecting smokescreen by charging that the 8th Root and New 4th Armies were not fighting the Japanese. As early as January 1940, one of Chiang Kai-shek's chief generals, Chen Chang, publicly charged that the communist armies were merely roaming around the country, stirring up the people and disturbing the social order. Chu Te and 15 of the chief 8th Root Army commanders called General Chen's bluff. They officially asked Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek to send General Chen Cheng on a tour of North China to inspect their armies in action, their hospitals filled with wounded men, the People's Resistance Forces, and personally to investigate Kuomintang armies which were not only trading with the Japanese but collaborating with them in campaigns against the 8th Root Army. Generalissimo Chiang ignored their request. The charges against both the 8th Root and New 4th Armies continued. In early August 1940, after long planning, Chu Te and Peng Te Hui issued final orders for a 100 regiment offensive against the Japanese. The 100 regiments of the 8th Root Army which waged this amazing offensive, General Chu wrote me, were all volunteers chosen because of their willingness to disrupt and defeat the blockade of imprisonment and extermination strategy which the Japanese had introduced in the North. Every unit of the 8th Root Army took part in the campaign, he said, but only the strongest volunteers were taken into the 100 regiments. 
all North China, from the mountains of North Shenzi to the shores of the Eastern Sea, and from the Yellow River in the south to Manchuria in the north, became a battlefield over which fighting raged night and day for five months. The fighting was fierce and ruthless as the hundred regiments struck at the enemy's entire economic, communication, and blockade system. Enemy held coal mines and power stations, railways, bridges, highways, trains, and telecommunications were destroyed. The countryside was littered with telephone and telegraph wires and poles. Great stretches of northern railway were ripped out, the ties carried away, and the rails carried to small arsenals in the Gorilla Mountain strongholds. Enemy trucks and motor cars were destroyed, ships in the harbors along the Shantung coast blown up, and enemy warehouses and administration buildings in Sinan and Chaifu wrecked. Thousands of liberated railway workers and miners joined the 8th Route Army. By the time the offensive ended in late December, 2,933 Japanese forts had been destroyed, 20,645 Japanese, including 18 officers, killed or wounded, and 281 Japanese taken prisoner. Over 51,000 Chinese puppet troops had been killed or wounded and 18,407 taken prisoner, about half of them former Kuomintang soldiers. Vast quantities of arms and ammunition and other supplies had been captured and put to immediate use. How the Japanese took these events and guessed at the Kuomintang reaction was best expressed in an editorial in the reactionary Tokyo Daily, the Kakumen Shimbun, on December 27, 1940. Chungking is surely worried over the increasing influence of the Chinese communists. The restless activities of the new Fourth Army along the lower Yangtze have also become a menace to peace. The Tianjin Pico Railway has been hard hit in its transportation. Activities of the Eighth Route Army have penetrated all North China and constitute a cancer to the maintenance of peace. The Chang faction now faces a dilemma. It is not altogether unimaginable that Japan, too, may be seriously affected by communist influence if Chungking fails to pacify the communists. Whether Chungking acted on Japanese promptings, or whether it had merely reached the same conclusions as the Japanese, at any rate, in December 1940, the Chungking High Command ordered the new 4th Army to evaluate the fighting zone where it had operated for nearly two years. It was ordered to cross the Yangtze at specified points and march to North China by designated routes. Chungking had already begun withholding money from the new 4th Army, its food was meager, and its troops still had no winter uniforms. General Ye Ting argued with the high command. He was convinced that the new 4th was being forced out of the Yangtze River Valley to facilitate surrender negotiations with the Japanese, and knew that it would be exterminated by the Japanese and puppet troops if it marched along the routes designated. The majority of his troops, General Ye Ting said, which now numbered 40,000, were local volunteers, peasants whose homes were in the region, or workers and intellectuals who had left Shanghai, Nanking, and other Japanese-occupied cities. These men fought best over familiar terrain and especially for their native districts. His pleas were rejected and the evacuation order repeated. The new 4th Army now accepted the order, but asked for back pay, for the right to cross the Yangtze and march along routes chosen by itself, for ammunition, and for winter uniforms against the fierce northern winters. Chungking gave the army $200,000 back pay and issued ammunition, but no uniforms. By January 7, 1941, all but 9,000 of the new 4th Army had already crossed the Yangtze at points chosen by themselves. The remaining 9,000 consisted of general. Headquarters, the Army's military political training school, two rear base hospitals filled with patients, also headquarters guards and part of one division. On January 7th, when these forces began moving toward the Yangtze, they were surrounded by 50,000 Kuomintang troops sent in from other areas. A bloody slaughter began. Vice Commander Xiang Ying was killed in action, General Ye Ting wounded and taken prisoner. The wounded and sick in the hospital column were simply put to the sword. As men fell dying or dead, women political workers and nurses took up their guns and fought until their ammunition was finished. Then they hanged themselves in the forests. One thousand men escaped in the fighting, crossed the Yangtze, and rejoined their troops. 
about 4,000, most of them wounded, were taken prisoner and herded into concentration camps where the majority died of sickness, disease, and maltreatment. After the United States entered the war, OWI workers in eastern China saw some few hundred survivors from a Kuomintang concentration camp. One OWI worker met two men who had escaped from the concentration camp. One, the brother of General Yating, had been crippled by torture. Chiang Kai-shek, who tried to keep the Yangtze slaughter a secret, finally announced that he had taken disciplinary action against the new 4th Army because it had refused to obey orders. The new 4th was therefore declared outlawed and disbanded, he said. General Tang Enpa, one of the most feudal-minded Kuomintang generals, was ordered to exterminate the rebel remnants. Immediately after the slaughter, the Nanking puppet government broadcast an order to its troops which stated, The destruction of the new 4th Army has begun and it is our job to finish the remnants. For a time it looked as if the new 4th Army, of which General Chen Yi now took command, would be exterminated by the combined forces of Kuomintang, Japanese, and puppet armies. This failed, however. Kuomintang soldiers, however corrupted they might be, became confused and demoralized when told to fight their own countrymen instead of the Japanese. When the true story of the Yangtze tragedy broke through Kuomintang censorship, the Chungking High Command charged that the new 4th Army had been hatching a treacherous plot to occupy the nanking shanghai Hangzhou Triangle and to extend its sway along the entire China coast northward to Shantung. This weird statement failed to divulge that the nanking shanghai Hangzhou Triangle was a Japanese bastion along the Yangtze River Valley. If the new 4th Army had indeed plotted to occupy this region, it had plotted to destroy powerful Japanese forces as well as the nanking Quislin government. The entire China coast was also held by the Japanese. Again Mao Zedong and Chu Tei came forward. They were as careful as possible to prevent outright civil war, but nevertheless they exposed fully the facts of the tragedy and demanded that Chungking make amends by releasing and reinstating General Ye Ting and other new 4th Army men. They insisted that the men responsible for the tragedy be punished, that the families of the dead be compensated, and that assurances be publicly given that no such attack would ever occur again. In addition, Chu and Mao charged categorically that fascist elements in the Chinese government were plotting with the Japanese to wipe out both the 8th Route and New 4th Armies, to turn North China over to the Japanese in return for a peace settlement, and to bring China within the Axis camp. To prevent civil war and surrender to Japan, they demanded that the basis of the Chungking government be broadened to include representatives of other parties and groups. Chungking replied by discontinuing all money, food, and military supplies to the 8th Route Army and ordering General Hu Tsungnan to draw a tight blockade around the Yan'an border region. A diligent effort to starve the 8th Route Army was made, while the Japanese continued the work of extermination. Two months after the new 4th Army tragedy, two of Chiang Kai-shek's generals, who had been conducting operations against the new 4th Army remnants, led 50,000 Kuomintang troops into the Japanese camp. Generalissimo Chiang neither reprimanded them nor deprived them of their rank in the Kuomintang army, nor did he send a punitive expedition against them. From this time onward the 8th Route and new 4th Armies were dependent upon what they themselves and the people collectively produced. The Communists revived the Revolutionary Military Council of Civil War Days and established the Yan'an government whose directives guided all the liberated areas. General Chu appointed Chen Yi as commander-in-chief of the new 4th Army and ordered him to regroup his troops for continued warfare on the Japanese and puppets in the lower Yangtze and to defend himself if attacked by Kuomintang armies. The two communist commanded armies and the people of North and Central China had to take care of their stomachs and began what was recognized a few years later as a gigantic enterprise which amazed all who saw its results. After months of grisly suffering, the new 4th Army developed stable guerrilla bases like those in North China, introduced civil rights, with equal suffrage and free elections, and all areas which it controlled, developed civil administrative organs small factories, arsenals, hospitals, and educational and publicity institutions on the same pattern as those of North China. Chungking drew back from outright civil war. An armed truce was established until the Second World War ended in 1945. Communist representatives remained in Chungking as before, 
but were isolated, and their newspaper, the New China Daily, was allowed to appear only under the most ruthless censorship. The communists continued to state that they would maintain the united front wherever possible but would defend themselves if attacked, and that, they would continue to carry out Dr. Sun Yat-sen's three people's principles and basic policies as before. They challenged the Kuomintang to do the same. In a personal letter to me later, General Chu wrote, Though cut off from all money and military supplies, our armies are now united under a centralized command to continue the anti-Japanese war. We began the intensive development of production in which our troops and all our party and other organs participated. Everyone worked either to bring land under cultivation, to increase livestock, to spin and weave, or do every variety of work to make ourselves and the people of North China self-sufficient. The first year was bitter, but after that things began to improve. Under the bitter hardships of that first year, we intensified our new political economic military policy and developed our new democracy which Comrade Mao has defined in his book of that title. We and the people are mutually dependent, but as our production movement progressively grows, our army will be entirely self-supporting and we will not have to lean on the people. It is not easy to keep a rendezvous with history. Book 11 We have one secret weapon Chapter 36 Clouds of Fighters and Commanders are singing like a great wind. Flashing guns force the Sun Empire to retreat. Blood stains our rivers and mountains. Chu Te, the years 1941 and 1942 tempered the spirit of the people and troops in the liberated areas in blood and suffering. The lines were drawn so clearly that even the most obtuse could see them, while the Kuomintang cut the communists off from all supplies and hemmed them in with a blockade of steel, the Japanese tried to exterminate them on the field of battle. In the first six months of 1941, the communists prepared for the attacks from the rear and battles at the front. Immediately after the establishment of the Kuomintang blockade, Mao Zedong officially announced the production movement of self-sufficiency. This, with time, transformed the face of North China and made sustained military resistance possible. Of this movement Mao said, our policy is of resurgence through our own efforts. The reduction of rent and interest has raised the enthusiasm for mutual aid and raised the productive power of the peasants. Our experience shows that through mutual aid the productive capacity of one individual becomes fourfold. Once mutual aid has become a habit, the productive output will not only be greatly increased, but all kinds of new creations will appear. Political standards will be raised and people will also improve culturally. Loafers will be reformed, customs changed, and our rural society be led to new productive power. It will then be possible not only to carry on the war and cope with the famine years, but also to accumulate huge amounts of food and daily necessities for use in a counteroffensive. Not only peasants, but the army, party, and government institutions must also organize to engage in production together. The production movement began with planning conferences of every group of the population, including the armed forces, across the thousands of miles of the liberated areas. Tens of millions of people began working in mutual aid teams, labor exchange groups, and industrial, consumer, and transportation cooperatives, or in new small factories or other institutions. No one was exempt. The Japanese offensive began in July 1941. In the 18 months of fighting to the last day of 1942, the 8th Route and New 4th Armies suffered 82,456 casualties, of which 30,789 were killed outright. The number of civilian and local partisan dead and wounded could not be reckoned, but was much greater. The Yan'an press, for the next two years in particular, pictured General Chu Te moving here, there, everywhere, writing, speaking, advising, laboring in his headquarters under candlelight until the small hours, and, early every morning, working in the fields like the peasants from whom he sprang. Newspapers, pamphlets, and books put out by Yan'an in those years are peppered with his writings, while reports of his speeches and interviews alone would fill volumes. His tenacious figure can be seen speaking before conferences of cooperatives, women, labor unions, youth, and at soldier commander congresses, also at peasant gatherings on rural reconstruction, labor hero conferences, memorial meetings for the dead, and classrooms filled with Japanese prisoners of war, and at exhibitions on industrial and military achievements. 
from Communist Party Congresses where the strategy and tactics of the National Revolutionary Struggle were determined, he would go to such gatherings as the production conferences of the Women's Alliance of the Border Region, where, in the autumn of 1941, he sounded like Mayor LaGuardia talking to New York housewives on how to cook spaghetti and care for children. We produce salt in this region, so we can put down large quantities of vegetables for the winter months. In Sichuan, we always salted down vegetables. We did it in this manner. Now, let us talk about the soya bean, which should become a major crop in this region. Soya beans can be used in many forms, as green vegetables, as bean curd, sauce, or dried for winter use. They can also be pickled for winter use. Each Manchurian household puts down at least one large can, vat, of salted soya beans for winter use, as well as another of sauce. They do it in this manner. After discussing crops with the women, he turned to the breeding and care of pigs, sheep, goats, cattle, rabbits, and bees. Every bit of every animal, bones, meat, hoofs, and hides, should be used, while the care of bees and the increase in honey production should become one of the major industries of the border region, he told them, and went on to the care of children. I sometimes find a woman sitting on her doorstep and weeping because her baby has just died. Why do we suffer such losses? One reason is because the people of North Shenzi pay too little attention to sanitation. For ages our people have made very little progress in this respect. Poor sanitation can result in the extermination of a whole herd of swine, but when babies die as they do, the loss is infinitely greater. Our production propaganda must therefore go hand in hand with improved sanitation both on the farm and in the home. Cleanliness must be constantly stressed. We now have cooperatives which produce good, cheap soap, babies must be washed each day, and children taught daily habits of cleanliness. Even under the most difficult conditions, our soldiers try to keep themselves clean and always wash their feet each night. If they can do this, people in the rear can do much more. From the care of children, he went on to the industrial cooperatives which, he said, should be developed on a large scale to serve as a bridge between agriculture and industry and to activize commerce. Cooperatives should never become mere money-making organs, nor should their products be hoarded to raise prices and propagate an economy of scarcity. The Yunnan border government, he reminded them, laid. Great emphasis on cooperatives and home industries, exempting some from taxation and imposing only a nominal tax on the others, and also honoring men and women who achieved high standards of production as labor heroes. Some of our women production leaders tell me that they have a fund of $200 but don't know what to do with it. I should think you would use that money to make 220 spindle spinning machines. After two weeks' practice, a woman can produce 14 pounds of wool yarn a day on such a machine. From this yarn, you can select five pounds of the best and spin it into good yam, for which our weaving factories will pay you $30. The inferior wool can be woven into blankets and carpets. Hemp, which we produce in large quantities, can be mixed with wool and woven into strong, durable, warm cloth. After such a meeting, he would sometimes mount his big horse, captured from the Japanese, and ride down into the Nanawan area. A brigade of the 8th Root Army under Wang Chin garrisoned this zone to protect Yan'an from the Japanese across the river and from Kuomintang troops blockading from the south. The army production movement, which he called the Nanawan Movement, was General Chu's pride and joy. When this powerful brigade was brought into the Nanawan area, it found a wasteland. There were no buildings or caves and only the ruins of an occasional village or abandoned temple. The Kuomintang blockade of the border region, General Chu told the troops, was intended to starve soldiers and civilians while the Japanese destroyed them in battle. Neither the army nor the people had any intention of allowing themselves to be starved or destroyed, nor could the army live off the people. General Wang Chen's Nanawan Brigade looked about and found a 2,000-pound bell in an ancient abandoned temple. From this they fashioned their first plow and hose, the first picks and shovels to excavate living quarters in the hillsides, the first tools to make furniture and dig wells. The troops began transforming the wasteland into fields of grain and vegetables. From distant villages they bought a few draft animals, goats, sheep, and pigs, which produced and multiplied. 
They held frequent production conferences, founded their own spinning and weaving cooperatives, and continued their education as well as even creating a dramatic group. When thousands of refugees from battle zones streamed into the border region, they helped settle them on the land, dug wells, and made spinning wheels for them, and helped them found cooperatives, primary schools, night schools for adult illiterates, and labor exchange groups. The production movement was underway when, in early July 1941, General Yasuji Okamura, Japanese commander in North China, turned 300,000 Japanese troops loose on the liberated areas in what he called his three-all strategy, kill all, burn all, loot all. The Okamura three-all offensive of 1941 was fought with one main aim. Clean up North China to prepare for the Great Pacific War. Japanese columns moved in, surrounded whole districts, and closed in for the kill. In one small southeastern Shanxi district, typical of others, the Japanese slaughtered 13,000 civilians who had remained in their homes, sparing neither babies nor the aged. In one town which the 8th Root Army recaptured, the troops found, and photographed, the naked corpses of hundreds of women and girls of all ages, lying in the public square. Before and during this three-all offensive, the Japanese built 2,400 miles of deep trenches and 400 miles of protecting walls along the motor highways in central Hopi province alone. High walls and protecting ditches also ran parallel with Japanese-controlled railways throughout the north and northwest. The Japanese constructed chains of blockhouses with underground chambers for food and ammunition. The people on the northern plains also utilized the bosom of the earth. They dug underground air raid shelters which they extended into long tunnels which often connected different villages. Inhabitants of a village under enemy attack could take shelter in another, while enemy troops entering a deserted village would find themselves suddenly surrounded by 8th Root Army troops who arose out of the earth beneath them. The people, who had been taught to make land mines of every kind, sought to protect their homes by sowing mines along all paths leading to them. Some of the people's heroes produced by this struggle were little boys who wandered out to meet advancing enemy troops and reply innocently to requests, No, I cannot guide you to my village because that is forbidden, but it is along that path over there, pointing to a mountain path sown with landmines where troops and partisans lay in ambush. In his annual report on July 1, 1941, General Chu stated that 8th Root and New 4th Armies often went into battle with only 5 or 10 rounds of ammunition and that the heavy losses suffered by the people and the troops of the North were the bitter fruit of the Kuomintang blockade. By the first week of December 1941, Chu later reported, just when the Japanese thought they had crippled the people's forces in the North and could begin the Pacific War with a safe rear, we launched a counteroffensive which prevented them from transferring troops to the South Pacific against the Allied armies. This counteroffensive was accompanied by an upsurge of the production movement. As the people's forces recovered district after district, and the civilian population returned to rebuild their destroyed homes, Yunnan transferred grain and livestock into these just recovered areas. In his 1943 report, General Chu Te was unable to estimate the amount of ammunition, food, and medicine captured during the counteroffensive because, he said, all such supplies had been put to immediate use. The captured rifles, however, numbered 95,000 light and heavy machine guns over 2,000 pistols, 4,000 to 27 anti-tank guns, 29 field guns, 73 quick-firing guns, 225, and two anti-aircraft guns. Other trophies included 272 radio transmission sets with generators, 939 field telephone sets, 112 cameras with films, 7,201 gas masks, also bicycles, gramophones, parachutes, Japanese flags, and thousands of head of horses. One item on the new 4th Army list of trophies read, 592 drums of American gasoline. One of the most significant sections of General Chu's report dealt with the change that had come over Japanese troops during the preceding five years. By mid-1942, he said, the surrender and desertion of Japanese had become frequent. These prisoners of war were never put in chains nor herded into concentration camps. 
they were given Chinese uniforms and placed in classrooms to study much the same subjects that the anti-Japanese armies studied, with special emphasis on the feudal structure of their own country, the history of the Japanese working class, and the principles of scientific socialism. Many graduates of the Japanese Workers and Peasants Training School at Yan'an, in particular, later worked as special political propagandists with the 8th Root Army at the front. By the end of 1944, 30 of them had been killed in action. General Chu's 1943 report also gave considerable information on the underground activities of Japanese anti-fascist organizations within the Japanese Army, one of which was the Japanese Awakening Alliance. By 1943, the Japanese Awakening Alliance had established contact with a number of 8th Root Army units, which it kept informed of Japanese plans and moves. And in 1944, Susumu Okano, Tetsu Osaka, one of the founders of the Japanese Communist Party and a veteran of Japanese underground work against Japanese militarism, made his way to Yan'an to direct all educational work among Japanese prisoners of war and to work with Mao Zedong and Chu Tei in an advisory capacity. The attitude of the Chinese communists on other international problems was revealed in General Chu's 1943 report and in many of his other writings as well. Unlike some right-wing members of the Kuomintang, which for years had proclaimed fascism as the social system best suited to China, the communists were enemies of fascism, regarding it as the last stage in monopoly capitalism when the capitalist class, confronted with the people's growing power, destroys all parliamentary institutions and establishes its open dictatorship. In Germany and Italy this was done behind the smokescreen of anti-communism, which was also thrown up in China by both the Japanese and the Kuomintang. For these as well as for past historical reasons, neither General Chu nor the other communists took at face value all the pronouncements of the Western powers about the democratic aims of the war. After all, they had sold strategic materials to Japan until 1940. Despite this, General Chu had for years been convinced that the Western powers would have to fight fascism whether they wished to or not. He also believed that, in the course of this anti-fascist war, the people of the Allied powers would force their governments to live up to at least some of their democratic propaganda, and that the defeat of the Axis bloc would deal a mortal wound to fascism in every part of the world. Neither General Chu nor the other communists hid these ideas under a bushel. The Kuomintang proclaimed in and out of season that the Red or Communist bandits, as they more and more called them, were merely using the war to extend their influence with the aim of establishing their power after the war. The Communists most certainly aimed to extend their power and influence. But in this they were by no means unique. The Kuomintang tried to use the war to destroy all opponents with a view to establishing its dictatorship over the whole country. To this end, it adopted tactics of which the communists were never guilty, whole Kuomintang armies began going over to the Japanese, with the toleration, and, General Chu believed, the support of the Chungking High Command. Even before Pearl Harbor, twelve Kuomintang generals led their armies into the Japanese camp. Fifteen others joined them in 1942. General Chu had formidable evidence proving that these defections had been undertaken with the aim of getting into North China with the Japanese and waging war on the liberated areas. General Chu Tei's chief of staff, Ye Chianing, once explained Kuomintang military defections to the enemy as due to corruption in the Chungking government, the denial of democracy to the people, and to the demoralization of nationalist armies following Japanese victories. Instead of political education, he said, Kuomintang soldiers were told that the 8th Root and New 4th Armies were bandits and greater enemies of China than the Japanese. Illiterate, ignorant, half-starved and maltreated, Kuomintang soldiers were merely taught to obey and shoot. Had the 8th Root and New 4th Armies not been so highly educated politically, they also would have been demoralized by the sweeping Japanese victories over the Allied armies in the first two years following Pearl Harbor. The Communists, however, had expected the Pacific War and even anticipated initial enemy victories by reason of Japan's geographical proximity to Asian battlefronts, and also because the Western powers had for years helped strengthen the Japanese war machine. Despite these facts, however, the Chinese Communists were not demoralized by Axis victories. 
General Chu Tae's attitude toward all international issues was clearly expressed in a lengthy paper which he read at a conference of Eastern peoples held in Yunnan just two weeks before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. This conference, attended by a few hundred delegates representing China, Japan, Korea, India, and Mongolia, was one of those small, obscure events which influenced the course of history. General Chu began his address by stating that eastern peoples constituting one billion souls or half the world's population had carried on a revolutionary struggle against imperialist conquerors for over a hundred years from this he went on to analyze china's revolutionary struggle from the taiping rebellion onward and to a concise historical review of the independence movements of india burma the dutch east indies indochina the philippines and korea he included Japan also, recalling the thousands of Japanese who had sacrificed their lives in the struggle for democracy since the Meiji Restoration. He next summarized the various stages leading up to a Second World War, unable to conquer China, General Chu said, Japanese imperialism must now advance southward against other Asian countries. As proof that this attack would come at any moment, he cited not only Japanese documents captured in battle, but added, Japan has reorganized her national defense, passed emergency war measures, established a supreme air force, intensified domestic control, and put its entire economy on a war footing. Large-scale air maneuvers are taking place over Japan today. General Tojo's recent assumption of power is an expression of the total militarization of Japan. All such measures are unnecessary for war on China, but are essential for war on Britain, America, and the Soviet Union. He also cited the recall to Japan of thousands of overseas Japanese, 2,700 from the Dutch East Indies, three boatloads from the United States, and others from Hong Kong. From such information as he had gathered, he said, Japanese strategy had divided Asia into four areas. The first embraced Japan, Korea, and Formosa. The second included Japanese-occupied territory in China and Indochina. The Philippines, Thailand, Borneo, Malaya, Burma, and the Dutch East Indies, areas rich in oil, rubber, tin, iron, rice, quinine, and other raw materials essential for Japanese war industry, fell into the third area. India and Australia, with their cotton, wool, iron, and other resources, constituted the fourth, which also included Tibet, Qinghai, and Xinjiang in Central Asia. Japanese war strategy, he continued, included the use of native traders, spies, and Buddhists, the purchase and use of radio stations, movies, newspapers, and magazines, and the bribing of editors, broadcasters, writers, and lecturers of every nationality. Japan's chief and most effective propaganda in Asia lay in such slogans as Asia for the Asians, Japan and China must exist and prosper together, and liberate China from the yoke of Anglo-American imperialism. Because of the slaughter of millions of Chinese, the burning of homes, and the seizure of China's natural resources, only Chinese traders listened to such Japanese propaganda, he declared, and added. We must not be taken in by Japan's anti-British and anti-American propaganda, nor by the Japanese-promoted independence movements in Eastern countries, because Japanese imperialism is no different. From white imperialism, we hope that Britain and America will adopt an enlightened policy toward Eastern races so the Japanese cannot disrupt unity between Eastern and Western peoples. Two weeks later Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and the Pacific War began. Before an hour had passed, General Chu flashed orders to his troops, torn and bleeding from months of resisting Okamura's three-all extermination campaign, to launch a counteroffensive to prevent Japanese troops from being transferred to the South Pacific. This same order instructed all armed forces and people of the North to give protection to any citizen of the Allied nations who escaped from Japanese-occupied territory. A number of Allied refugees were already fleeing peeking into the western hills where 8th Root Army guerrillas escorted them for weeks across North China, some to the Chen Cha Chi mountain base on the borders of Hopiai, Shanxi, and Chahar provinces, others on to Yunnan. Of these, two were French, one was the American vice president of the National City Bank of Peking, one was a Dutch businessman, and three were British educators. Of the British citizens, one was Professor William Band, head of the physics department of Yenching University who, with his wife, remained in the liberated areas for two years, 
chiefly in the Chen Cha Chi Regional Base where he taught college physics and participated in the first Natural Science Congress in North China. Another Englishman, Michael Lindsay, also professor of economics at Yenching, remained as a teacher in Yan'an until the war ended. With the Yan'an Radio School, he constructed the broadcasting station on which China and the Western world depended for news of the North for a number of years. Of the French refugees, one was Lieutenant George Ullman who, after joining the Free French Forces in Europe, wrote of the 8th Root Army, poor and deprived of everything, like the first armies of our French Revolution, without any help from the outside. The 8th Root Army achieves the double task of driving back the invader and teaching liberty to the people. The refugees who reached Yan'an were present at a number of meetings addressed by General Chu Te and other leaders. At one on July 7th, the fifth anniversary of the Sino-Japanese War, General Chu said, on this occasion, and on behalf of the 570,000 fighters of the 8th Route and New 4th Armies, I send warm greetings of national liberation to all the people of China and to all fighters against fascism. We express our heartfelt sorrow at the loss of the finest sons and daughters of the Chinese nation, of the Soviet Union, and of Britain, America, and other countries whose sons have given their lives for the sacred cause of national independence, human righteousness, and world peace. Through month after month of sweeping Japanese victories in the South Pacific, General Chu Te's speeches and articles resounded with calls to the troops and partisans under his command to tighten. Your bonds with the Allied powers by attacking and containing enemy troops in China, and to destroy every Japanese stronghold in North and Eastern China. He also called on the Kuomintang to adopt the same policy and to introduce democratic reforms which, he said, could mobilize China's manpower and natural resources on a voluntary basis and ensure Allied victory. One of the most passionate appeals ever written by him was a proclamation to the people of Manchuria, which began circulating through the Manchurian underground on September 18, 1942. It began, For eleven bloodstained years Manchurian volunteers have fought under icy skies and over snowy earth, without munitions and often without food. As men fell at the front, those behind stepped forward and continued the struggle under impossible conditions. The proclamation then called on the Manchurian people to organize desertions and uprisings among Chinese conscripts in the Japanese army, to use every means to escape being drafted, and to organize their own local guerrillas to cooperate with the volunteers and with the 8th Root Army. Workers in mines and factories were called on to carry on ceaseless and widespread propaganda and sabotage, to slow up work, make deliberate mistakes, and decrease production to cripple the Japanese army. Villagers were called on to fight the enemy system of food control and distribution, to organize, feed, and protect local guerrillas, and not to allow themselves to be conscripted. The proclamation ended, our 8th Root Army's advance forces have penetrated Jihol and Chahar provinces, entered eastern Hopiai, penetrated through the Great Wall into Manchuria, and contacted the volunteers. All people, all Chinese troops, should cooperate with all our military activities. The day of revenge and emancipation is nearing. We shall never forget your eleven years of anguish, your blood and tears, and the insults you have suffered. Mobilize. Unite. Prepare to welcome our attack. As the year 1942 drew to a close, General Chu and his comrades continued using every possible occasion to encourage and strengthen their people by telling them that the people of the world were with them. At a memorial mass meeting on November 13th, third anniversary of the death of the Canadian physician, Dr. Norman Bethune, who died at his post in the service of the 8th Root Army, General Chu spoke with deep emotion of the long years during which Canadians and Americans had helped China's war of resistance. On December 30th, he also spoke in memory of Dr. D. N. Coatness, a volunteer physician from India who had died the year before in the service of the 8th Root Army. After reviewing the history of India's long struggle for independence, General Chu said, Dr. Coatness understood that the emancipation of the Indian people was linked with the emancipation struggle of the Chinese people. He therefore regarded China's war of resistance as his own. He was the second foreign friend to give. His life for China. 
Not all was sorrow and grief in those years, however, as was shown by one of General Chu Tae's poems picturing the great achievements of the production movement of self-sufficiency by mid-1942, on this 7-7 Memorial Day, old people visit one another. Though fighting rages fiercely, rest is treasured on this day. A light cart leaves Yunnan, carrying five old men. At Sanchili village the heat grows wearisome. Winds bend the distant forests, white clouds drift over blue mountains, and yellow birds nest in green foliage. Climbing the crest of Million Flower Mountain, they gaze on the sea of hills below, the forests above sheltering them from the sun. Tigers and leopards, they say, prowl here. One year ago this was wasteland without even a ruined cave as a sleeping place. New market towns now flourish, cave homes burrow into the wastes of hills. Good crops grow on the plains below and young rice gleams in water fields. The wasteland blossoms. Fighters are warmly clad, their stomachs filled. Fat sheep and cattle browse on grassy meadows and Malin Town makes beautiful paper. Resting at Tashku near enough to a clear brook to embrace it, the old men enjoy themselves luxuriantly, refreshed in body and soul. A warm breeze caressing their faces, they recall their homes in South China. Strolling in the evening cool, they compose poetry, gazing on the moon hanging in the treetops. Chapter 37 Those Western Powers That Had So Gloriously Ruled Generations of Asian Peoples Ate Gaul and Wormwood in the First Two Years of the Pacific War When the Peoples of Southeast Asia, Believing the Powerful Japanese Propaganda Against Western Imperialism, Welcomed the Japanese Armies as Liberators. After 118 years of British occupation, Singapore fell just two months after the Pearl Harbor attack. The Dutch debacle in Indonesia was complete by March, and by the early summer of 1942 the Allied armies in Burma were in full retreat, with Burmese burning the forests around them. Chinese armies under General Joseph Stilwell's command were admitted to Burma after prolonged negotiations with the British. They feared the Chinese might recapture the country and stay, since it had been taken from the Manchus in 1885. At best they might give the Burmese ideas. The Burmese who helped the Japanese, however, regarded the Chinese as traitors fighting for British imperialism. By the end of 1942, Queen Wilhelmina of Holland, whose holdings in the Dutch East Indies had made her one of the richest women in the world, was promising the Indonesian people participation in a post-war commonwealth with control of their own internal affairs, but obligated to render mutual assistance to all branches of the Union. In early January 1943, the British and American governments also took steps to counteract Japanese propaganda. They abrogated their century-old unequal treaties and signed new equal treaties with China, and suggested that additional treaties covering trade and other matters be signed after the war ended. All such developments served General Chu and other communist leaders as material to educate the troops and the people. On February 4th and 5th, General Chu published two articles, one on the old treaties which had reduced China to a semi-colonial position, and one on the new. The new treaties, he said, were an important step forward, but a paper treaty is not enough, and only a strong, democratic China and the development of national economy can achieve real equality with the great powers. Yet there was not very much indication that the Chinese government intended to introduce democracy and bring to an end the shameless hoarding and war profiteering which had long since replaced efforts at industrial development. Kuomintang armies were merely trying to avoid battle on the theory that China has done its share of fighting, let the British and Americans do theirs. Instead of developing the national economy, Kuomintang officials and officers were hoarding and speculating, even selling rice to the Japanese in the midst of a famine in Kwangtung which killed one million people before it ended in 1944. Another devastating famine in Honan province in the north claimed three million lives during the same period. The army of General Tam input garrisoned Honan, and, despite the drought, General Tang seized even the seed grain of the peasants as taxes or food for his troops. Much of this grain was put on sale at prices which only the rich could afford. A representative of the American Red Cross who went into Honan to carry on relief work had to buy wheat from General Tang Inpa at a price higher than he would have had to pay on the American market. 
Thousands of starving peasants who tried to emigrate to the liberated areas were turned back by General Tang's machine gunners. A saying arose among the Honan peasants, we suffer from four great calamities, floods, drought, locusts, and Tang Inpa. The great nationalist daily of Chongqing, the Takung Pao, was even suspended by the censors for contrasting the starvation in Honan with the luxury and war profiteering in the capital. General Joseph W. Stilwell, Supreme American Military Representative in China and Chief of Staff to Chiang Kai-shek, began recording his private thoughts in a diary. Chongqing he simply called the manure pile, and Chiang Kai-shek a grasping, bigoted, ungrateful little rattlesnake whose aim was to hoard lend lease supplies for civil war instead of using them against the Japanese. As the months passed, Stilwell became a thorn in the side of Generalissimo Chang and other Kuomintang reactionaries. Vinegar Joe had no use for the reaction and corruption of Chang's regime. For the Chinese people and the soldiers he had both pity and respect, but his private diary, published in part later in the Stilwell papers, became increasingly vitriolic as he wrote of Generalissimo Chang, Minister of War Ho, and Kuomintang officers in the field. Stilwell had one aim to keep China in the war, to reform its armies so that they might play a role in the war, and to prevent civil war from splitting the nation open. In pursuit of this goal, General Stilwell repeatedly urged Generalissimo Chang to withdraw his 200,000 blockade troops from the Yunnan border region and use them instead against the Japanese. Such suggestions threw the Generalissimo into fits of rage. Yet these blockading troops, the best fed and best armed in China, had done no serious fighting for several years. Kuomintang officials and officers, bankers and landlords seemed to use the war to build up private accounts in American banks. The people and armies of the liberated areas, however, continued to fight the Japanese and puppet troops and to beat off sporadic attacks of Kuomintang armies on their borders. Until the Battle of Stalingrad, which ended in early February 1943, powerful cliques in the Kuomintang seemed convinced that the Axis powers would win the war and that they were fighting on the wrong side. In not one speech or one article by Chu Tei or other leaders of the North, however, was there any indication that the Chinese communists doubted eventual Allied victory. Instead, an article which General Chu Tei published on February 23, 1943, the 26th anniversary of the founding of the Russian Red Army, expressed the conviction that Chinese armies could play a decisive role in Allied victory. In China, we fought the Japanese for four years before the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union. China has doubled the population of the Soviet Union, yet we Chinese have not yet been victorious. Why? The main reason is because the government refuses to mobilize the country politically, economically, and militarily for the war. The German Nazis have no comprehension of the special characteristics of revolutionary warfare, which calls for the mobilization and development of the people's forces to the highest degree. This explains why the Russian Red Army can overcome the superior equipment of the German Nazi army. It explains the great historic victory at Stalingrad, where 330,000 Axis troops were trapped, 91,000 taken prisoner, and the rest killed in fighting. China has everything to learn from the Russian Red Army. Nor must we forget that the Russian Red Army has a strong productive rear to support it. Another important point in the Red Army victory is unity among the Allies and the material help to the Soviet Union from America and Britain. After Stalingrad, the last hope of Axis victory lies in splitting the Allied nations by raising the cry of communism. The Japanese have used this propaganda since the war began, and many Kuomintang officials and army officers have heeded it. July 1st, the 22nd anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party, and the 6th anniversary of the War of Resistance a week later, were two of the many special days that General Chu used for speeches and writing to keep up the morale of the people and troops of the North. Why, he asked on July 1st, had China produced a Communist Party strong enough to endure and grow and mobilize nearly a hundred million people to continue the war? He explained this as due to the growth of the workers' movement and of the people's democratic movement and the association of these two developments with scientific socialism. This combination, he said, had produced a party guided by progressive theories and with sufficient strength and vision to assume the responsibility of carrying the Chinese revolution to completion. 
Developing this theme further, he declared that the Chinese Communist Party had inherited the best traditions of thousands of years of Chinese culture, hard labor, endurance, and respect for learning. It had also enriched itself with experiences during the Great Revolution, the Agrarian Revolution, and the Anti-Japanese War. In the process of this incomparably tense forging, our party has Sinicized Marxism-Leninism and adapted our historical heritage to the present needs of our society. In reply to Kuomintang propaganda against democracy, he declared, Our experience proves that people long for democracy as a thirsty man longs for water, or a hungry man for food. And we have never yet heard of one case of democracy being refused by the people. We believe that the anti-Japanese forces of the nation could be surprisingly and freely developed if democracy were practiced on a national scale. True, due to their low standing in the old society, the great majority of the Chinese people are illiterate. We have therefore given our greatest attention to educational work. This great study movement is unprecedented in history. By July 7th, when General Chu made a special review of the entire six years of war with Japan, his records showed that the 8th Root and New 4th Armies had suffered 380,000 casualties and had inflicted about the same number on the enemy. While these losses had been heavy, he said, the party, the armies, and the people have transformed the face of North China and influenced the thought of all progressive forces of the nation. We have erected anti-Japanese governments of the people which are democratic in character and which guarantee the protection and full enjoyment of civil liberties and of human, property, and political rights by the people. These achievements were possible because we created a simpler and better army, a simpler and more efficient government, and because we prefer death to surrender. All our forces and power come from the people, he continued, and all our ways and means are created by the people. Relying on the power of the people, we have defeated the enemy and overcome every difficulty. We have only one secret weapon, complete unity with the people. Had we been isolated from the masses, we would long since have failed. And what, he asked, was the record of the Kuomintang since the fall of Hankow? Terror against all democratic forces, the most shameless corruption in Chinese history, secret negotiations with the enemy, and preparations for civil war. That General Chu was not engaging in mere propaganda was revealed that autumn when representatives of the Allied powers intervened directly with the Chungking government to prevent civil war which most certainly would have resulted in a Kuomintang peace with the Japanese. Chapter 38 A report put out by the official Japanese Domain News Agency on February 14, 1944, opened the new year with a summary of the Chinese national situation. The only hindrance to the revival of China and defending Eastern Asia now existing is the communist bandits who have not yet been entirely annihilated. These bandits are agitating youth, destroying villages on the pretext of the war of resistance, and carrying on undisciplined activities which throw the Chinese people into the depths of sorrow and torture, and do harm to the progress of the new China and the construction of the new order of Greater East Asia. This is the only hindrance now existing to the revival of China and the defense of East Asia, and we must combat it both spiritually and in actual action. This statement, one of many of a similar nature published in the Japanese press, was made on the eve of the Allied counteroffensive in Asia. By that time, the liberated areas of North China had been cut off from all outside aid for three years. As the Allied counteroffensive prepared to roll, General Stilwell applied to Generalissimo Chang for permission to send an American military observer group to the liberated areas to collect all possible military information about the enemy. Refused at first, his request was granted only months later. At the same time, foreign correspondents in Chungking applied for permission to inspect the North to report facts of the anti-Japanese struggle in that area. They were also at first refused. In May, Generalissimo Chang permitted a group of foreign and carefully selected Chinese correspondents to visit the Northwest, upon condition that they remained for three months. He was quoted as saying that they could not see behind the screen of red propaganda by merely visiting headquarters for a short time. En route to the Northwest, they were to visit General Hu Tsungnan's troops in Xi'an, inspect one of the concentration camps for political prisoners at Xi'an and pass through the southeastern corner of Shanxi province which was still held by the armies of the provincial warlord, General Yan Shishan. 
the Siam concentration camp was carefully prepared for them, and choice prisoners were trotted out to speak for the others. One of the men declared that he was an ex-red who had voluntarily presented himself at the camp to be locked up and reformed. Until the group reached the Yan'an border region, they were regularly presented with other men who declared themselves refugees from the hunger and terror in the communist regions. In late May the correspondents crossed the Yellow River into communist territory. They were met by three or four young soldiers from the 8th Root Army who conducted them to the headquarters of General Wang Chen, commander of the brigade which had been transferred from the front three years before to protect the Nanawan area from Kuomintang and Japanese attacks. The three books which came out of this trip of foreign Correspondents, Harrison Foreman's report from Red China, Gunther Stein's challenge of Red China, and Israel Epstein's The Unfinished Revolution in China, described the Nanawan area in words approaching awe. 34,000 acres of former desolate wasteland were now fields of grain and vegetables. New cave dwellings dotted the hillsides, and thousands of peasant refugees from the Shanxi war zones lived in new villages. Cooperatives, small factories, and schools flourished, and flocks of sheep and goats grazed on the mountains. For the first time since the war began, these veteran correspondents saw well-fed and well-clothed Chinese troops and peasants. For the first time they met and talked with literate common people and troops. On June 6th, just as the party was starting out for Yan'an, General Wang Chen ran from his headquarters and shouted to the troops gathered to bid the party farewell, Allied armies have landed in Normandy. The second front has been opened. Down with fascism. Down with Japanese imperialism. The foreign correspondents who talked with General Chu Te in Yan'an described him as a man sparing in words and with military precision in thinking, who spoke frankly about plans to aid the Allied counteroffensive. American or other Allied military observers would be welcomed by Yan'an, he said, and the 8th Route and New 4th Armies, the anti-Japanese war bases, and the entire anti-Japanese underground intelligence network throughout North China would be placed at their disposal. This intelligence network, he declared, reached into every center of Japanese occupation. General Chu also expressed a hope that was never realized that his armies would receive certain simple military supplies from the Allied powers, such as rifles, light automatic weapons, infantry guns, explosives, and ammunition. With these, and with occasional air support for specific operations, his armies could recover important strategic towns and paralyze all vital enemy communications either by fighting independently or in regular units directly attached to Allied forces which would land on Chinese soil, he added, the 8th Route and New 4th Armies could contribute greatly to the Allied cause. Nor, he said, could he see any objection to an Allied Supreme Command in China, which General Stilwell and President Roosevelt had suggested as a means of unifying all Chinese armies and preventing civil war. The British had been willing to accept an American commander-in-chief for the invasion of Europe and the final assault on Germany, and Chu believed that an Allied Supreme Command would indirectly lay the foundation of unity because national unity on a democratic foundation is essential for China, and our troops are imbued with a spirit of unrestricted inter-Allied solidarity. He added that he would be willing to place the 8th Route and New 4th Armies under the command of General Stilwell, who had been proposed as Supreme Allied Commander. General. Chu's offer came to nothing, however. An American military observer group set up headquarters in Yan'an that autumn, but the struggle to bring all Chinese armies under an Allied commander led to Generalissimo Chang's charge that Stilwell was trying to make him a slave. In October, at Chang's demand, Stilwell was recalled from China and ordered by the United States War Department to make no public statement because the China problem was dynamite. After Stilwell's recall, when General Albert Wiedemeyer took over, American policy toward China changed. Chiang Kai-shek and the right-wing Kuomintang clique were henceforth given the green light. As Brooks Atkinson, the New York Times correspondent, put it, the United States was henceforth committed to support a corrupt and moribund regime. From that moment onward, also, civil war became a certainty. General Chu Te expressed himself in no uncertain terms at a public meeting shortly after the American Military Observer Group's arrival, saying, The Kuomintang is now so weak that some people abroad, mistaking it for China, ask, 
Can China stand throughout the war? We have an old Chinese saying, don't start shedding tears till you've seen the coffin. We have another which says that three shoemakers make one Chu Kuoliang. Chu Kuoliang was a great Chinese warrior statesman of the Three Kingdoms period. Well, we in the North have three million shoemakers, our army and the people's militia, and we have elected representatives of the people in village, district, and regional governments. Count them up and see how many Chu Kuoliangs they make. The Kuomintang blockades us, so we work and produce for ourselves. People who have organized for joint work can also stand together against the Japanese even without supplies from the outside. That is the biggest historical lesson of all. As for ourselves, we don't want to be added to the long list of the Empress Dowager, Yuan Shi Kai, Tuan Chi Ji, and other leaders. If Chiang Kai-shek can't see why they failed, his name will soon be added to the list. The Manchus couldn't hold the people down with autocratic pressure and fine phrases, nor could Yuan and Tuan. I don't believe anyone can. We are merely warning the present dictator. General Chu also stated that the liberated areas were now self-sufficient for food and clothing. The making of hand grenades and landmines had become a household occupation, but the small arsenals and the regional bases still could not manufacture enough ammunition for the troops. Life behind the enemy lines was often extremely bitter, and there were places where towns and villages had been ravaged dozens of times by enemy columns while some areas on the fringes of liberated territory had been ravaged by Kuomintang troops 60 or 70 times. Despite this, by 1942 the liberated areas had begun to expand instead of shrink. During the entire blockade period, Chu continued, the Kuomintang adopted a passive avoid fight. Policy with the Japanese, retreating when attacked and waiting for the Allied powers to win the war on the theory that China had done its share of fighting. When the Japanese were forced by the Allied counteroffensive to complete their continental land route to South Asia and to destroy American air bases in South China, the starving and demoralized Kuomintang armies crumpled before them, and within six months the enemy achieved their aim. Within this same period, the 8th Route and New 4th Armies launched a counteroffensive and drove the Japanese from 80,000 square miles of territory and liberated new millions of Chinese. When the war began in 1937, General Chu added, the 8th Root Army had 80,000 effectives. By the end of 1944, they totaled 600,000 regulars, with over 2 million partisan auxiliaries. Within that period, the regulars had suffered a little under 400,000 casualties, of which about one-third were killed outright. Chapter 39 The Year of Decision, 1945, began with Mao Zedong's announcement that the troops and people of the North henceforth had four main tasks. 1. To strengthen anti-Japanese workers in the liberated areas. 2. To organize the people in Japanese-occupied territory. 3. To help the people in Kuomintang areas to form guerrillas and, with other forces, to fight the Japanese. 4. To start a nationwide campaign for the establishment of a coalition democratic government to continue the war aggressively in cooperation with the Allied powers. Supporting Mao's announcement, General Chu declared that China could play its proper role in the war only if Chongqing introduced democratic measures, and whether Allied victory came early or late would depend substantially on China's war effort as well as on the Allied land and sea offensive. After General Stilwell's recall, however, and particularly after Roosevelt's death in April, General Chu and Mao Zedong, as well as other Chinese political elements, became suspicious of American motives. While Chu and Mao still fought and called for total support of the Allied cause, their armies received none of the Lend-Lease supplies which poured into China over the hump and the newly completed Burma Road. Hu Tsungman's 200,000 anti-communist troops continued their blockade of the Yunnan border region, and no more foreign correspondents were allowed to visit the liberated areas. As the Japanese suffered defeat after defeat and their homeland began to suffer acute hunger, their troops in China turned into human locusts to plunder the harvests and feed themselves. Their attacks on the liberated areas were particularly desperate and ferocious, but with each allied victory the communist armies grew bolder. Distant Shantung province reported to Chu Tei's headquarters that 20,000 additional square miles of territory, some 20,000 villages, and a population of 9 million had been added to that liberated area. 
An additional 500 miles of the Shantung coastline had been recovered, and 8th Route Sea guerrillas were operating along the coast. A paragraph from this report is typical of many others, Shantung liberated areas. Elected village governments have reduced rents, interest, increased wages. Productive efforts of army, people, and regional government have overcome difficulties of food and material supplies. Vast areas of wasteland recovered, 13,000 to 31 wells dug, 290 miles of riverbed dredged, 21 miles of new irrigation canals dug, 283,000 peasants organized in 62,000 mutual aid corps, extensive loans given peasants and dependents of servicemen, 1,012 labor heroes in three administrative zones. Frequent enemy mopping up drives failed to retard production and cultural reconstruction. Liberated Area now has 8,134 primary schools with 471,158 pupils, 17 middle schools with 4,000 students, innumerable night schools for adult illiterates, newspaper blackboards, village theater, and folk dance groups in every village. Army has given extensive manpower in cultivation and harvests. 17 Army medical stations treated over 22,000 civilians in past year. Temporary Army hospitals set up in village struck with epidemic. Army made spinning wheels and agricultural implements for people. 100 public and private factories producing iron wire, soap, silk cloth, alcohol, medicine, cigarettes, and sulfur. Prices have fallen 20%. A report from the Shanxi Suiyuan Liberated Area on the Inner Mongolia border reported a conference of People's Volunteer Heroes and the existence of a thriving demolition cooperative which distributed dividends in war spoils. An ironic intelligence report from a worker in the underground network in Nanking Red, Ma Yixin, puppet magistrate in Suchow County, was arrested this week by the Japanese, charged with hampering military needs. Ma was beaten and sent to Nanking in a sack where he died of indignation. Puppet Sun Yutsai, chief of Puppet Kiangsu Provincial Reconstruction Department, entertained Japanese officers one night and during the party his guests raped his wife, Yu Kumcheng. Chief of the Puppet Labor Department accused of embezzling workers' wages was ordered to commit harakiri to wash away his sins, but Puppet Yu is no Bushido warrior. Puppet Yu ran away, complaining that it's not easy to be a traitor. Another underground intelligence source from Shanghai reported that after the American landing in the Philippines, the Japanese in Shanghai began arresting and imprisoning unstable Japanese elements. From a number of fronts in North China came reports of a wave of suicides in the Japanese army. In late 1944 and early 1945, General Chu was a proud visitor and speaker at the reconstruction exhibition of the Yunnan border region where samples of crops and manufactured goods were displayed, together with photographs, posters, woodcuts, charts, and maps. The economic section had charts listing the achievements of the border region since the blockade began. One million mu of land, one mu equals ye acre, had been reclaimed and the border region now had a grain reserve of 730,000 tan, one tan in the northwest equals 400 pounds. 300,000 mu of land had been put into cotton, from which 14,500 bolts of cotton cloth had been produced. An effective serum against cattle plague had been manufactured and put to use. Over 200,000 people belonged to labor exchange or other mutual aid groups and the grain tax had been reduced until it was 1 20th of that in bordering Kuomintang areas. The manufactured goods section displayed various grades of paper, cotton, wool, and silk, also towels, soap, dyes, matches, and improved spinning and weaving machines. There was also an exhibition of military supplies produced in the border region, which included smokeless powder, high explosives, grenades, grenade throwers and grenade thrower shells, rifles, small arms ammunition, and landmines. A big map depicted the Kuomintang blockade system around the border region where there were three blockade lines with thousands of blockhouses. Speaking at the exhibition, General Chu remarked that if Kuomintang troops had devoted as much strength to fighting the Japanese and to reconstruction and helping the people as in constructing this blockade system, the Japanese could have been driven into the sea. The exhibitions brought hundreds of thousands of people to Yan'an, where a big conference of labor heroes and model workers was also held. 
In his speech of welcome, Mao Zedong told the delegates, The respect paid you by the people is well deserved, but this can easily lead to pride and conceit. If you become proud and conceited, you will no longer be labor heroes and model workers. General Chu told the audience, When we consider what we have achieved with no outside help, we think of the 300 million American dollars in private fortunes which rich Chinese have deposited in American banks. Not one person in our liberated areas has made private profit from the war. Not one has a bank account. We work and fight for the liberation of China and the emancipation of our people. But Kuomintang officials and officers loot the people and soldiers, black marketeer and allied lend lease supplies, and deposit their plunder in American banks. Book 12 the Great Road Chapter 40 Serious Changes took place in the thinking of General Chu Te and his comrades in the last year of the war, when they became convinced that the Second World War would not end with the relaxation of the Kuomintang dictatorship. The China situation had always been clear to them, and there had been more than enough incidents and danger signals to warrant their conviction that the Kuomintang would never give up the dictatorship without fighting. They had hoped, however, that the development of the democratic movement in the liberated areas and the consequent strengthening of the same movement in Kuomintang territory would be able to prevent civil war. They had also expected the proclaimed democratic aims of the Allied nations to loosen the Kuomintang grip on the Chinese people, and were convinced that the defeat of fascism would wash away the ideological ground from beneath the Kuomintang. The replacement of General Joseph Stilwell's policies by those of General Albert Wiedemeyer and Ambassador Patrick Hurley, who supported everything Chiang Kai-shek advocated, had aroused great fear among all the democratic forces of China. This fear had been offset to a certain extent by the re-election of Roosevelt as the President of the United States, an event which simultaneously cast loom over the Kuomintang. Another ray of hope penetrated the darkness when Roosevelt's influence forced the Kuomintang to include representatives of other parties in the Chinese delegation to the San Francisco United Nations Conference in the spring of 1945. Even then, however, Chiang Kai-shek insisted that he alone had the right to appoint such representatives. One communist representative, Dr. Tung Pai Wu, was appointed by him, while two small parties in the Democratic League were allowed one representative each. The news of Roosevelt's death on April 12th, before the San Francisco Conference met, cast a dark shadow over all previously aroused hopes. Mao Zedong and Chu Te wired condolences to President Truman and the Roosevelt family, and flags flew at half-mast over the liberated areas. The Yan'an press described Roosevelt as this great anti-fascist statesman, this good friend of China in a war of resistance, whose death is mourned by the entire Chinese nation. The Emancipation Daily, official organ of the Central Communist Party, wrote, Roosevelt clearly understood that the interests of the United States were inextricably bound up with victory in the anti-fascist war, with peace and democracy in the post-war period, and that these were inseparable from cooperation with the Soviet Union. Roosevelt has left his mark on diplomatic history with his four freedoms and the Atlantic Charter, by his leadership of the Dumbarton Oaks Conference and at the Yalta Conference, he has altered the course of history. We hope that the statesman who succeeds him will, in accordance with his fixed policy, lead the American people to carry out his will, the uprooting of fascism and the construction of a world based on peace and democracy. Roosevelt's death revived the hope of reactionaries throughout the world that the anti-fascist war might be transformed into a war against communism. On April 13th, for example, the Tokyo Asahi Shimbun again raised the cry of anti-communism in China, declaring that the Chinese communist bandits maintained lines of communication along the entire Chinese coast from Chekiang province to Manchuria, and that their peasant defense corps hampered the maintenance of peace and order by the imperial and Nanking armies. These communist bandits and peasant marauders, the Japanese daily fumed, stopped such essential commodities as rice, cotton, firewood, and coal from being exported from the interior, thus disturbing economy in the peaceful areas. Our garrison forces, together with the Nanking Peace Army and Peace Preservation Corps, have organized a joint special corps and are launching daily punitive drives against the communist bandits in order to carry out the three great policies of peace, production, and the purification of thought. In the months preceding Roosevelt's death, General Chu Te repeatedly expressed belief that civil war in China could be prevented. 
In talks with foreign correspondents in Yan'an in the summer of 1944, he said, We do not want to think of civil war, and we certainly shall never initiate such a war. But we, and other democratic forces in the country, are ready to defend the democratic gains of years of struggle, and to fight any reactionaries who may wish to destroy them. Should the Kuomintang wish to fight us, they must fight the entire Chinese people. Such a war would be a continuation of the present one, it would mean that the Second World War would not have ended with the defeat of the Axis powers. A year later, however, General Chu warned that victory on the battlefield will not be the end of the anti-fascist war, and that the Japanese are trying to avert their doom by sowing seeds of discord among the Allied powers by fomenting civil war in China, an effort in which they had powerful Kuomintang support. General Chu gave the same warning at the 7th National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party, which convened in Yan'an on April 24, 1945. His headquarters, he said, had thousands of documents as well as other evidence proving that Kuomintang armies had joined the enemy at Kuomintang direction and fought the People's Armies under dual Kuomintang Japanese command. The Kuomintang High Command, he charged, maintained radio contact with these puppet armies which were under orders, when the war ended, to replace their Japanese with Kuomintang badges and to continue the war on the liberated areas. The Seventh National Congress of the Communist Party met against a background of kaleidoscopic international changes. The session was repeatedly interrupted with world-shaking news, Mussolini and his mistress, together with Seventeen. Other fascists had just been killed by Italian partisans. Hitler, with many of his associates, had ended their gruesome careers in the flames of Berlin. Admiral Donitz had made a last but futile attempt to split the Allies by offering to surrender to the Western powers while continuing resistance to the Russian Red Army. On May 1st, when the Congress ended, the Russians were fighting in the heart of Berlin and the Germans in Italy were surrendering to the Allies. One week later, the Germans and France surrendered and representatives of the Nazi army, naval and air forces signed the Allied document of unconditional surrender in Berlin. It was against this vast international mosaic that Mao Zedong outlined plans for the establishment of a coalition government. This document, entitled on coalition government, began by calling for the total defeat of Japanese imperialism, the destruction of Chinese feudalism, and the abolition of the Kuomintang dictatorship, with none of which. Mao said, could there be any compromise? He next outlined plans for the formation of a Chinese coalition democratic government representing all parties, organizations, and groups to replace the Kuomintang dictatorship. He demanded universal suffrage for the Chinese people, civil liberties, land reforms, the development of industry, mass education and culture, and the protection and development and education of the people's armies. Speaking directly to Communist Party members, Mao warned against dogmatism, factionalism, empiricism, tailism, or lagging behind, bureaucracy, warlordism, and arrogance, any of which, he said, would estrange them from the people. As in years past, he told communists to listen to and merge with the people, and to raise the people's consciousness while giving necessary consideration to their level of understanding. Communists were told to teach the people to organize themselves on voluntary principles and to develop all necessary struggles compatible with the given circumstances. To prevent stagnation, he urged serious self-criticism because a running stream does not become putrid and a door pivot does not become worm-eaten. Mao Zedong also warned that the tactics, methods, and policies which had proved effective in an environment of guerrilla warfare in rural areas would prove inadequate when, after the war with Japan, the great cities were liberated. Susumu Okano, Tetsu Nosaka, representative of the Japanese Communist Party, who also addressed the Communist Congress, recounted the 14 years of struggle carried on by his party against Japanese militarism. Despite heavy sacrifices, he said, we have fought for the interests and well-being of the Japanese nation. Okano ended by expressing the hope that the new democratic Japanese government which the Allies have pledged to assist, and for which they are fighting, would be established, and that it should perhaps be of a Republican nature. General Chu Tei, who served on the Presidium and was re-elected to the party's Central Committee, reviewed the eight years of war against Japan. 
analyzing the various stages of the war, he stated that a part of the Kuomintang army had fought gallantly on many fronts in the first stage of the war in particular. The government, however, had persisted in an anti-popular political system and had therefore failed militarily to capitalize on the strategic weaknesses of the widely dispersed Japanese armies, thus enabling the enemy to capitalize on Kuomintang mistakes and pocket large strategic areas of the country. In nearly eight years of fighting, the 8th Route and New 4th Armies had penetrated into the enemy rear, launched counterattacks, diverted large Japanese forces, set up many liberated areas and opened fronts in the enemy rear, shielded the Kuomintang battlefield, and won victories which had bolstered the war morale of the entire nation. Operating by the strategy of protracted warfare as formulated by Mao Zedong, the People's Armies had waged relentless struggles of the most sanguinary character. He selected the two years following the autumn of 1940 as the most difficult for the liberated areas. Because of this 100 Regiment campaign, and because the Japanese tried to transform North China into a military base for the Great Pacific War, the enemy launched a succession of savage offensives, correlating with Kuomintang troops in converging attacks on the liberated areas so that an unprecedentedly grave situation was created. From 1941 to 1943, nearly half a million Kuomintang troops, led by 60 to 70 officers of general's rank, went over to the Japanese. After the Great Pacific War began, he continued, there were no important battles on the Kuomintang battlefront. But the liberated areas opposed the majority of Japanese troops in China and 95% of the puppets. Judging the situation reasonably, he added, the Kuomintang might have devoted those same years to strengthening the forces of armed resistance and preparing for a counteroffensive. Instead, it continued secret dealings with the Japanese aiming at a compromise and launched three anti-communist drives. General Chu advocated a number of military reforms in the nation. He envisaged the United High Command, in accordance with Sun Yat-sen's ideas, to replace the Kuomintang High Command, the dismissal of all defeatist and pro-Japanese elements, and the abolition of anti-popular and corrupt practices detrimental to the war of resistance and the people's interests. All friction between the various armies should cease, he declared. They were to be treated equally, and allied war supplies should be equitably distributed among the frontline troops. He called for a democratic national army system with strengthened military training, drastic reform in the Kuomintang conscription system, and improvement in the treatment and remuneration of officers and men. Only thus, he declared, could. Chinese troops develop their fighting capacity and China play an honorable role in bringing the war to a quick and victorious conclusion. In that same month of June, Japanese armies in South China began withdrawing slowly toward the coast, looting and killing as they went as they withdrew from a position. The bedraggled Kuomintang armies moved in and took over and Chungking propagandists proclaimed a victory. The Japanese troops in the liberated regions, however, stayed put until blasted out by the People's Army. When the Japanese along the Yellow River bend in the northwest began withdrawing eastward, General Wu Tsungnan did not lift a finger. Instead, General Wu hurled nine divisions of his powerful army against the Yunnan border region. Weeks of savage fighting followed. General Chu Tei and Peng Tehuai repeatedly wired Chiang Kai-shek, demanding that his troops return to their original positions. As public agitation mounted, the fighting simmered to a stop, and in early August, General Chu's chief of staff published a list of American Lend-Lease weapons, with trademarks and serial numbers, captured by the 8th Route troops during the fighting. The American arsenal of democracy had been used by feudal fascists in China, thus postponing and undermining victory in the war against Japan, charged the chief of staff, and he appealed to the American people and to democratic elements in the American government to end this reactionary policy. The communist press in Yunnan and Chungking chimed in and declared that American reactionaries were trying to destroy President Roosevelt's policy of promoting unity and democracy in China. The Potsdam Declaration was announced while the Kuomintang offensive against the Yunnan border region was on. It demanded the unconditional surrender of Japanese militarism and pledged the establishment of democracy in Japan, and again China's gloom dispersed slightly. If the Allied powers pledged democracy to Japan, they could surely not help the Kuomintang suppress it in China. 
Chapter 41 On the first day of the portentous month of August 1945, while Japanese Pacific bastions fell under the shattering blows of the American Navy, General Chu again warned that the Japanese were trying to avert their doom by sowing discord among the Allied powers and by fomenting civil war in China, and that they had powerful Kuomintang support. We must act in unison with our allies and must not stop offensive operations until the enemy has laid down his arms, he wrote. It is against the common interests of all the Allied nations to allow Japan any loophole of escape. Suddenly the whole tempo of the war changed. On August 6th the city of Hiroshima, which was not a military objective, was laid waste by an atomic bomb dropped by an American plane, and two days later another devastated Nagasaki. Of the entire press in Chongqing, only one paper, the communist New China Daily, seemed to realize the significance of these events. On August 7th, this paper protested against the bombing of Hiroshima. The aim of the war is the destruction of Japanese militarism, not the Japanese people. The achievements of science should be devoted to the advancement, instead of the destruction, of the human race. On August 9th, the Soviet Union, acting in accord with decisions reached at the Yalta Conference six months previously, declared war on Japan, and the Red Army began pounding down against the military bastion which the Japanese had constructed in Manchuria from 1931 onward. Ignoring the censors, all but the official Kuomintang press in Chongqing sang paeans of joy, crying that the intrigues of the fascist bandits to alienate the Allies had been shattered, and that the half-million Japanese troops in Manchuria would now meet their doom. However, one telltale line appeared in the official Kuomintang press, from this time on, we can count on a conflict between the Soviet Union on the one hand, and Britain and America on the other. The Christian general, Fong Yuxiang, declared two years later in the United States that Chiang Kai-shek had boasted, in the presence of himself and a number of other Kuomintang leaders, that he had forced the United States to fight Japan, and that he could force it to fight the Soviet Union. Chiang was also quoted as declaring that the Sino-Japanese War would now merge into a civil war, which in turn would merge into a Soviet-American war, and that the byproduct of an American victory, which he took for granted, would leave him and his regime sitting on top of China. The New China Daily of Chongqing, however, expressed another attitude, we will never forget the material aid and spiritual encouragement given us by the Soviet Union in the past eight years. In the whole chronology of our movement for national emancipation, freedom and democracy, we have never had such favorable conditions as today. We must not waste a single minute in our efforts to unite the democratic forces of the whole country to oppose civil war strengthen national unity, and increase the war effort to extirpate all fascism. The final victory will belong to the masses and to the free and democratic new China. The communists now began to think of the cleaning up process. The press claimed the right of the Chinese people to list Japanese war criminals and to pass judgment upon them, a right which Chiang Kai-shek had once denounced. But the communist press went full speed ahead publishing long lists of war criminals in China, giving a full record of their atrocities. First came General Yusuji Okamura, author of the gruesome Three All Policy, Kill All, Burn All, Loot All, in North China. General Okamura, now in Nanking, was supreme Japanese commander in China. In Yan'an, General Chu wrote, Chinese puppets should not be allowed to change their designations and be considered absolved from sin. They should be treated as French collaborationists with the Nazis were treated by French patriots. We demand that all Japanese and puppet troops surrender to the local anti-Japanese units, as the Nazi armies in Europe surrendered to local allied units. Any who refuse should be liquidated by force. To General Chu Tei's desk now came urgent coded warnings. A high Kuomintang official in Chongqing had declared that the Japanese were surrendering at a propitious time. Two months later, this official had said, we would have had to launch a counteroffensive against the Japanese and use our lend-lease supplies. Now we have them for use against the communist bandits. Another warning stated that Chiang Kai-shek had summoned three old generals who had fled Manchuria in 1931 into secret conference and that they were to be sent back with Kuomintang officers to take control of the Northeast. Throughout that day of destiny, 
August 10th, General Chu received other more serious messages. Chiang Kai-shek had ordered Japanese and puppet armies in North, Eastern, and Central China not to allow themselves to be disarmed, reorganized, or incorporated into any other army units without specific orders from himself. They were further ordered to hold their positions and to maintain peace and order. There were no Kuomintang armies in all North China. There were only Japanese and puppets, and most of the puppets were former Kuomintang troops. The pieces of a vast and treacherous conspiracy, already in its fourth year, were falling into place. The Kuomintang High Command was ordering the Japanese and puppet armies who had spilled rivers of blood in the liberated areas to fight if attacked by the communists. Reports from all the liberated regions informed General Chu of one more move that fitted this game of chess. The puppet armies were reassuming Kuomintang designations and badges, lowering the Japanese flag and running up the Kuomintang banner. Exactly at midnight on August 10th, General Chu issued the first of seven orders that changed the course of history. The first ordered all 8th Root and new 4th Army units and all anti-Japanese forces in the liberated areas to send orders to nearby Japanese and puppet troops stationed in cities and along lines of communication to surrender all their arms within a stated time limit. Those who refused were to be destroyed at once. The order stated that all places held by the Japanese or puppets were to be occupied and brought under emergency military control. Those who tried to disrupt these measures were to be treated as traitors. At 8 o'clock on August 11th, General Chu issued a second order, which began, in order to collaborate with the Russian Red Army fighting in Chinese territory and in preparation for accepting Japanese and puppet surrender in Manchuria, I order. The four-point order followed, three armies of the old Manchurian, Tumpei, army under General Chu's command, and one army of the 8th Root Army, were to leave their respective positions in Inner Mongolia, Hopiai, and Shantung provinces as well. As the liberation stronghold on the borders of Manchuria and Inner Mongolia and drive into Manchuria against the Japanese at once. Of the three Manchurian armies mentioned, one was commanded by Chang Su Shi, younger brother of the young marshal, Chang Su Liang, whom Chang Kai shek had held as his personal prisoner since January 1938. One hour later, General Chu Te issued a third order to armies under General Ho Long in Sui Yuan and to General Ni Yunchen in Inner Mongolia to march northward and cooperate with the Army of the Outer Mongolian People's Republic, which had also entered the war and was driving down against the Japanese from the north. The order ended, smash and destroy all Japanese and puppet troops who refused to surrender. Order number four, issued one and a half hours later, placed General Ho Long in command of all anti-Japanese forces in Shanxi province and ordered him to disarm all Japanese and puppet troops and to destroy all who resist. Order number 5, issued 30 minutes later, directed all anti-Japanese troops along all railways or near important communication points to attack Japanese and puppet forces until they surrender unconditionally and to destroy any who resist. Order number 6, issued at midnight on August 11th, ordered the Korean commander, Wu Ting, and his deputy commanders to lead the 8th Root Army which he commanded into Manchuria, to destroy the enemy, to organize the Koreans in Manchuria, and to emancipate Korea. Order number 7, dated the 18th hour, August 12th, ordered all 8th Root and new 4th Army troops to establish emergency military control over all cities or points seized from the enemy, to assign areas for prisoners of war to arrest and register war criminals and national traitors, and to control and protect all institutions of a military or public nature, including arsenals, warehouses, factories, schools, barracks, and important strategic points, and strictly to prohibit freedom of movement in and out of such places. Likewise, to take over vessels, trains, and military vehicles, wharves, post offices, telephone, telegraph, and wireless stations, and to carry out strict military inspection, to control all military and commercial airfields and their installations, to maintain order, protect the residents, be vigilant against reactionaries, remit enemy spies and traitors, and to deal with such elements militarily, to bring all local anti-Japanese organizations and their armed groups under the local defense commander.
This last order also instructed all anti-Japanese forces to announce that anyone who hid enemy or puppet elements, scattered arms, etc., would be severely punished. Treacherous merchants were to be strictly forbidden to hoard goods and manipulate the market and the anti-Japanese forces were to control the food, water, coal, and electrical services. While these orders were setting millions of men in motion, the Korean Independence League and the Japanese People's Emancipation League in Yunnan wired to all their local branches to call on Korean and Japanese soldiers and residents to surrender to the anti-Japanese Chinese People's Armies. On August 12th, news reached Yunnan that American transport planes and ships were being assembled to transport 80,000 Kuomintang troops to battle stations in the liberated areas, and that the first of these would be the new Kuomintang armies armed and trained by American officers. On that same day, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek officially ordered Chu Te to halt the advance of his troops and await orders about disarming the enemy, the terms for which, he declared, could be determined only by the Allied powers. On the following day, Chu Te and his vice commander, Peng Te Huai, replied to Chang, stating, We consider that you have given us a mistaken order. We are compelled to firmly refuse the order. And they went on to remind Chang that he had just ordered the Japanese in South China to surrender to Kuomintang armies on the spot. Why, they asked, had Chang ordered the hated puppets and Japanese to keep their arms and maintain law and order, and to refuse to surrender arms to anyone not designated by him? Chu and Peng further informed Chang that the Allied orders to German Nazi armies in Europe had been to surrender to the Allied armies on the spot. The Nazis had been given no right to choose where and to whom they should surrender. Their wire ended, we have the fullest right to liquidate, with our own hands, those enemy and puppet troops who have caused us so much suffering. The Japanese and puppet troops in the liberated areas obeyed Chang's orders. Instead of surrendering, they launched a fierce counteroffensive. Preceded by bombers and tanks, they moved against the communist troops in some of the most savage fighting of the war. American correspondents who later flew to Nanking with advanced Kuomintang forces reported watching columns of fully equipped Japanese troops moving northward against the new 4th Army. In Shanxi Province, the Japanese escorted the old warlord governor, Yan Shishan, to the provincial capital, Teyuanfu, in an armored train. The commanding Japanese general there became his advisor and placed 20,000 Japanese troops at his disposal. These Japanese troops, together with General Yen's, at once launched a counteroffensive against the 8th Root Army. Three and a half years later the Chinese People's Liberation Army finally conquered Tiyuanfu and took thousands of Japanese troops, with their commanding general, prisoner. General Yen, however, escaped to Canton to become premier of the shriveled Kuomintang regime. On August 14th, the Japanese formally accepted the Allied terms of surrender, which were conditional, not unconditional. The emperor was allowed to retain his prerogatives, a procedure which aroused energetic protests in China. On that same day, the China scene again suddenly shifted. The Chongqing government, with American encouragement, signed a 30-year treaty of friendship and alliance with the Soviet government. This alliance established specific provisions against the revival of Japanese aggression, of which Manchuria had always been the focal point. After declaring Manchuria an inseparable part of China, these provisions included the following, Joint Sino-Soviet Operation of the Chinese Eastern and South Manchurian Railways, Joint Utilization of the Port Arthur Naval Base for 30 years, after which all installations, built at Russian expense, were to be delivered to China without cost, Dairin to be a free port under Chinese administrative control, but with joint Chinese-Soviet port management. The agreement was to run for 30 years, after which all the property of the two railways, like the Port Arthur installations, was to revert to China without cost. The two contracting powers pledged close and friendly cooperation following the peace, mutual respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of each, and non-interference in the internal affairs of each other's countries. On the day this treaty was signed, Chiang Kai-shek, under pressure from the United States, wired the first of three invitations to Mao Zedong to come to Chongqing to discuss national affairs. Mao replied that he would consider the question after Chiang replied to General Chu's previous demands concerning the disarming of Japanese and puppet troops. It took Chiang two days to formulate a reply. 
and the interim general Chu telegraphed the hated Japanese general Okamura in Nanking. He ordered him to instruct all Japanese forces in the liberated areas to surrender to the 8th Route and new 4th Armies on the spot. Concerning South China, he wired, except for those forces surrounded by Kuomintang armies, the Japanese should be ordered to surrender to the South China Anti-Japanese Detachment. General Chu further ordered that all installations and material in enemy-occupied territory should be preserved intact, all Japanese airplanes and warships in North and East China ports remain at their stations, and all warships anchored along the coast of the Yellow Sea concentrate at specified ports. The order warned Okamura that he and all Japanese officers under his command would be held strictly responsible for obeying these orders. The Kuomintang immediately denounced the Chinese Communist Party as a traitor party and public enemy number one. One Kuomintang daily quoted an editorial in the New York Times which attacked the Chinese Communist Party as a conspiracy aimed at the usurpation of the Chinese government. The Yan'an Press replied to the New York Times and the official Kuomintang Press, We have repeatedly announced our hostility to the corrupt and despotic rule of a small ruling clique, and together with the democratic forces of the entire nation demanded the end of this despotism and the creation of a coalition government representing all parties, groups, and classes. Dr. Chang Lan, the venerable president of the Chinese Democratic League, also replied by calling for an inter-party conference to establish a coalition democratic government which alone, he said, could avert civil war. General Chu Te now entered the international diplomatic arena by addressing an official communique to the governments of the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union, whom he asked to recognize the realities of the Chinese battle areas. In 1937, he informed these powers, the liberated areas were abandoned by the Kuomintang government and occupied by the enemy. By August 1945, the Eighth Route and New Fourth Armies had recovered nearly a million square miles of this same territory and liberated a hundred million people. After summarizing the war record of the armed forces and people of the liberated areas, General Chu stated that the anti-Japanese armies and the people in the liberated areas still engage and surround 69% of the Japanese armed forces in China as well as 95% of the puppet armies, while the majority of Kuomintang armies not only gave them no support but used 960,000 troops to surround and attack us. The people of the liberated areas and the Chinese Communist Party, he informed the Allied powers, had repeatedly proposed a conference of all parties to establish a united coalition democratic government which alone could end internal conflict, mobilize the entire country for the anti-Japanese struggle, and guarantee victory and post-war peace. All such proposals had been rejected by the Kuomintang regime. Declaring that we have strong reasons to make specific demands on the Allied governments and peoples, he warned that the Kuomintang regime and its commander-in-chief did not represent the Chinese liberated areas, the Chinese people, nor the anti-Japanese armed forces in occupied areas, and that we reserve the right to challenge anything in the terms of surrender or agreements which concern the liberated area and the armed forces of the people in occupied areas to which our agreement has not been previously secured. General Chu further declared that the liberated areas and the anti-Japanese troops in these areas had the right to accept the surrender of Japanese and puppet troops to carry out allied regulations following their surrender and to be represented at the peace conference concerning the disposition of Japan as well as to representation in the United Nations. His communique ended, in order to avert the danger of civil war in China, we asked the American government to consider the common interests of the people of the United States and China, and immediately to discontinue lend-lease aid to the Kuomintang government. In case the Kuomintang initiates an anti-Chinese people's civil war on a national scale, a serious existing danger, we request that you, the American government, give the Kuomintang government no assistance. None of the governments addressed took official cognizance of this communique. On August 23, General Chu received the first reports that American military transport planes had begun transporting Kuomintang armies not only to Nanking and Shanghai, but to battle stations in north and eastern China, to Peking, Tientsin, and Tsingdao, and that Chiang Kai-shek had requested American troops to land in Tientsin and Tsingdao to support his troops in the recovery of the liberated areas. 
On that same day General Ho Ing Chin, Kuomintang Minister of War, ordered General Yasuji Okamura to take steps to ensure the safety of advanced Kuomintang troops en route to Nanking, adding that Okamura would also be held responsible for the recovery of territory from the bandits. The next four years were comfortable, if not happy ones, for Okamura, who became one of Chiang Kai-shek's advisors in the civil war against the communists. In 1949, when the Chinese People's Liberation Army approached Nanking, Chang absolved him and a large group of other Japanese war criminals and sent them to Tokyo. Chapter 42 Though General Chu was a very down-to-earth soldier, he was imaginative enough to realize that he stood right in the center of one of the greatest struggles of human history. Almost every document that reached Chu's desk, almost every development on the international stage, confirmed his conviction that class called to class across all national and racial boundaries. On his desk lay copies of proclamations put out by Japanese troops in North China which stated categorically that they had received orders from General Ho Ing Chin, Minister of War of the Chungking government, to attack the Chinese Communist bandits. One from Shantung province even stated that many Japanese troops will be incorporated into the future Chinese National Army. Among the papers lay a copy of the great nationalist Chinese daily, the Ta Kung Pao, crying out that Japanese surrender was only a temporary truce and that Chungking had taken no action against Japanese war criminals or Chinese puppets or other traitors, but was even using them in the civil war against Chinese in the liberated areas. Susumu Okano, the Japanese communist leader in Yan'an, had, on August 24th, addressed a communique to the Allied powers warning that Emperor Hirohito's recent imperial rescript was couched in obscure phrases which denied Japan's defeat, denied responsibility for the Sino-Japanese war, and even implied preparations for future revenge. Warning against the new Japanese cabinet, Okano said, can anyone expect this band of war criminals and anti-democratic militarists to fulfill the Potsdam Declaration which demands strict punishment of war criminals, complete demilitarization of Japan, and the establishment of a democratic government? Never. Instead, Japanese militarism is using the imperial household as a protecting screen behind which reactionary forces will collaborate with the Allied powers so as to preserve themselves. This was Okano's last statement from China. Immediately after issuing it he, together with 200 Japanese war prisoners who had been converted in Yan'an, began marching across North China, picking up other groups in the liberated area strongholds, on their way to Japan which they hoped to persuade to their way of thinking. A new stage was reached in mid-August by the return to Yan'an of the Big Wind. General Patrick Hurley, American ambassador to China, had first landed from a plane in Yan'an in November 1944. He gave a war whoop as he strode forward to shake hands with Mao Zedong, Chu Te, and other communist dignitaries waiting to receive him. Hurley had come to Yan'an to urge Mao Zedong to negotiate with Chiang Kai-shek about national problems. Mao had proposed a five-point agreement, one, Kuomintang communist military unification to defeat Japan and reconstruct China. Two, formation of a coalition government and unified national military council. Three, the coalition government to be democratic, espousing the aims of Sun Yat-sen. Four, anti-Japanese forces to obey the unified national military council and be supplied by it. 5. All anti-Japanese parties to be legally recognized. Hurley loudly proclaimed that the five points were so reasonable that he would sign them himself, which, according to rumor, he did with a flourish. The fellow's a clown, Mao told Chu Te later, and thereafter the big wind, as Hurley was called in Chungking, became the clown to Yan'an. Despite General Hurley's description of himself as the communists' best friend and a friendly intermediary, the communists themselves had detected increasing signs of America's decision to favor the Kuomintang. They had made preparations for a showdown. But the American-Soviet negotiations over China in 1944 to 1945 gave them pause. As communists, they could not be expected to run counter to the Soviet analysis of world developments. The Soviet signature to a treaty with the Chungking government and the assurances given by Stalin and Molotov to General Hurley in Moscow strongly suggested that Moscow did not want China to become an area of Soviet-American conflict at time, and wanted the Chinese communists to come to an agreement if they possibly could. 
Toward the end of August 1945, General Hurley pressed Mao Zedong to negotiate in Chongqing. On August 28th, Hurley, accompanied by General Chang Chi Tung, to assure Mao that no trap was being laid for him in Chongqing, arrived in Yan'an and took Mao, together with General Wang Zhou Fei, back with him. Generalissimo Chang's first demand on Mao was that the 8th Route and New 4th Armies be reorganized into the Kuomintang armies. Mao, who was not that much of a country bumpkin, replied that his armies would surrender only to a coalition democratic government representing the entire Chinese people, and that the Kuomintang party armies should do the same, so that a united national democratic army might be organized. Mao's demands were the same as those outlined in his book on coalition government, which were supported and even amplified by the Chinese Democratic League, which met in Chongqing in its first national congress during the negotiations. Mao won the support of the non-official press when, on September 3rd, he demanded from Chiang Kai-shek freedom of the press, the release of all newspapermen imprisoned during the war for democratic activities, Severe punishment of all Chinese newspapermen who had collaborated with the Japanese and their exclusion from the profession forever. Many traitorous newspapermen, Mao informed Chang, as if Chang didn't know, had suddenly turned over to the Kuomintang. In response to these demands, editors and owners of newspapers and magazines throughout West and Southwest China published notices that they henceforth refused to submit to censorship. Acting upon their decision, they began warning that though fascism had been defeated in the war, its ghost still stalks China under many camouflages, perpetrating all kinds of intrigues and dangerous activities. Japanese war criminals and Chinese political and military traitors must be punished, they demanded, all Japanese and puppet armies disarmed, thought control terminated, the secret police abolished, and the Kuomintang dictatorship replaced by a coalition democratic government. The stubborn Mao Chang negotiations lasted until early October. When it became clear that the Kuomintang was on the defensive, the secret police assassinated the editor of the New China Daily, apparently in the belief that they were murdering Cho Enlai, one of Mao's two advisors. Even this assassination, however, failed to prevent the signing of the agreement on October 10th, by which Chang agreed to call a political consultative conference of all parties and groups to discuss the establishment of a coalition government. While these negotiations were underway, General Chu Te was hammering away in Yan'an. In a public meeting on September 5th to celebrate Allied victory in the war, he declared that only a democratic China could unite the nation, and that the liberated areas must set an example to the entire country in the practice of democracy and in productive work. Victory in the war and victory in peace and reconstruction would have been impossible had there been no people's armies which knew how to fight the enemy, engage in production in the midst of war, and truly serve the people, he declared. We must never forget, however, that many Chinese traitors have not been punished, but have been appointed to high government positions instead. Unofficial newspapers in Chongqing quoted General Chu and asked the government, Who are these traitors? Under whose orders are the Japanese still waging war on the liberated areas and massacring our people? When the government ignored the questions, foreign correspondents asked them of the Minister of War, who replied, I have seen no such reports, I have been too busy, to which General Chu Tei replied with an article on September 17th. The Japanese gendarmerie in Sinan, Shantung province, he said, had just changed into Kuomintang uniform, changed its name to the Chin Gendarmerie, while its Japanese commander had taken a Chinese name, the Japanese in Shanxi, he said, still controlled all railways, motor vehicles, the post office, electric light plant, and factories in that province, and the Japanese commanding general in Tianfu had just published an official proclamation which read, in compliance with the request of, the Shanxi Suiyuan Army commanded by General Yan Shishan, the Japanese expeditionary forces in Shanxi have agreed to keep part of its forces in Shanxi to assist the Shanxi Suiyuan Army in its mopping up of Chinese communists. Those residents who had been planning to leave for Peking are advised to remain in Taiyuan for the time being. In Taiyuanfu, General Chu further charged, Japanese and puppet troops operated under Kuomintang designations, while both old and new traders and Chinese. And Japanese commissioners are behaving like members of one family. He named them, Li Xinliang, commander of the Japanese Imperial Collaborationist Army, has been appointed the new Kuomintang mayor of Tsingdao. 
The official Central News Agency had already reported that the troops of this notorious traitor have taken over Tsingdao. On September 4th, 1,000 Japanese troops and several thousand puppets commanded by Lin Chao launched a furious attack on our South China Anti-Japanese Brigade, and fierce fighting is continuing. Also, Japanese troops in eastern Hopiai province, in cooperation with puppet Manchu Kuo troops, have started a combined campaign of plundering and killing in the Tsunhua region. Also, Wang Shiqing, president of the Puppet Central Bank in Peking during the war, was recently flown to Chongqing for a secret conference. A Kuomintang plane flew him back after the conference. He has a special commission from the Kuomintang to continue operations as before. Many traitors go unpunished while the officers and puppet soldiers who massacre our fellow countrymen are commissioned to high-ranking official position under the Kuomintang. A few days later General Chu appeared in print again, this time to protest a list of Japanese war criminals which General Douglas MacArthur had just published in Tokyo. There were only 38 names on the list, cabinet members at the time of the Pearl Harbor attack, and high officers responsible for atrocities in the Philippines, in Burma, and the Dutch East Indies. Not one Japanese responsible for atrocities in China was on the list. General Chu also attacked a statement by General MacArthur on September 11th, which declared that Japan would be permitted to retain some of her heavy industry and her leading position in Far Eastern trade. The Allies were making the same mistake as after the First World War, Chu warned, and MacArthur was retaining a hotbed for Japanese fascists who are busily laying the dynamite for a Third World War. Many incidents soon indicated that the Chinese communists had been called to Chongqing for very different reasons than announced. On September 30th, while the negotiations were in progress, American Marines began landing, not in South China where there were also large numbers of Japanese troops, but in North China cities, allegedly just to disarm and repatriate the Japanese there. On October 5th, five days before the Chongqing Agreement was signed, General Chu Te again entered the international diplomatic arena by lodging a determined protest with the American military authorities in Chongqing against American interference in China's internal affairs. This protest was over American actions in the port city of Chefu in North China, which the 8th Root Army had liberated from the Japanese as early as August 2nd. On October 1st, an American naval vessel off Chefu sent officers ashore who asked permission of the 8th Route Garrison to inspect American property in the city and to land Marines for recreational purposes on one of the islands in the bay. Both requests were granted in the most friendly manner, whereupon the same naval officers appeared next day and asked permission to inspect Chinese coastal defenses. This request was also granted, 8th Route officers aiding in the inspection. At 5 o'clock on the morning of October 4th, however, an American destroyer landed officers who ordered the 8th Route Army Garrison to remove all coastal defenses from the Chefu area and to withdraw all its armed forces, as well as the Chefu municipal government, from the region and to deliver the city in an orderly manner to the Americans. In his protest to American military authorities, General Chu warned that the Americans would be held solely responsible for any serious incident should they try to land at Chefu without previous agreement with his headquarters, which, of course, he would no more have granted than an American commander would have surrendered an American port city to a foreign naval force. The Americans backed down on the Chefu incident, but not on others on October 18th. American troops surrounded and raided the 8th Root Army office in Tientsin, arrested and brought its staff before the American military headquarters. General Chu Te also lodged protests at this incident and at two others. One incident involved a raid by 10 American planes on Ansa, a town in the liberated area, where a mass meeting was strafed and many people killed and wounded. The second incident also involved 10 American planes which circled over Quan in the liberated areas and dropped a letter ordering the 8th Route Garrison to withdraw within two days or be attacked. After demanding an apology for these three violations of Chinese sovereignty, restitution of 8th Route Army property in Tientsin, and compensation for the families of the dead and wounded at Ansa, General Chu informed General Albert Wiedemeyer. I emphatically demand that you take proper steps and guarantee that no similar violations of Chinese sovereignty and interference in Chinese internal affairs will be repeated, and that no participation in Kuomintang military attacks on our liberated areas will be taken. 
Ignoring General Chu's protest, General Wiedemeyer was reported by American correspondents two days later to be speaking at a secret military conference where he informed Kuomintang generals of the number of Kuomintang troops and air personnel the United States intended to equip, as well as of American plans for supplying the Kuomintang with lend-lease supplies. At the same time, the Chinese press reported that American planes were transporting ammunition to Kuomintang blockading armies in the northwest and to Kuomintang troops in the liberated areas. When the Kuomintang government did not even protest at the many cases of violence by American troops against Chinese, the hatred of Chinese of every class mounted against it. This hatred grew. After November 30, 1945, when members of the secret police hurled hand grenades in a mass meeting of students in Kunming to protest civil war and American occupation of Chinese soil, killing a number of students and wounding dozens. Student protest demonstrations flared up throughout the country. One in Chongqing was addressed by two Democratic League leaders, Li Kumpa and Professor Lo Longqi, where Lo said, Today it is easier to be dead than alive. We have heard of the horrors of hell, but so far we have not heard that there is thought control in hell, nor are there any secret police there. Today the living world is darker than hell. Public anger mounted in late 1945 when a high school teacher, Fei Si Yao Chen, was shot dead in Tsingdao for refusing to answer questions about his thoughts and affiliations put to him by the mayor, the same traitor who had formerly commanded the Japanese Imperial Collaborationist Army. In a mass meeting in Yunnan to protest the killing of students in Kunming, General Chu Te informed his audience that the Kuomintang authorities had slaughtered from 400,000 to 500,000 progressive youth since 1927, and that the secret police continued to kill people day in and day out. The Kuomintang pretends that it is more civilized than the old Peiyang, northern, warlords, he remarked contemptuously. Let the people judge. Let the people realize what would become of our country if the Kuomintang should unify it according to its desire. It would become a fascist dictatorship more malicious, more despotic, more cruel, more cunning than the Peiyang regime. Cries of down with America, disarm Japanese troops, disarm puppet troops, stop the civil war, immediate evacuation of American troops soon resounded compellingly through the country. The attitude of the Chinese communists, at least, was not against Americans as a people, but against American imperialism or American reactionaries. In the same manner they had campaigned against Japanese militarism, but not against the Japanese people. As with the Japanese, they knew they had many American friends. When Brigadier General Evans F. Carlson died in the spring of 1947, they mourned as if he had been a Chinese patriot, and General Chu Te, who had become Carlson's friend, wired Mrs. Carlson of his grief. Similarly, the death of General Joseph W. Stilwell in October 1946 cast deep gloom over the liberated areas, and General Chu wired Mr. Stilwell that the Chinese people will remember forever General Stilwell's contributions to the war against Japan and his struggle for a just American policy toward China. A Yunnan broadcast had stated, if General Stilwell's advice last January to stop aiding Chiang Kai-shek had been followed, and if the American ambassador had adopted a really unselfish attitude like that of General Stilwell, the Chinese situation and Chinese-American relations would not be in the quandary they are today. General Evans F. Carlson at least had one. Great consolation before he died. Mao Zedong, Chu Te, Chou Enlai and Peng Taihui jointly signed a letter thanking him in the name of the Chinese people for his courageous struggle for Chinese democracy. Chapter 43 October and November passed and all North China became a battlefield between the forces of revolution and counter-revolution. American and Japanese soldiers jointly protected railways for the use of Kuomintang and puppet armies which were waging war on the communists. American planes and lend-lease supplies continued to pour into Shanghai and American-held port cities of the north for use of the Kuomintang armies. The Soviet Red Army, which had completed the occupation of Manchuria on August 23rd, held the main cities and lines of communication in that region, while the 8th Route Army and the Manchurian Volunteers operated in the countryside, avoiding all contact with the Russians who scrupulously held to the letter of the Sino-Soviet Treaty of Friendship and Alliance. 
Because of the presence of the People's Armies in Manchuria, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek had officially requested Moscow to postpone the evacuation of its troops until Kuomintang troops could take over. Moscow had complied with this request and set January 3, 1946, as the date of its final evacuation. In mid-December, however, Generalissimo Chang's representatives again officially requested the Red Army to postpone its evacuation for another three months, and again Moscow complied. The Red Army, however, rejected the Kuomintang request that it disarm the Chinese irregulars, stating that it could not interfere in China's internal affairs. While the Kuomintang twice officially requested the Red Army to postpone its evacuation, Kuomintang propagandists, ably abetted by their American colleagues, carried on a violent anti-Soviet campaign, charging that the Red Army refused to evaluate Manchuria. In March 1946, when the Red Army began the final evacuation of the Northeast according to schedule, Kuomintang propagandists charged that it was leaving in order to deliver Manchuria to the Chinese communists. For the previous months, Kuomintang and puppet armies, transported by American planes, had been trying to fight their way into Manchuria against the 8th Root Army and the Manchurian Volunteers. By the time the Russians evaluated, the Kuomintang could take over only the main South Manchurian cities. The communist armies moved in after the Russians in the north, even occupying the old Japanese puppet capital of Changchun, which they held until powerful Kuomintang armies converged on it. The Americans, in particular, criticized the Russians for stripping Manchuria of its industrial machinery before leaving. There is no doubt that some of the charges were based on fact, but the reasons for the stripping were never explained honestly. I believe the facts to be the following. The Russians undoubtedly stripped Manchuria of all war installations and industrial plants which Japan had constructed in Manchuria in the preceding 14 years as the foundation of its military bastion against the Soviet Union. Until the Pacific War began, the Western capitalist powers had also regarded Manchuria as the bastion against communism in Asia. Manchuria, the cockpit of Asia, had also been an objective of American financiers since the late 19th century, and during the Russian Revolution, it had been a base of operation against the Soviets. There seems no doubt whatever that some American supporters of the counter-revolutionary Kuomintang regime wanted Chiang Kai-shek to take over the Japanese military bastion in Manchuria as a base of operations for a possible Third World War. When the Russians stripped this bastion, it weakened the foundations of a potential anti-Soviet base. General Chu and other Chinese communist leaders did not intend to allow their country to become a battlefield in a third world war during which, as General Chu expressed it more than once, the Chinese people would be the meat and imperialists the butchers. They did not depend on the Soviet Union or its Red Army for anything because the Soviet Union recognized the Kuomintang regime. There is no doubt, however, that the Soviet Union sympathized fundamentally with the Chinese communists, though it is doubtful if they believed the Chinese communists strong enough to come to power. Such was the situation, or developing situation, at the end of November 1945, when two American correspondents flew into Yunnan. Mao Zedong, after returning to Yunnan from Chongqing in October, could not be interviewed, but General Chu talked frankly with the correspondents. Yan'an, the communists' headquarters, was being evaluated. When the war ended, 8th Root Army troops drove the Japanese from the industrial city of Kalgan, which was 40 days' marching distance to the northeast. Along this entire distance, rest feeding stations had been established to care for the thousands of men and women who began moving out of Yan'an for Kalgan and other regions. The famous Kanta, the political military university, which had trained thousands of military and political cadres during the war, had been split up into several sections and distributed to the various liberated regions. Most of the students of Yan'an University had left, some for administrative jobs, others to continue their studies in the new Union University at Kalgan. The Lu Sun Art Academy, which had produced some of the most vigorous art, music, and literature in modern China had moved to Kalgan, as had the Bethune Medical College, which had graduated over a thousand medical workers from three-year courses during the war. The medical college had taken with them most of the patients from the cave hospitals of Yunnan. Hundreds of party and army staff workers had also left, 
but Mao and Chu, with their chief staff members, continued working and waiting in Yan'an to see if Generalissimo Cheng intended to call the inter-party conference to which he had agreed on October 10th. The first questions which the American correspondents put to General Chu Te were about Manchuria and about the American and Kuomintang charges. That the Chinese communists were receiving help from the Soviet Union. General Chu declared that neither the communists at Yan'an nor those in Manchuria had any contacts whatever with the Russians, and he was certain that the Russians had no intention of helping them in preference to the Kuomintang. He became bitterly contemptuous when speaking of the Kuomintang policy toward Manchuria. During all the years following the Japanese occupation of Manchuria, he said, Kuomintang leaders had been willing to surrender the Northeast to the Japanese, and had been content with the recovery of only such Chinese territory as the Japanese had occupied after the Sino-Japanese War began on July 7, 1937. The Chinese communists, he declared, had no objections to the Kuomintang pursuing activities in Manchuria, nor to sending officials there to carry out their duties, peacefully, in accordance with the Sino-Soviet Treaty of Friendship and Alliance. Then he continued, we must point out that for the past 14 years the Chinese communists have been associated with the people of the Northeast in their struggle against the Japanese, while our 8th Root Army, together with the Manchurian people, established the Hopi Ajiho Liaoning, South Manchuria, liberated area during the war. We are therefore duty-bound to be concerned with the democratic reconstruction of the Northeast and to prevent the democratic rights which the people are already enjoying from being destroyed. The real cause of the trouble is that the Kuomintang ignores the will of the people in the Northeast and tries to impose its one-party dictatorship on that area. Kuomintang officials refuse to cooperate with the people but, instead, deny them their democratic rights. The Kuomintang depends on, and accompanies, American troops to intrude into the Northeast. Certain reactionaries even intend to use the Northeast as an anti-Soviet base and the battleground of a third world war. This is causing apprehension and resentment among the Northeastern people. In fact, the presence of American troops in North China is absolutely unnecessary, nor have they any right whatever to enter the Northeast. If the Kuomintang does not relinquish its anti-people, anti-democratic policy, the dispute between it and the Northeastern people can never be eliminated. The Northeastern people have proposed that local self-government be established and a local coalition democratic administration be set up, which would become a model region of democratic reconstruction. This is the best way to solve the Manchurian question, nor would its realization impair the integrity of a united China. The Kuomintang should begin in the Northeast to act upon its promises of returning rule to the people and of enforcing democracy. This would allay dissatisfaction of the Northeastern people toward the Kuomintang and be a great help in the consolidation of the unity of the nation. Throughout the preceding 14 years, General Chu added, 100,000 underground workers in Manchuria, all of them under communist leadership, had been killed in action. There were now 300,000 communist commanded troops in that area, under General Lin Piao's command. Such were General Chu's ideas when the national scene again suddenly changed. On December 15, 1945, President Truman announced that the United States took cognizance of the fact that the national government of China is a one-party government and that political unity could be worked out only by the Chinese themselves. Advocating a ceasefire order in the Civil War, the president expressed the belief that peace, unity, and democratic reform could be furthered if the basis of the Chinese government were broadened to include other political elements. The United States would be willing to grant loans to such a broadened government. This stated policy, and the appointment of General George Marshall to implement it, was received by the Chinese people with wild joy. Come out, you common people, cried the New China Daily of Chongqing, while the press of Shanghai rejoiced and the Ta Kung Pao published an appeal from Shanghai schools and universities to General Marshall, 1. Help establish a democratic Chinese government. 2. Help develop industrial, agricultural, commercial, medical, and cultural work in China. 3. Respect the interests of the Chinese nation and carry out the policy of the late President Roosevelt. 4. Understand better the real sentiment of the Chinese people so Sino-American friendship can be strengthened. 5. Arbitrate fairly in the Civil War. 
6. Withdraw American troops from China within the shortest possible time and stop helping Chinese troops with arms under the Lend-Lease Agreement. Both Mao Zedong and Chu Te publicly welcomed the Truman Statement and expressed the hope that George Marshall would repair the damage done by General Patrick Hurley and General Albert Wiedemeyer. Despite this, however, American troops continued on Chinese soil and American Lend-Lease supplies continued to pour in. Subsequently, General Wiedemeyer complacently remarked to correspondents that the Chinese puppet armies had been successfully absorbed by Chiang Kai-shek's armies. As if this were not warning enough, Mao Zedong and Chu Te received copies of a new secret Kuomintang document, planned for national revival, a blueprint for the extermination of their armies. The juxtaposition of American actions and of this new plan must have made them speculate seriously about the purpose of the Truman Statement and the dispatch of General Marshall as ambassador to China. Was it a delaying action to disintegrate and weaken them? Despite such speculations, which were voiced only months later, the Communists at once dispatched a delegation to the political consultative conference which Chiang Kai-shek finally called on General Marshall's advice. On January 31, 1946, representatives of the Kuomintang, the Communist Party, the Democratic League, and non-party delegates solemnly signed the historic Chungking Agreement to establish a democratic coalition government. A committee immediately set to work to draft a new democratic constitution which, following general elections, was to be discussed and ratified by the assembly of a new Chinese democratic republic. One of the most important points in this Chungking Agreement, which the Kuomintang delegation fought without success, made the executive branch of the new government responsible to the National Assembly instead of to the president. This was a provision specifically made to prevent the government from becoming the tool of a dictator as had happened repeatedly since 1911. Immediately after the Chungking Agreement was signed, the Kuomintang and Communist Party representatives signed another, countersigned by General Marshall, agreeing to issue ceasefire orders to their troops to reduce and reorganize their armies and create a national army under a joint high command. The Communists were so confident that the agreements would be carried out that General Chu's headquarters at once began disbanding whole divisions of their people's armies which, by the ceasefire agreement, were to be reduced to 18 divisions whereas the Kuomintang was to retain 90. Within three months, half a million men had been demobilized and sent back to their farms. Chapter 44I in January, General Chu talked with a foreign correspondent, John Roderick, who pictured him as an eager listener with old-world manners who clasped his hands and made a slight bow when taking a proffered cigarette. General Chu, Roderick said, no longer played basketball with his troops, but walked a great deal and sometimes rode into the hills to hunt. Sitting in a winter-chilled cave five miles from Yunnan, the town had been destroyed by Japanese bombers during the war. Chu was described as an unpaid, ill-clothed revolutionary whose rank is equivalent to that of a five-star American general. This much-wanted man, the correspondent wrote, goes about Yunnan virtually unguarded and never under arms. His soldiers idolize him, a rare thing in the Chinese army. These days, when negotiations for unity in Chungking demand that he participate in important party decisions as well as direct the 1,300,000 men under his command, he follows a full daily schedule. Up at 6 a.m., he eats breakfast, then plunges into a pile of dispatches from the front. He has a light lunch, then works all afternoon, conferring with other party leaders, and often walking five miles into town to meet them. Both before breakfast and after supper he avidly reads books and newspapers and keeps up on the international situation through translations of foreign language newscasts and papers. After spending a lifetime fighting for unity, freedom, and democracy, he says he is ready to lay down his arms the instant these are achieved, I hope, he said, that they will come in 1946. General Chu spoke with eager enthusiasm of the Chungking Conference. With Japan defeated, Russia no problem, and the danger of civil war apparently passed, he thought the next necessary step was to cut down and reorganize the armies to a level the country could afford. He thought both the Kuomintang armies and the communist armies should be further scaled down. China should stand on her own feet as much as possible, and he saw no need for an American military mission for which Chiang Kai-shek had asked and on which General Albert Wiedemeyer was already working. 
Furthermore, foreign loans for military purposes would be difficult to repay, but loans to build up industry could be repaid from the proceeds of new factories, while living standards could be simultaneously raised. When asked if a large well-trained Chinese army was not needed to preserve peace in the Far East, General Chu replied that the new Chinese democratic government would be the greatest safeguard for international peace. That is why we believe in nationalizing the army. It is essential to eliminate power or profit as motivating factors in maintaining large armies in China. Speaking eagerly, he concluded, I have helped carve out a territory here in North China where human beings may live secure from arrest and terror, free to practice democratic self-government. I have lived to see the democracy we established demanded by the rest of China which now lives in chaos and under oppression. For this I am grateful. My life has not been in vain. At a mass meeting in Yan'an on February 4th to celebrate the conclusion of the unity talks in Chongqing, General Chu expressed the conviction that China would become a modern nation equal to any in the world if it could have 30 years of peace. Complimenting the Generalissimo for agreeing to a democratic government, he nevertheless called on Chiang to prove his sincerity by removing the military blockade around the Yan'an border region, a challenge which Chiang ignored. When General George Marshall visited Yan'an on March 4th, General Chu told a welcoming mass meeting that within less than three months Marshall had helped the Chinese people bring fighting to an end, draft the army reorganization plan, and achieve the first steps toward democracy and peace. The People's Liberation Armies, he said, would faithfully carry out the direction of the truce teams and the military executive headquarters established by Marshall. General Marshall left for Washington in early March and asked for an American loan of $500 million which, according to President Truman's statement of December 15th, was to be granted to the new Democratic government only. However, there were more tricks in the arsenal of Kuomintang counter-revolution than were dreamt of in Marshall's philosophy. During Marshall's absence, the Central Executive Committee of the Kuomintang met behind closed doors and abrogated the decisions of the Chungking Agreement. Repudiating the principle of executive responsibility to the National Assembly, which would have robbed Chiang Kai-shek of dictatorial power, the Kuomintang also claimed the right to appoint not only its own representatives, but the representatives of all the other parties, to the new coalition government. The kind of government envisaged by the Kuomintang was revealed when it offered a communist the Ministry of Forestry and Agriculture, a post which for years had been an asylum for retired warlords. The Ministry of Education was offered to a member of the Democratic League who replied, It is more important for me to preserve my life. The Communist Party and the Democratic League rejected all offers of the Kuomintang and demanded that the January Agreement be honored in full. The Kuomintang, however, had not only abrogated the decision of the agreement, but began implementing its secret blueprint to wipe out the Communists. Its plan was divided into three stages. In the first, or preparatory stage, the democratic movement led by the Chinese Democratic League in Kuomintang territory was to be silenced by bribery or destroyed by terrorism, and this China problem presented to the United States, not as a struggle of the Chinese people for democracy, but as an outright Kuomintang communist struggle for power. There was no doubt where all-powerful America would stand on such an issue. The second stage, a war of extermination against the communist armies, was to begin in mid-July. This second stage was expected to merge into the third, a Soviet-American war in which the Kuomintang was convinced that the United States would be victorious and the communist menace to the property classes of China and the world finally and forever eliminated. Chiang Kai-shek was quoted as saying that we have three more months in which to prepare and three more in which to finish the communists. That General Chu Te knew the details of this conspiracy was made clear at an anniversary mass meeting of the Great May 4th Movement of 1919, at which he said the Chungking Agreement had been wrecked by it. The struggle has not yet been won, but we are convinced that the entire Chinese people can yet defeat the conspiracy, he said. From March to July 1946, the first stage of the secret plan was carried out. While fighting continued throughout Manchuria and North China, a reign of secret police terror in Kuomintang areas was carried out. Opposition newspapers and magazines, particularly those of the Chinese Democratic League, were demolished by mobs of plainclothes secret police. 
Printers and newspaper staff workers were beaten up and many editors kidnapped or killed. And Sion the secret police destroyed the printing plant of the Democratic Daily, beat up the staff, and shot the editor. A lawyer, Wang Yin, who took the case to court, was seized and executed, after which the Kuomintang stated that he had been an opium smoker. In Nantong, a city north of Shanghai, where a truce team went to investigate fighting between Kuomintang and new 4th Army troops, the secret police warned the populace to remain indoors and give no testimony. The people turned out to welcome the truce team, instead, and 20 teachers, writers, and newspapermen testified. These 20 men disappeared the next day. The bodies of 16 were never found, but the trussed-up corpses of four were discovered in a nearby river a few days later, their bodies mutilated and their eyes gouged out. In Canton, the secret police raided and closed down all bookstores and cultural organizations and demolished two liberal dailies which had exposed official corruption in UNRRA supplies. One shipload of relief rice had been traced by these papers to the local 54th Kuomintang Army. A Chinese UNRRA official, when questioned by them about the disappearance of a few hundred sacks of rice of another shipment, replied, a strong wind came up and blew the sacks into the sea. In April, convinced that the Chongqing Agreement had been wrecked, 11 of the communist leaders who had participated in it left Chongqing by plane for Yunnan. The plane crashed en route and every person in it was killed. The pilot and crew were Americans, but a little thing like that would never have deterred the Kuomintang secret police from sabotage. Among the dead were General Ye Ting, former commander of the new 4th Army, who had been released after five years in prison, together with his wife and two children. The Democratic forces of China fought. President Truman, the United States Congress, and General Marshall were inundated with protests from Chinese and organizations of all strata, even conservative businessmen and industrialists. America was asked to withdraw its troops from China and to stop all military supplies and loans to China until a democratic government was established. In July, Madam Sun Yat-sen addressed an urgent appeal to Congress and the American people, urging them to withdraw all support from the Kuomintang and prevent another disastrous civil war which, she warned, would bring chaos, starvation, and death to new millions. The Kuomintang, she warned, could not win such a war. Madam Sun's appeal, like thousands of others, met no response. By July, the month set by the conspiracy for all-out civil war, there was still one democratic stronghold left in China. This was in Kunming in the southwest. There the Chinese Democratic League had its last organ, the Democratic Weekly edited by Li Kumpa. One of its editorial board was Professor Wen Ito, a noted poet who for ten years had been professor of literature in Tsinghua University. On July 11th, the secret police shot Li Kumpa to death in the streets of Kunming. Next day, Professor Wen Ito delivered an austere funeral oration over the body of his friend. When I crossed my threshold today, he told the morning thousands, I knew I would never return. Challenging the secret police in the audience to come out in the open, he said, Oh, infamy! Infamy! You destroy the living and defame the dead. A few hours later, Professor Wan, with his 18-year-old student son, was also shot dead in the streets of Kunming. Sixteen other Chinese Democratic professors in Kunming, with their families, fled to the American consulate and were flown to Hong Kong and Shanghai. Thirteen leading professional men from other parts of China risked death by cabling the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations about the Kunming murders, stating that the pistols used were American weapons equipped with silencers. The full exposure of the Kunming assassinations by the international press and the protests of intellectual leaders of many countries to Chiang Kai-shek called a halt to open assassinations, but not to the secret kidnappings and killings. In the same week of the Kunming murders, Cho and Lai, Chief Communist Liaison Officer in Nanking delivered to General Marshall a copy of the final orders which Chiang Kai-shek had issued to his troops to begin the all-out civil war. The order set July 22nd as the day the assault on the People's Liberation Armies was to begin. And indeed, on July 22nd, 1946, Kuomintang armies moved in force into the liberated areas behind American-made bombers, tanks, and artillery. 
Another six months passed before General Marshall returned to America and issued a report which condemned both the Kuomintang and the communists for the Civil War, yet honestly stated that a dominant group of Kuomintang reactionaries were interested in the preservation of their own feudal control of China and counted on substantial American support regardless of their actions. General Chu later stated that Marshall's failure was due to the policy of the American government rather than to Marshall himself. By October, when a group of American correspondents flew into Yan'an, Chiang Kai-shek had mobilized three-fourths of his forces, or 193 out of 253 divisions, for the Civil War. The fundamental reasons for the breakdown of the January ceasefire agreement, General Chu told the correspondents, was Kuomintang determination to continue the dictatorship and American encouragement and aid to Chiang. The Kuomintang, he said, hoped to establish a despotism like that of Hitler, Franco, and Hirohito, which the communists and the people were determined to defeat. Speaking of Kuomintang rumors about an impending Soviet-American war, General Chu remarked that there was a group of American reactionaries who are manufacturing such a war, which Chinese reactionaries are hoping will come very soon. I don't think their ambitions can be realized, he added. In case such a war begins, our attitude will hinge on the attitude of the two sides towards the Chinese people. There are two different polices which the United States could adopt. One is to make China a bridge of friendship with the Soviet Union, the other is to make China a battleground for attacking the Soviet Union. The former policy is advocated by Mr. Henry Wallace, while the latter is advocated by American reactionaries. We will prevent such a war from developing. The formidable prospect of such a holocaust forces us to strive for peace. And how long could the People's Liberation Armies hold out against such powerful Kuomintang armies? General Chu smiled coldly, that depends entirely upon American reactionaries who send us weapons and ammunition through Chinese reactionaries. Our people and troops know that this war was initiated by Chinese and American reactionaries, and that they would lose everything they have gained, and that millions would be exterminated should we fail. The whole population therefore supports us as during the war against Japan, many of Chang's subordinates do not want civil war either, but they must carry out his orders or break with him. This period of obedience, however, will not last much longer. We have already exterminated 25 Kuomintang divisions in the past two and a half months, but the Kuomintang has been unable to exterminate even one single regiment of ours. When asked if his armies would accept help from the Soviet Union should it be offered, General Chu said, the great aid which we seek today is from the American people. We want the American people to call a halt to the inglorious policy of their government. I can say honestly that we are deeply grateful to all people and all nations which sympathize with Chinese independence, peace and democracy, and that we oppose all reactionaries who interfere in our internal affairs and encourage civil strife. American imperialism is as hateful as Japanese imperialism, he declared bitterly. The American government is a reactionary government. The aid which these reactionaries have already given Chiang Kai-shek exceeds three billion American dollars. All of this, except for the part pocketed by officials and the warlords, is used to kill Chinese. There are now tens of thousands of victims of American guns in China who, one year ago, were wildly happy over President Truman's policy statement and General Marshall's arrival in China. While Marshall talked peace, the Kuomintang and the American government prepared for war. As the year 1946 drew to a close, North China and Manchuria ran with the blood of the people of China, but for every man who fell at the front many sprang forward to take his place. The People's Liberation Army had given up great cities and withdrawn to the countryside to whittle down and exhaust the enemy. Kuomintang morale sagged lower and lower until whole divisions began going over to the communists. With iron discipline, tempered in thousands of battles, and clad in an armor of conviction that only death could shatter, the Chinese People's Liberation Armies were swiftly arming themselves with the best of American weapons, approaching the moment when they could advance from guerrilla and mobile fighting into regular warfare. General Chu Tei, son of a poor peasant of Sichuan province, had now finished his 60th year. On November 30th, in the midst of battle, the people and the troops of the North celebrated and sent him messages of love and encouragement. 
From distant Manchurian battlefields, Lin Piao's staff wired him, to celebrate your 60th birthday we present you with another victory. Another regiment of Kuomintang troops has just come over to us. The editorial staff of the Chun Chung magazine, published in Shanghai, sent a letter to General Chu in time for his birthday. It read, Honorable Elder, you have saved the Chinese people from the iron hoof of the enemy. You led the Chinese people to emancipate themselves from a thousand years of slavery. You have helped them clothe and feed themselves. You drive trespassers from their fields. You are a great son of the Chinese race, the parent of the Chinese people's rebirth. Today, on your 60th birthday, we burn incense to you in our hearts. From early morning until evening on November 30th, people streamed to General Chu's Yan'an headquarters. A group of four peasants, one a woman, walked twenty miles to present him with birthday tarts, two bottles of wine, and a basket of birthday noodles. Troops from the Yan'an garrison made sandals and shoes for him, sang revolutionary songs, and danced the Yankeo before his headquarters. But the tribute which Chu Te perhaps treasured most was a scroll from the Central Committee of the Communist Party which recounted his work for the overthrow of the Manchu dynasty, for the overthrow of Yuan Shikai, his role in the Great Revolution, his joint founding, with Mao Zedong, of the Chinese Red Army, his command of the armies during the Long March, and his great achievements in the Anti-Japanese War. This document ended, you symbolize the great struggle of the Chinese people for freedom for the last sixty years. You are a good son and brother of the oppressed Chinese people. Today, when Kuomintang reactionaries, together with American imperialism, are attempting to rob the Chinese people of the fruits of victory over Japan, you and comrade Mao Zedong stand at the front of the struggle in defense of our country and the interests of our people. General Chu published one article on his 60th birthday, the story of his mother, daughter of an outcast wandering theatrical family, a woman so humble that she did not even have a name, a peasant woman who labored until death claimed her in her 80th year. Two weeks after the 60th birthday, General Chu was again tramping the paths and roads of China. Chiang Kai-shek's blockading army under General Hu Tsungnan was converging on Yan'an. The little city was empty as the enemy advanced. To the farmers who came out with blanched faces to bid him farewell, General Chu said, We will not be gone long. To Mao Zedong, now 53, who walked by his side, General Chu said, I have lived 60 years. From now on, every year of my life is just so much gain. So he went forward on the great road of human liberation, this time to lead his country and people to the victory which three years later shook Chiang Kai-shek and set the reactionaries of the world a tremble. Chronology, the following chronology is based on that in the Japanese edition of this book. December 12, 1886, or November 30th, Chu Tei born in village of Linglantsai, near Elunchen, Sichuan province. 1892 goes to small neighboring school of 17 pupils. 1893 goes to landlord Ting's private family school. 1895 moves with uncle to town of Taiwan, enters school of Xipingan, China defeated in Sino-Japanese War, Shimonoseki Treaty. 1898 Reform Movement, Wu Su Cheng Pian. 1900 Boxer, I Ho Chuan, Rebellion, Imposition of Foreign Indemnities. 1905 Russo-Japanese War, Russian Revolution of 1905, Chu Te enters modern school at Chenqing. 1906 Autumn, passes state examinations in Elunction, receives title of Su Tsai, studies physical training in higher normal school at Chengtu. 1907 teaches physical training in new school in Elunction. 1909 enters Yunnan Military Academy, Yunnanfu, Yunnan Province, studies under Brigadier General Tsai Ao, secretly joins Republican Tung Meng Hui and peasant organization Ko Lao Hui, assigned to Sichuan Regiment. 1911 July, graduated from Academy, 2nd Lieutenant, October, Yunnanfu Republican Uprising under Tsai Ao, Chu Te commissioned captain, joins revolutionary expedition into Sichuan, Chinese Revolution, Declaration of Republic. 1912 February, Sun Yat-sen, first provisional president, replaced by Yuan Shikai, May, Chu Te promoted to major, begins teaching at Military Academy, Autumn, Mary Si Yao Chufun, transfers membership from Old Tung Minghui to New Kuomintang. 
1913 serves for two years in South Yunnan in border guards against French-instigated raids from Indochina. 1915 December, promoted to colonel, commanding 10th Yunnan Regiment, joins Tsai Ao Sichuan expedition and campaigned against Yuan Shikai regime. 1916 Sichuan campaign successful, Chu Te promoted to Brigadier General, Tsai Ao becomes Governor General of Sichuan, death of Yuan Shikai, new Thai cultural renaissance centering in Peking, deaths of Tsai Ao and of Chu Te's wife, Chu Te stationed in Luzhou with Yunnan Protection Army. 1917 marries Chen Yuchen, during this period takes up opium, gradually becomes involved in warlordism. 1919 May 4th Movement stimulates political and cultural awakening. 1921 Chu Te tries to resign from Protection Army, remains as police commissioner in Yenanfu. 1922 August takes opium cure in French hospital, Shanghai, meets Sun Yat-sen, applies for membership in Communist Party, is rejected, September, sails for Europe, October, meets Cho and Lai in Berlin. Shortly afterwards, secretly accepted into Chinese Communist Party. 1923 enrolls in political science faculty at Göttingen. 1924 returns to Berlin, organizes branch of Kuomintang. 1925 studies with German Marxists, March, death of Sun Yat-sen, 1926 June, Chu Te arrested by German police, released, returns to China, goes to Sichuan via Shanghai, Hankou. 1927 appointed director of Nanchang Military Training School and Police. Commissioner, March, Nanking Incident, April, Shanghai Massacre, July, Chu Te attends Communist Party Conference near Nanchang, vote taken to arm the people and begin agrarian revolution, Nanchang Uprising, revolutionaries take city. Chu Te placed in command of Ironside's new 9th Division, September, Ironside's defeated at Swato, Chu Te retreats to South Hunan, elected commander-in-chief of renamed Workers and Peasants Revolutionary Army. 1928 January, Chu Te establishes Soviet at Ichang, Hunan, Soviets next established at Chenchen, Leong. At Leong, Chu Te marries Wu Yulan, May, meeting between Chu Te and Mao Zedong at Lingshan. They withdraw to Chinkinshan Mountain Base. Communist Party Conference at Chinkinshan adopts four-point military program, reorganizes into 4th Red Army, Chu Te Commander-in-Chief, Mao Zedong Political Commissar, Chinkinshan blockaded by Kuomintang. 1929 January, 4th Army defeats enemy at Tapoti, occupies Ningtu, Tunku, Sinkwo, establishes Tunku Sinkwo Regional Soviet, Chu Te's wife Wu Yulan captured and beheaded, Spring, Chu Te Harris's enemy occupies Ting Chao. Jukin, conference between Chu Te, Mao Tse Tung, and Peng Te Hui. Chu Te campaigns in South Kiangxi, retakes Ningtu, occupies Lungyan, September, withdraws to West Fukian, takes Shanghong, defeated in East River regions, Kwangtung, marries Kong K. H. Chin. 1930 January, Red Army Conference, Qutian, Chu Te Harris's enemy throughout Kiangxi destroys Yunnan Army, June, Ting Chao Red Army Conference, reorganization of army, partial acceptance of Lili San Line, Changsha occupied by Peng Te Hui, bombarded by U.S. gunboat Palos, evaluated by Red Army, Chu Te besieges Nanchang, withdraws, September, besieges Changsha, withdraws, with Mao Tse Tung repudiates Lili San Line, October, takes Qian. Chiang Kai-shek begins first of series of red. Extermination campaigns, December, Chu Te defeats enemy at Lung Kong. 1931 March, Shanghai Communist Party Congress affirms Chu Mao Line, repudiates Li Li San Line, May June, Chu Te and Peng Te Hui defeat enemy in South Kiangxi, second extermination campaign, September, Mukden Incident, Japan begins occupation of Manchuria. 1934 September-October, Red Army begins Long March. 1935 January, Central Red Army occupies Zunyi. Chu Te learns of death of his wife Yuchen and his son at Nanchi, May. Central Red Army crosses Tatu River, July. At Mukung Central Red Army meets 4th Red Army under Chang Kuotao. Politburo Conference reorganizes Red Armies, August, at Maurakai Chang Kuotao takes Chu Te and staff prisoner, with subsequent division of command during March in Sikong, October, Mao Zedong reaches North Shenzi. 
1936 October, Chu Tae makes first contact with Central Red Army at Huijin, December, meeting of Chu Tae and Mao Tse Tung at Bowen, Sian Incident, Young Marshal Kidnaps Chiang Kai-shek. 1937 January, Communist headquarters established at Yan'an, Agnes Smedley arrives in Yan'an. Meets Chu Tae, February, Mao Tse Tung and Chu Tae appeal to Kuomintang to form National Anti-Japanese United Front, March, Chu Tae and Agnes Smedley begin working together on this book. July, Japanese attack Peking, beginning of Sino-Japanese War. August, Chu Tae and Cho Enlai attend National Military Defense Council meeting at Nanking. Kuomintang in principle accepts formation of United Front. September, 8th Root Army formed, Chu Tae Commander-in-Chief, Peng Tae Hui Vice Commander. October, Chu Tae begins campaign against Japanese throughout Shanxi, Agnes Smedley at his headquarters, Wutai Mountains, December, Nanking captured and sacked by Japanese. 1938 Chu Tae continues Shanxi campaign, summer, Kuomintang raids communist liberated areas, sometimes in conjunction with Japanese, autumn, Chu Tae reports at Yan'an on first year of war, October, Chu Tae pleads with National Military Defense Council for implementation of United Front, introduction of democratic reforms. 1939 March, Mao Tse Tung and Chu Tae publicly protest Kuomintang armed attacks on Red Army. September, World War II begins in Europe. December, Kuomintang armies in South Shaanxi join Japanese in attacking 8th Root Army. Chu Tae leaves front for Yan'an. 1940 August, Chu Tae and Pang Tae Hui begin 100 Regiment campaign against Japanese. December, successful conclusion of campaign, virtual collapse of Kuomintang Communist United Front. Chungking orders 4th Army to evaluate fighting zone. 1941 January, Kuomintang Army slaughter part of 4th Army, Mao Tse Tung and Chu Tae protest, Chiang Kai-shek takes no action. Mao Tse Tung announces policy of economic self-sufficiency in liberated areas to counter Kuomintang Japanese blockade and attacks. June, Germany invades Soviet Union. July, Japanese begin attack on liberated areas with three-all strategy. November, Conference of Eastern Peoples at Yan'an. December, Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. 1944 May-August, foreign correspondence permitted by Chiang Kai-shek to visit Yan'an liberated area. Autumn, American Military Observer Group established in Yan'an, October, Stillwell recalled, Wiedemeyer appointed, Mao Tse Tung and Chu Tae open reconstruction exhibition of Yan'an border region. 1945 April, Communist Party representative on Chinese delegation to San Francisco United Nations Conference, 7th Communist Party Congress meets at Yan'an, Mao Tse Tung publishes on coalition government, Chu Tae warns of danger of civil war, May, World War II ends in Europe, July, Potsdam Declaration on Unconditional Surrender of Japan, August, Atomic Bombing of Hiroshima, protested by Communist New China Daily, Chu Tae, to counter Chiang Kai-shek's cooperation with Japanese, orders read. Armies to accept Japanese surrender, Japanese surrender, qualifying allied terms, retaining emperor, Chu Tae urges allied powers to support communist efforts to avert civil war and form coalition government. September, Mao Tse Tung at Chungking negotiates with Chiang Kai-shek. October, Chu Tae protests American military interference in Chinese internal affairs. Chiang Kai-shek agrees in principle to conference for establishment of coalition government. November, Communists begin to move headquarters from Yan'an to Kalgan. December, Truman Declaration supporting establishment of coalition government in China, appointment of General Marshall as American representative in China. 1946 January, at Chungking representatives of Kuomintang, Communist Party, Democratic League, and other delegates sign agreement to establish democratic coalition government. March, Marshall visits Yan'an. Kuomintang begins secretly subverting Chungking agreement. July, Kunming assassinations, Kuomintang armies invade liberated areas, November 30th, Chu Tae celebrates his 60th birthday. Ed Note, author Agnes Smedley died on May 6, 1950. Chu Tae, now known as Judah, died on July 6, 1976. Request from the Publisher Thank you so much for reading our book, we hope you really enjoyed it. As you probably know, many people look at the reviews before they decide to purchase a book. 
If you like the book, could you please take a minute to leave a review with your feedback? 60 seconds is all I'm asking for, and it would mean the world to us. Thank you so much, Barajima Books. 1. Washan is a mountain peak in South Shenzhen Province.